Should we start? I think so, yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is it. It feels a bit different than uh, other years, uh, but uh, this is what we have in this day and age. So let us welcome you to the seventh annual Liberal Herald this way. Uh, my name is Dagmar Kusa from the Bratislava International School of Liberal Arts, where the Liberal Herald was born. And my colleague, which you probably don't see now, uh, is, is James Griffith from Middle Eastern Technical University. James, if you say something, I think you will be seen. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm James Griffith. I'm at the Department of Philosophy at Middle East Technical University in Ankara. And I will stop now and hand it back to you, Doug. <laughs> okay. Uh, just so that you know who, who's behind this event, although it's not just us, the, the Herald is, uh, is a peculiar conference because it was started by BISLA students, that's the Bratislava International School of Liberal Arts, in 2012, and it was organized by them uh, and is uh, to this day run and organized by our students and um, uh, alumni. Um, and it's also uh, special, or we like it because it brings together students from undergraduate level to PhD level and uh, scholars and experts and practitioners in the field on equal footing, on, on equal level, which, which has really paid off in the past. It's always been an extremely pleasant conference, pleasant event, um, and um, uh, it was growing it was growing each year since the first very humble meeting uh, in 2012, which was just a small group here at Bisla. Every year it became more and more international and, and more and more people joined in. And it grew also more and more pleasant each year. So no pressure, uh, but we hope to reproduce it uh, this year, even though we are fully online. Um, uh, it's also an interdisciplinary conf conference by design. Uh, we, um, we, we like to introduce themes and topics that invite uh, learning across the boundaries of traditional academic training. So in the past, we've had topics on the desirability of freedom, for example, or on the topic of, of dignity um, and its role in present discourses. Um, um, we have explored um, the changing identity in uh, the era of, of the crisis of globalization or um, demos versus polis, the, the questions of uh, citizenship and civic participation in, in the present um, age of populism. And last year we've had a conference uh, on the state of and or education. The titles for this conference are, are always uh, uh, also exceptional. And uh, the publication from the last year's conference, which talks about uh, the state of, of education, obviously, especially university education or higher education, uh, the role of philosophy um, or the contribution of philosophy for education um, and kind of the challenges of digitalization for human and society and how education fits into that picture. So the publication from that will be coming out shortly. Uh, this, this December, it, will, it should be online already. So we'll be happy to uh, share that with you. Anyway, not to make this introduction too long, uh, welcome. This is our seventh. It's still run by our students and alums and we would like to acknowledge them and thank them. James. Oh, thanks. Yeah, uh, so in addition to thesis students and, and alum, uh, we also wanted to thank the sponsors uh, in the institutional sponsors for the uh, conference, uh, the Bringing Theory to Practice fel uh, Fellowship Grant, I forget what, what the official full title is, uh, as well as the APVV system of Slovak uh, research. Oh man. I just forgot what Foundation, it all The National Research and National Research Foundation, Foundation yes. as soon as I went to say it. <laughs> uh, as well as BISLA, Bratislava International School of Liberal Arts, and uh, our, our partners, institutional partners, Bard College in Berlin and Central European University, who have offered, who've been able to continue uh, different relationships with the conference as well. 
And of course, we also want to thank the participants um, because it wouldn't be much of a conference if none of you applied and, and, came, and came, whatever we want to call it. Um, and uh, also just so that uh, we all know, we got an email this morning that uh, Maria Acosta uh, Lopez had a personal issue and she will not actually be able to be here today, unfortunately. So one of our panels will uh, end a little early as a result today. Um, so I, and well, okay, I'll just thank the students again <laughs> uh, because they, they do all the, the hard work that uh, Dagmar and I don't actually want to do. <laughs> so, um, and other than that, I think I'm gonna hand it back to Dagmar for a moment. Cool. Um, thank you, James, and thank you, everybody. Um, our, our, uh, our team, our technical team, especially that makes all of this possible. And otherwise we would have no clue how to organize this um, in such a nice way. I mean, it would be a much, much more cruder event. Um, but let, let us look um, at the themes and, and topics of our conference. Um, this year, I'm especially glad because the uh, stories, histories, memories is, is a topic or a theme that's very dear to us. Um, many of us uh, essentially devote uh, lives to, to the studies of, of these topics. And I'm excited that among the presenters this year, uh, we have many exceptional people who either study memory or philosophy of, of history um, or historicity or politics of memory, as well as I know that among many of the viewers, many of the members of, of the audience, we will have uh, people from this field. So hopefully it will be a, a beginning of something uh, beautiful. Um, and it's also fitting in a way that uh, today is the anniversary of the Nuremberg Tribunal. Uh, it, it started today in, in 1945. The, the trials with the top 24 leaders of, of the Nazi Germany's government and military and, and business, um, which is obviously an event of historical importance, but also for our fields, um, for the, um, essentially it's, it's, it's an event that has become a cult cultural code in and of itself and assembly um, of, uh, uh, of the historical facts themselves, but wrapped together with the very strong uh, emotions that are connected to the atrocity uh, that was put on trial from that day. Um, and also as a model in, in other fields uh, in transitional justice, I know it has been, um, it has been a model that was discussed uh, extensively, for example, in, in, the, in the communist opposition, um, in, in the dissident circles, um, as uh, something to, to think about when the time comes, uh, when communism will be toppled. It has been uh, extremely in, inspiring to the African National Congress, for example, which saw it as, as a guiding, um, guiding model uh, almost up to the 1989 or up to 1989 when, uh, when the Eastern Bloc has started to crumble and it became apparent that another, uh, that another way of uh, transitional justice um, will, will have to be um, considered uh, through negotiations, through, through um, uh, another way of um, dealing with, with the former representatives of, of the regimes. But still, I, I think it's, it's symbolic uh, that we meet on, on this day, uh, framed by, by this uh, type of an event. But uh, somewhat connected to that, I also want to mention um, uh, another event that is much more local. It's, it's a Slovak, Czechoslovak uh, anniversary of, of the Velvet Revolution, 17th of November. Um, and the way it transpired this year, because I think it's, uh, it's, an excellent, um, um, it's an excellent example of many of the themes and approaches that, we, uh, that are gathered in, in this conference. And that's because this year's anniversary was anything but, but normal. On uh, the 17th of November uh, this year, essentially the, the anniversary of the Velvet Revolution of the fall of communism was pretty much uh, uh, stolen 
um, by the, the former communists, by the Communist Party, and uh, by the new fascists, the, the Kotlebas, people, uh, People's Party, ultras, there were extreme right-wing uh, youth on the streets, and many sympathizers of, of the Slovak uh, fascist state, uh, um, etc. Et Since there was a lockdown, the usual commemorations or concerts, exhibits, uh, etc. Um, could not take place in, in public. They were moved to an online space and I have to say rather sparingly, uh, there were few events, but it's the usual circle of the same people who, who follow, follow these events. So within the public space was kind of emptied this year. And it was used immediately by, uh, by, by these groups who used it to air their grievances with the current government, with the corona, of course, the COVID uh, limitations, um, uh, etc. And um, uh, there were some, absurdi some absurdities, like, for example, the former prime minister Fico, who himself is connected with a regime uh, that was full of corruption and, and ties to direct ties to, to mafia, was calling for a democracy with a human face, which in and of itself is, is kind of uh, hearkening back to 1960s late 1960s when there was an attempt to build socialism with human face in Czechoslovakia. Uh, so it's quite rich that the, the former prime minister who is connected to many faces that are going to prison these days uh, is, is calling for a democracy with human face on the anniversary of the Velvet Revolution. But it's even more complicated than that because November uh, 17th uh, in itself is an older anniversary than just 1989 and it's directly connected uh, to a resistance towards the fascist regime in 1939. It's the day when um, students in Prague were protesting the, the killing of a, of a Czech student um, um, who was killed during the commemorations of the establishment of the first Czechoslovak Republic and students took to the street on the 17th of November. And another student, Jan Opletal, was killed. Several hundred students were uh, jailed uh, or, or actually sent to concentration camps as a result of uh, November 17 student protests. So it has become a national day of students and that was the event that was commemorated in 1989. It was again students that took to the streets to, um, uh, to remember the student uprising against uh, fascist totalitarianism. So it's doubly ironic that this year um, uh, it was essentially stolen by both former communists and the new fascists, the representatives of two totalitarian regimes against whom November 17 uh, uh, was aimed. It, it was a protest against, against uh, both types of, uh, of totalities. Um, I don't think it's surprising. It's not only an outcome of, um, of the current COVID crisis. Obviously, that was a very good, um, very good uh, impetus and, and uh, everything was available. This anniversary was up for grabs because of the situation. But it is also a, a result of how history is reckoned with in Slovakia uh, and Central Europe in general and, and many other countries for that matter. We have not really reckoned or we have not dealt neither with the fascist past uh, sufficiently nor with the communist past um, in this region, not only in Slovakia. Not a single communist uh, a leader, for example, was sentenced after 1989. Um, there was essentially a thick line drawn behind uh, these two regimes and we outdo ourselves in exporting guilt to the West and to the East. And when we do remember in like mainstream discourses, not in academic circles, but in, in the radio, in, in, uh, um, in, in the broad discourse, we like to remember people who have helped to save others um, um, or the victims themselves, dissidents themselves. But there has not been reckoning of, of responsibility for those two pasts and translating it into the new democratic regime, into values, foundational values of, of a new 
system, into principles, into essentially the vision for, for this country. So in a way, it has resulted in, in kind of a value void um, that we exist in. Uh, and again, I, I think it's true for, for the broader region, not only for this country. And education, which is also not dealing well with, with these issues. So it's not surprising that, that we have a, a generation that grew up in this atmosphere um, with, without, without the, the solid background in, in this past, with, without the Central European history, if, if you will, the reckoning with the past, the way West Germany um, has gone through. And we are essentially reaping, uh, reaping the harvest that we have sown. Um, so I, I think that's that's why I wanted to uh, I, that's why I wanted to mention this specific event because it shows both the importance of history, um, also, also the temporality of it, how we deal with the past, when, what are the consequences uh, uh, of our approach towards the past, how memory operates in in public discourse, how memory is manipulated for different uh, political purposes and uh, reasons, but also hopefully the, the potential, um, like highlighting the avenues of what, what needs to be worked on for the future um, in order to essentially found this state properly, because this state has not been founded on the principles and values uh, that it should have been. This process has not passed yet. Um, so, that's that's kind of the framing event, uh, at least in my mind. Um, that that's very rich. Um, and uh, now I will turn to James, who will tell us a little bit more about the concrete theme and, and topics of of this conference. Okay, thanks, Dagmar. Um, that was um, depressingly informative, I guess, <coughs> um, and also uh, ties in nicely with. Um, the way this, the way we've come up with the themes in past years uh, has really just kind of been more or less what Dagmar and or and or I were thinking about at a given point in the year when we had to come up with a, a theme. And uh, this year wound up more kind of directly in line with our own research than I think um, past years have because Dagmar does a lot of work, as you can probably tell from what she just said, she does a lot of work on cultural memory, on trauma, comparative political work, and how uh, certain stories are told or not told or retold in the ways that they're retold within cultural contexts and how they're different in different cultural contexts. And uh, for myself and my own um, uh, work in philosophy, I'm kind of obsessed with, for one thing, the fact that in Latin-based language, uh, history, the words in English, history and story are the same. Um, and I find that fascinating and very interesting and very telling. And um, at the same time, when we were coming up with this conference theme, um, one of the things we were talking about was that last year was the 30th anniversary of 1989. And in particular, uh, we were talking about how it's, it's interesting and telling that uh, at the time, Fito's, what remained of Fito's government before he lost his, that government lost the election, um, that there was silence and uh, no, no official discourse really on, on the Slovak or Czech and Slovak experience in 1989. Um, and so we just kind of started to think about how, how all these things tie together um, from my own kind of historical philosophical interest. This is all, also very tied in uh, with um, the connections of the springtime of the peoples in 1848 and Hegelian philosophy, which is a philosophy of history, understanding, uh, thinking of history as moving inevitably in a, in a progressive and a progressive direction that um, uh, opens us up onto more and more freedom. This, of course, is a, a theory of history that is at, at the very least contested at this point. Um, but it's also, you know, Hegel is an extremely important philosopher. And uh, when I'm one of the aspects of these 
discourses and the discourse of stories and history and memory in from a philosophical position for me personally is um, the relationship between all of these things and uh, the imagination, which from the uh, birth of science has been in different ways, sometimes uh, denigrated. And so it, it's the kind of series of topics that connect uh, to other kind of metaphysical or metapsychological understandings of how human beings act and interact, um, what, how we form meaning at all, um, if we form meaning and to do so in these kind of narrative structures, but there's a difference between a story that we tell ourselves at the personal level and the historical circumstances that we like to tell ourselves exist. And there's a difference between an individual memory and a cultural memory, but all these things of course wrap up um, into each other, both in the formation of the individual and the societies in which the individuals form. So this is, these are kind of, um, this series of connected thoughts that we had uh, as we were developing this this topic or theme, and um, and so yeah, I'm personally quite excited. I've been I was extremely happy with the submissions, and it was a very very difficult decision for all of us who were making the selections. Um, uh, this year's uh, panels and papers are are going to be, I think, excellent. So um, with that said, as kind of a general issue, I'm gonna pass it back to Dagmar. Yes, I, I see that our uh, panelists are, are already online. Uh, so th the last remaining thing uh, is to look at the program itself, especially for the audience on YouTube and in Facebook events so that we know what's ahead of us. And I'll just do it very quickly by, uh, by running through the uh, program. Um, so today we start uh, straight up with philosophy, right into the heart of the matter, uh, looking at phenomenology and, and historicity, uh, temporality, um, um, and um, and narratives, uh, narratives how they operate, uh, how they operate in in history, um, essentially. Uh, the next panel, I think we have three panels today and a keynote. Uh, the second panel uh, will look at narratives in art and literature, in, in films and, um, and in literature, um, looking at, um, lo looking at uh, films and literature from all possible corners of the world. And the third panel is... Um, my favorite topic is about what uh, Kat, uh, Catherine Verderi calls the dead bodies, uh, essentially the statues in, in public space and um, how they are memorialized and, and politicized, uh, obviously looking at the United States, um, but also uh, at the uh, uh, narratives of, of the past and its reframing um, elsewhere through, within the public space. And our keynote this evening, uh, the, the last uh, event for today, is Charles Sabatos, who will be looking um, again at, at literature and at narrative representations um, of, of uh, Bratislava in, uh, in uh, lit literary narratives. Um, so we're very excited about that. And tomorrow is also a very rich uh, program. We'll start off with uh, looking at the narratives of the uh, past and, and hidden narratives uh, in Central European context. Uh, that's the, the first panel. We will also uh, look at the politics of, of memory um, in uh, Northeast India, uh, for example, the, the hidden transcripts, uh, the, the hidden transcripts and politicization of, of it um, in uh, narrative accounts. And the next panel uh, is returning to philosophical topics um, and especially philosophy of, of history. Um, the second keynote tomorrow is uh, an old friend of mine, Philip Gamagelian, who is Armenian uh, in origin, American citizen now looking at the memory as an, ex, uh, as an obstacle 
in entrenched conflicts uh, nowadays it's it's or his context is Nagorno-Karabakh but he has worked in several other contexts so uh, Phil will try to make sense with us of that type of work in that type of environment and last but not least uh, we have a round table on politics of memory uh, in an era of rising authoritarian populism essentially interconnecting the two themes, uh, memory and populism, how that works uh, in different corners of, of the world. And we have six uh, roundtable panelists uh, coming from Brazil, from Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, from Pakistan, Hungary, Tunisia and uh, Israel slash United States. So that will be a very rich conversation. Um, and it will probably extend beyond 7.30. I, I already have that suspicion. Uh, but that's the final event. I hope you will join us for some or all of the events. Um, uh, welcome again. And we are excited to begin, essentially. Um, OK, yeah. And sorry, one more thing for those who might be watching on YouTube or Facebook, if you want to ask a question you can do so through a program, a website called Slido. It's S-L-I dot D-O. And if you type in the event code Herald, you'll be able to type in a question and our moderators will be paying attention and incorporate those as well. Mm -hmm. um, and for participants and on Zoom, you, you can also, of course, join the discussion after the panelists here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, so I hope you enjoy and we will be back at 1.30, possibly a little bit later to get things organized since we are almost at 1.30 Central Eastern time, uh, so in a few minutes. Yeah, and three to five minutes. Other than that, um, I'm going to hand it off to the moderators. Thank you.
Okay, so hello and welcome to our first panel of this day. Uh, our first panel will be concerned, as you can also find on the our program, with phenomenology of historicity. Uh, we will have four speakers uh, who will present their works. And the first one uh, will be Maria Christine, Christina Vendra. Uh, Dr. Vendra currently works at, as a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the Institute of Philosophy of the Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague. Uh, the aim of her postdoctoral project is to examine the nature of collective memory and its transmission. That is to explain how and why diverse human beings come to think themselves as members of a group with shared past through the intersection between Jan Patočka's phenomenological inquiry into the meaning of history and Paul Ricoeur's Hermeneutic Phenomenology of History and Memory. She is also an associated member of the Center of the Study of Social Movements at the School of Higher Studies in Social Sciences in Paris, where she obtained her PhD in 2019. And uh, Dr. Vendra is an active member of the Association Alumni of Fonds Recur and of the Society for Recur Studies, in which she works also as a social media director. Uh, her today's work will be uh, will, will, is called Interaction with the Past and Openness Towards the Future, Paul Ricoeur and Jan Patočka at the Boundary of History, Historicity and History. Uh, and without further ado, uh, Dr. Vendra, the floor is yours. First of all, thank you for, uh, the, to the organizing committee for allowing me to attend this event and for making this valuable opportunity available for all of us. I will share with you my presentation through PowerPoint. Just let me share with you. Here we are. So the title of my intervention is Interaction with the Past and Openness Toward the Future, for Ricoeur and Jan Patochka at the Boundary of History and Historicity. In order to introduce these issues, let me first read two quotes that may serve as summary statement of the present discussion. History may therefore be looked upon as an extensive development of meaning and as an irradiation of meanings from a multiplicity of organizing centers. The constant shaking of the naive sense of meaningfulness is itself a, a new mode of meaning, a discovery of its continuity with the mysteriousness of being and what is as whole. The question of the meaning of history and the problem of the nature of historicity hold a central place in the various forms of the phenomenological tradition. They need to explain how things show up to consciousness and how it, its intentional structures develop into meaningful acts as the cure of issues of phenomenological research makes history and historicity rise as dimension connected with the consciousness of internal time. In terms of actual phenomenological perspective, the orientation of our temporal consciousness developed through retention as the non-thematically preservation of the past and pretension as presumption of the future. It is from the consideration of the inspiring reflection on history and historicity as problem arising from hustle phenomenological analysis of internal time consciousness that my paper takes its point of departure. My aim is to discuss the methodological question concerning history and historicity from the intersection between Rickers and Patochkas phenomenological inspired and history oriented philosophies. The main references are the first part of Ricoeur History and Truth, Truth in the Knowledge of History, and the third essay of Patochka's heretical essay in the philosophy of history, Does History Have a Meaning? My presentation consists of two connected sections. First, I will examine Ricoeur's and Patochka's critique of the Australian phenomenology in dealing with historical consciousness. I will focus the attention on the meaning of history as an open movement. Then I will shift the emphasis on Ricoeur's and Patochka responses to Heidegger account of being historical. This reflection will lead to examine history as interconnection with the past and historicity as a dimension connected to human beings situated freedom. The notion of horizon and hope will be explored in this context. The critical connection between Ricoeur's hermeneutical phenomenology and Patochka phenomenological thought singularly fits within the contemporary framework of the philosophy of history. It is surprising that there is relatively little research on the significant philosophical relatedness. The starting point of their philosophical project is similar. Their focal problematic is to revise phenomenology, preserving it as a descriptive method conjoined with hermeneutics in recur, 
or transforming it in a dialectical analysis of the modes of becoming. Despite the differences in way of addressing phenomenology, they appear to each other as partners in a common endeavor to apply phenomenological insight to human existence and to historical and practical concepts. The analysis of Husserl's conception of history as a phenomenological problem and in the examination of Heidegger's phenomenological ontology. Husserl and the Heidegger's phenomenologies have a profound impact on the philosophical formation of recurrent Patochka. Incarcerated as a prisoner of, prisoner of war for five years, in 1950, Ricord published with detailing introduction the translation of Husserl's Ideas I into French. In his early thinking, Ricord worked also as a commentator of the most important of Husserl's writings. In his hermeneutics, Ricord expresses admiration for Heidegger's analysis, an, an analysis of truth and temporality. However, he rejects Heidegger's short ontological path to understanding as a mode of being. This double influence is evident also in Patochka's thought. Profoundly impressed by Husserl's Paris lectures in 1929, after his doctoral dissertation, Patochka worked as a humble scholar in Freiburg with Husserl and attended Heidegger's lectures. Husserl's methodology for studying reality and the Heidegger existential ontological insight into the meaning of being formed the basis of Patochka's thought. Beyond the influences, the political and the intellectual turmoil of the first half of the 19th century stands in the background of Ricoeur and Patochka's common attention to the meaning of history and historicity as problems of deep philosophical interest. Ricoeur and Patochka focus on Husserl's turn to history in the crisis of the European sciences. Understanding the meaning of history is an explicit concern for Husserl's major phenomenology. Husserl does not focus on factual history, rather, he is interested in analyzing the inner meaning of history and how it comes to be established. He defined history as, I quote, nothing other than the vital movement of being with one another and the interweaving of the original formation of meaning and sedimentation of meaning. Aware of the challenges of thinking history in the aftermath of Husserl phenomenology, Ricoeur and Patochka developed two renewed philosophical approaches to this topic. The closeness of these thinkers in thinking history is explicitly testified by Ricoeur's introduction to the French edition of Patochka heretical essay, but also is in, in his 1997 article, Jan Patochka, Les Philosophes Résistants, presented in a Neapolitan conference devoted to the commemoration of Patochka's 20th death anniversary. Ricoeur's critical reading of Husserl's remained constant throughout his work from history and truth to the trilogy of time and, time and narrative and memory, history, and forgetting. Ricoeur holds that Husserl is one of the most unhistorical of professors. With unhistorical, Ricoeur means that the factual history was not Husserl's object of study. Thus, Ricoeur criticizes Husserl to have made history a transcendental mo motive, that is, to have reduced history to the history of consciousness. Ricoeur rightly argues that the key word of Husserl's approach to history is that of the advent of meaning. He accuses Husserl to have abandoned in his history of consciousness the possibility of the meaningless and then end of the individual, that is, of what is non systematizable. As opposed to Husserl's perspective, Ricoeur presents a second attitude according to which history does not unfold as a cohesive movement of a system, but as a series of appearances having their own meaning. Ricoeur introduces his own conception of history as a dimension, which is virtually continuous and discontinuous, continuous as a unique meaning in progress, and discontinuous as a configuration of persons. Ricoeur recognizes then that the meaning of history is in perfect mediation. It arises from the interweaving of different perspectives of anticipation of the future, reception of the past, and the lived experience of the present without upholding the idea of a totality, where reasoning history and its reality would finally coincide. Patochka's work is radical with respect to Husserl phenomenology. Like Ricoeur, he criticizes Husserl's phenomenological perspective of history, blaming him to consider history in a narrow sense, as connected to the analysis of the life world, without taking it as far as the concrete world of human life. According to Patochka, the question of the meaning of history requires a preliminary clarification 
of the concept of the meaning itself. In his essay, As a History of the Meaning, he begins his analysis with the revision of Frege's distinction between the notions of meaning sense and that of significance reference. Whereas significance indicates an objective relation and it's often limited to the realm of logos, meaning deals with the conception of an object. It renders something intelligible. Neither meaning can be reduced to purpose or value, nor to something obvious. Meaning requires the work of interpretation in order to be unveiled. In phenomenological terms, meaning as a progressive movement has to be searched through the openness of things themselves. Contrary to any subjectivistic position, in its phenomenological view, Patochka argues that the meaning does not exclusively depend on us because we do not have the power to keep things from appearing meaningless. Beyond the radical skepticism or nihilism, based on the disbelief in meaning that is independent of human life and the original and uncritical faith in meaning, Patochka finds a third way. As Rikor clearly argues in the preface of Patochka's heretical essay, I quote, haunted by nihilism, Patochka saw a way out in the notion of problematicity itself, a concept which appeared to him to evade both the dogmatic non-meaning and the cynical disciples of Nietzsche, as well as the dogmatism of any straightforward apologetic of meaning. It is in this context that Patochka discusses the meaning of history as a problematic meaning, moving from the distinction between the natural and the historical world. The question of the meaning of history is connected to the problem of freedom in history and to the concepts of horizon and hope. Because and Patochka respective reflections on the problem of the historical meaning and, the, and their own responses to Husserl's critical uh, crisis challenges are connected to the critical reappropriation of Heidegger's early analysis of the design and to the rejection of, of the late Heideggerian reduction of history to the history of being. Neither the meaning of history can be reduced to the space of transcendental subjectivity, nor it can be taught through a pure rejection of the subject. Beyond these extremes, the reconsideration of Heidegger's idea of design thrownness in beings and time figures in, as an essential component of Ricoeur and Patochka philosophical approaches to historical reality. According to Heidegger, being in the world must be read in the sense of being an openness towards the world. Human being does not produce entities, but the design offers the possibility to entities to manifest. The manifestation of the world is always an historical fact. The temporal existence of the design is the ultimate delimiting condition for our interpretative understanding. As inescapably finite and historical creatures, our temporality is intended by Heidegger in the sense of possibility, namely within the context limited in advance by the awareness of our mortality. On this basis, Rikor and Patochka interrogate the nature of human freedom and its implication in history. According to Rikor, what humans say and do presupposes both a fi finite freedom that enables us to intervene in the natural processes and the dependence on these processes for the efficacy of our actions. More precisely, our acts are meaningful responses to a context which is wholly of our own making. Patochka conceives the integration in the world and the harmony of human being with the context not as a fall, but as a presupposition of the act of sending out into freedom. On this point, I claim that Patochka is very close to Ricoeur's idea that natures make freedom possible, whereas freedom makes nature meaningful. Following Patochka's lead, freedom is a leap into a new meaning, which is realized in the clarity of the problematic situation. Freedom presupposes the terror of shaking in the sense that it can lead to the loss of naive meaning, but also to meaninglessness. The paradox between freedom and necessity is not portrayed in a negative sense. As Rikor writes in the introduction to Patochka essays, historical life must be understood not from the point of view of the day, of accepted life, but from the point of view of the night, that is, of polemos. Our ideas of life and of the world have to be constantly questioned. Although Patochka describes the course of history as a movement going from the care of the soul to its lost, he believes that the meaning of history needs to be researched anew. As such, Patochka feels that the problem of history may not be resolved, but it must be preserved as a problem. Even if in the course of history, 
is described in quite pessimistic terms, the possibility of a renewed meaning enabled the preservation of hope. However, the open horizon of history is differently conceived by Ricoeur and Patochka. In Patochka's perspective, the horizon of history seen as the hope of a return to the care of the soul is not an horizon of eschatology or messianism. Patochka's perspective on history showed that modern ideologies have objectified the open horizon of time by creating an enclosing horizon that needs to be, to be broken through. Also for Ricoeur, history stands in relation of openness in respect to the future. However, contrary to Patochka, Ricoeur relies on a call from a Christian revelation moving from philosophy to theology. Ricoeur's philosophy of history might therefore be defined as a thinking according to hope in which the tension between finitude and infinitude, particularity and universality, past and present, is productively accepted. Hope is not merely an expectation of some future good, but an active horizon of thinking, grounded in the ability that human beings have to recognize the unity and the division that exists within themselves. Hope is not an imperative, it cannot be perfected, but only be actively cultivated. As Ricoeur concludes in the quote, hope brings about no reshoring of Hebung, it does not surmount but affronts. Just let me move to my final remarks. In my paper, I explain the way in which recurrent Patochka presents significant analysis to think at the concept of history from a renewed phenomenological perspective. We have seen that these thinkers move away from Husserl's understanding of the meaning of history as elaborated in the metro conception of transcendental phenomenology. The problem of the meaning of history finds careful reconsideration uh, through recurrence and Patochka phenomenology. Ricoeur and Patochka share what might be called a post asserian heritage in dealing with the problem of history. The word of history appears as co-original with the subject as never exhausted reality, which is always to be explored. The horizon of history includes both the critical recollection of the past and the active expectation of the future. O is the key dimension for thinking history as a meaningful dimension of our existence. In conclusion, history is a dynamic perspective of being affected by the past and being open toward the future. And historicity is characterized by the productive dialectic of freedom and necessity, openness, closedness, meaningfulness, and meaninglessness. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vendra, for the presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, so now we can move to the questions and answers part. Uh, so is there anybody on Zoom who would like to ask questions? And for those on YouTube, you can ask the questions through the uh, through the uh, Slido app with the hashtag, hashtag uh, Herald. Uh, on Zoom, if you want to ask a question, just raise the hand through the reactions. Okay, so uh, I would like to if, if nobody want, uh, if nobody has anything to ask right now, I would like to uh, ask personally about the uh, importance of the uh, of the connection between Patochka and Ricoeur, like how uh, how much of their joint work uh, has influence on your current work uh, in a way where. They, they have been both influenced by the same people technically, and you are influenced by them. And you wrote this work technically straight up on them. So the question is how, how does their relationship influence your work, their connectedness? Well, thank you very much for your question. Um, as I said in my presentation, there is very little 
literature on recurrent and pathogen at the moment. I mean, there is a lot of secondary literature on recur and on pathogen, but there is almost nothing on the relationship between them. So before starting my postdoctorate uh, project, I believe that a contribution in order to rethink the interconnection between Patochka and Ricoeur thought would be um, a very good contribution uh, in the philosophical panorama. Specifically, I was interested in the topic of memory, not of history <laughs> at first. And so um, my postdoctoral project is on the conception of uh, collective memory from the intersection between uh, Patochka and Ricoeur. And um, I would say that I'm, I'm more influenced by Ricoeur rather than on Patochka. But the relationship between them, and also the, there are also big differences between them, for example, the ethical perspective, or, or also in, the, in their thinking of history and memory, we can find also very relevant uh, differences. Um, and I think that also the, the questioning of the topic of history uh, should be accompanied with the topic of memory. I mean that we cannot um, work on a project on memory without considering the importance of the question of the meaning of history. Okay, uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, so are there any uh, questions? Oh, uh, Martin Liner has a question. Yeah, hello. Oh, and just a moment, sorry. So now it's better. <laughs> sorry for this noise. Um, yeah, thank you for this very clear and uh, precise presentation. I um, also work on Recur, so I'm a bit uh, curious uh, how far you want to go in, his, uh, in the study about him. So I think you presented very well his phenomenological part, um, but, more, uh, but later in his uh, development, uh, much more important became also things like uh, language. And with language, also this, uh, sin, this things about meaning, so that he, and, and poetics, or for example, to create a narrative out of what happens. Uh, is this Mimesis one and two in Ton et Récit, and uh, as well this uh, kind of uh, whole world of meaning you have in the language when you would make a, a narrative out of something you see, which is still uh, quite absent of the, in the sense of uh, um, sin uh, in, uh, in Husserl and in this uh, early phenomenological phase where language is almost absent. So this, how this phenomenology came over this, uh, um, was overcome by hermeneutics and poetics and language thought is, I find very fascinating, but uh, I'm just curious how far you want to go in your study. I think the first is also already very rich, but uh, the second has also a kind of a further development and what you think about this. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. Um, indeed, in my study, I start from phenomenology and then I move also to hermeneutics because record thought can be not simply considered as a phenomenology, but it's a phenomenological hermeneutics. And then, you know, we have all the variation of phenomenology also with um, phenomenological existentialism of Heidegger and so on. So I think that in order to think memory and history, we can consider four different levels. A first level can be the phenomenological level as the basis of the discussion. Then the linguistic level, the narrative level, and finally the ethical and social level. In this way, we can show like also an evolution of both recurrent Patoshka thought separately, but also together in order to rethink the conception of history and memory in a more broad way. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the an a qu nice question and answer. Uh, I just wanted to say that I made a mistake and the discussion panel was supposed to be at the end of all three presentations. Uh, so we are going to move now to the second presentation and then there will be a whole discussion window for all three presentations, I'm sorry. Uh, so without further ado, we will move to our next speaker, uh, who is Francesco Ferrari. Uh, Dr. Ferrari holds a PhD degree from the University of Genoa uh, and for a dissertation on Martin Buber, Religion and religi Religiosity. 
and is currently postdoctoral researcher at the Friedrich Schiller Jena, uh, Friedrich Schiller University Jena, and the coordinator of Jena Center for Reconciliation Studies, and of his doctoral, doctoral school religion conflict uh, reconciliation. His current work focuses on the issue of reconciliation with oneself and the role of lived time in reconciliatory process with a focus on Jewish moral and religious philosophy of the 20th century. Uh, he trans uh, and today's work of Dr. Dr. Ferrari uh, will be focused on four diseases of temporality and their impact on reconciliatory process. Uh, so again, during the presentation, you can ask questions either directly in Zoom or you can write them into the Slido application. And uh, without further ado, Dr. Ferrari, you can start. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, the invitation to participate to the great event to Dagmar. And thank you also for the doctoral students of Vienna to be so much with us today. So today my presentation is entitled Four Diseases of Temporality and Their Impact on Reconciliatory Processes. The presentation is based on the writings of a French Lithuanian Jewish philosopher, Vladimir Yankelevich. He was born in 1903 and uh, he died in 1985. He was professor of moral philosophy at the Sorbonne University in Paris for almost 30 years, between 1951 and 1979. And nevertheless, his reception in the English and German speaking scene has only recently begun. And it happened almost exclusively with regard to the question of forgiveness in his thought, for mostly promoted by the role of Jacques Derrida as a key interlocutor in a book that was called Pardonné. My presentation takes into account an ethical perspective on time and time-related moral feelings that Yankelevich calls in a book, L'Irreversible la Nostalgie, he calls those feelings diseases of temporality. In order to understand the diseases of temporality, you need, first of all, a kind of conceptualization of uh, time, according to Yankelevich. As we can see, time, according to him, has two fundamental and conflict dimensions. First, consider as the flow of constant becoming and production of future, ratifying nature laws, time is understood from Yankelevich as irreversible. This is the time of natural sciences. Time as a flow of constant becoming. From the other side, morally recognized as the indestructible being of what has been in its having taken place, time is set as irrevocable. So that whereby reversing time is impossible and regaining a past moment in the purity of its pastness is unattainable too, from the other side, a moral option is offered in a resistance against irreversibility that takes place through the recognition of a past moment as something irrevocable. And uh, this recognition is something very important in uh, Yankelevich's considerations about time. The irrevocable, which is the basis of this moral recognition, requires also that human beings do not experience irreversible time in the amnesia of a man's momentanea, but on the contrary, they are endowed of the faculty of memory. In the middle of irre irreversibility, the substantial consciousness of a person attests itself in memory as continuity of a duration, or uh, to speak with a French term that Yankelevich takes from Henri Bergson, the durée. And commenting the writings of Bergson, Yankelevich will acknowledge that memory is the durée itself as a continuation of change. It expresses that there is no duration without a consciousness that is capable of prolonging its past in its present. So that keeping and recalling the not anymore of the past, memory prepares to face the not yet of the future with a reasonable pre-comprehension. The act of remembering is articulated as a backwards motion, which apparently contrary to the irreversible sense of becoming, takes actually place in a given present moment and is also oriented in the sense of the irreversible, which is the future. 
Looking back, in other terms, always implies looking and going forward. No past event is attainable in the purity of its pastness. And recalling it to our consciousness implies interpreting it, drawing actually a new segment on the arrow of irreversible time. Therefore, memory shapes, not merely stores, images of the past. Through an idealizing stylization, and it is constantly exposed to the hermeneutical character, which is inherent to any retrospective glimpse. I quote Yankelevich, memory is the exercise of a power more than the growth of a having. It is more the recreation or active realization of the past than its registration, end of a quote. Therefore, according to our author, memory is the organ, but also an obstacle of irrevocable. Memory work of integration of traces from past experiences accompanies the constant transformation of a person. I quote again, the past rarely disappears without leaving any trace. The work of time, in fact, consists of integrating or digesting the adventitious event. The organism, indeed, appears as a totality that is incessantly deformed and transformed revised, retouched, and altered by the accidents of existence." End of a quote. This work of ceaseless integration that shapes and reshapes our identity through the work of memory, therefore belong to the fundamental prerequisites in reconciliatory processes, such as the healing of memory, which allows reconciliation with oneself. From the other side, it also plays a crucial role facing those protracted moral feelings that Yankelevich will call diseases of temporality. Wrongdoings, indeed, once they are acknowledged in their indestructible irrevocability, are set as irrevocable for the interval time to come. Wrongdoings took place, nevertheless, in the ineffable extension of the instant. The hermeneutical faculty of memory is of paramount concern, since it makes possible and jeopardizes at the same time a faithful bond toward the irrevocable instant. According to Yankelevich, memory operates a ceaseless overcoming and integration of suffered offenses in a higher synthesis, a process he ascribes also to the work of reconciliation. Whereby his vehement critique of any form of instrumental reconciliation is quite known, the co-entanglement Yankelevich individuates between memory, forgiveness, and reconciliation has received scarce attention. Through an unmistakable echo of Hegel's notion of Aufhebung, reconciliation is defined in Le Pardon as the dialectic pacification and cessation of belligerence that overcomes and integrates suffered offenses, which is made possible through the higher synthesis of a forgiveness without forgetting. Quote from Le Pardon, just as the organism adapts to a strange body, so the offended person arrives at a modus vivendi with the offense. Forgiveness will thus resemble a mediation that integrates the antithesis into a higher synthesis. Is not dialectic conciliation, literally reconciliation, that is pacification and cessation of all belligerence? The reconciled or repentant consciousness carries in the form of a scar the trace of old moral traumatisms, forgiven offenses, and redeemed misdeeds." End of a quote. So I come to the so-called diseases of temporality. The, the co-entanglement between memory and reconciliation leads to the central object of my presentation, a phenomenology of time-related moral feelings profoundly impacting reconciliatory processes. Resentment, nostalgia, regret, and remorse. Those are the four diseases of temporality. They arise in the dialectic between the irreversible and the irrevocable, mediated by memory, and represent as such the main obstacles towards the work of overcoming and integration proper of reconciliation. Yankelevich coins for them the expression diseases of temporality, aptly focusing on their painful, sometimes even traumatic essence. Through their examination, it becomes evident that the past does not merely pass, but rather remains as lived time. As a pupil of Bergson, Yankelevich inherits his conception of durée, reshaping it in moral terms. 
a lived time that structures and burdens the consciousness of victims and victimizers as well. Aiming at the creation of normal and if possible good relationships after violent incidents, this is the definition of reconciliation by Martin Leiner, reconciliatory processes require to be considered as temporal processes. It therefore becomes salient how and why the diseases of temporality represent tenacious counter forces which often lead to enduring states of irreconcilability. The diseases of temporality arise through the suffering originated by the lived time, considered as irreversible as well as irrevocable, and stem from the impossibility to reverse the irreversible past, but also with the difficulties of getting rid of the burden represented by the irrevocable. In L'Irreversible la Nostalgie, Yankelevich recognizes that the regime of reversibility gives rise to all kinds of pathic experiences and events in the human being. The reversible is primarily experienced as an incurable illness, as an irreparable disease. In this regard, the role played by the revocable cannot be underestimated. Quote, the uh, becoming becomes without ever reverting and to make matter worse, human decisions render irrevocable this irreversibility, end of a quote. This is a kind of irony of destiny. And with a pathological lexicon, Yankelevich describes the struggle between irreversible and irrevocable as one between two illnesses whose impossible cure is searched in their mutual neutralization. Fluctuating between the wish of making present a past which is too past and making a past a present which is too present, the diseases of temporality are paramount in reconciliatory processes expressed in a past suffered as irreversible through regret and nostalgia and as irrevocable through resentment and remorse. <coughs> now I go more in detail into the four diseases of temporality. First, resentment. As a sentiment that is felt occasioned by another sentiment, resentment, as the word suggests, feels time and again a previously suffered offense, expressing a persistent bitterness towards one's own victimizer. Accompanied by virtues like loyalty and tenacity, constituting somehow an ethical option, if not a virtue in itself, this is the thesis, for instance, of Thomas Brudholm, Resentment is defined by Yankelevich as a moral protest against temporality, which stems from the irreparability of the situation prior to the crime and from the moral impossibility of the new situation. A consonance might be noted with the reflections of the Holocaust survivor, Jeanne Amery, who wrote in the same year in Yankelevich's von Schuldensöhne, quote Amery, my resentment is my personal protest Again, is the anti-moral natural process of healing that time brings about, by which I make the genuinely human and absurd demand that time be turned back. End of a quote from Ameri. In a later work, Ameri himself explicitly refers to Yankelevich with sincere admiration for his works. Notwithstanding the impossibility of reversing time and to reach the past in its vastness, Re resentment intends for Yankelevich as well as for Amery to stop the forgetful course of irreversible becoming, recognizing an irrevocable character to the offense. Subsequently, it continues to feel it as a present wound, which can be neither healed nor overcome. Therefore, resentment is a primary source of irreconcilability, and its central organ is to be found in memory. And now we understand why memory is at the same time organ and obstacle of uh, reconciliatory processes. We understand it better and better. True memory, struggling against the temporal decay of monastic traces and any indifference towards the past, resentment becomes uh, resistance, resistance towards the reversible in a duty to remember, which is accompanied, psychologically speaking, by the traumatic impossibility to forget. Nonetheless, Yankelevich is aware that the past is the realm of the impossible, of what exceeds our power to act. Applying it to the irreversibly bygone past, apply our power to act, I mean, our self-efficacy, uh, this damages the human capacity of starting something anew. 
It gets evidence how and why resentment represents the disease of temporality par excellence. Painfully, the resentment person leaves the possibility not only to reverse the reversible time, but also to start doing it. There is a correlation notably described in Nietzsche's Genealogie der Moral between the excess of remembrance, which takes place in a sterile rumination, a consequent powerlessness, and finally in the turning of the resenting consciousness against itself as bad consciousness. So that, quote from Yankelevich, the activity rather than unloading itself in effective gestures, centrifugal and precisely adapted to the outside world, arrests itself, recedes, and becomes emotion, that is to say, a re-scented thing. End of a quote. Saturating an atmosphere with stagnant distrust, the, the reluctance of the resentment to reconciliation constitutes in the public sphere also a fertile soil for politics of resentment, which undermines the peaceful coexistence between social actors and social groups. And where a sincere will for reconciliation is lacking, peace is necessarily precarious. I go to the second disease of temporality, nostalgia. The disease of temporality of nostalgia implies the interaction of return as the part of the word nostos suggests, and pain, in Greek, algos. Yankelevich defines nostalgia as a human melancholy made possible by consciousness, the consciousness of something else, consciousness of an elsewhere, that is awareness of a contrast between past and present, between present and future, end of a quote. Paradigmatically exemplified by the Jewish conscience of the diaspora, the disease of nostalgia develops itself as a sorrowful, haunting desire of return, which stems from the collision between the irreversibility of time and the reversibility of space. Consequently, its healing is often searched for by returning to one's place of origin, <coughs> restoring in space the status quo ante. A decisive paradox takes place in this regard. Quote from Yankelevich, the return to the familiar place or to the native land is possible, but it is not possible to revert the becoming, end of the quote. Nonetheless, given a constant process of alteration operated by irreversible time, the one who returns through the cancellation of distance in space has become another person. What nostalgia really seeks is not the return in time, but the impossible reverse uh, is not the return in space, but the impossible reversion of time. The real remedy for nostalgia is not going back into space, but reaching the past through time. Narratives of refugees or exiles coming back to their homeland, as we can learn again from Jean and Marie's life and works, witness that returning by reversing space is possible, but is often a disappointing, alienating experience. An explanation of this is offered by the irrevocable character of time and space yearned by nostalgia. Qualitatively different from any other space, it belongs to a partic geography. Like resentment, nostalgia is a reaction against the irreversible, which configures itself as a loyalty towards the irrevocable, aiming at the past in its unattainable pastness. Therefore, also nostalgia inhibits our willingness to reconcile. It desperately searches for a past that cannot return, casting away from any given present, and finally implies, since our power to act expresses itself only in one's openness to the future, a feeling of overwhelming powerlessness. Now it's time for a nice pair, remorse and regret. The dialectic between the diseases of temporality of regret and remorse, inspired already in 1933, Yankelevich's thesis complementaire on the bad conscience, and finally reflects the dynamic equilibrium between irreversibility and re irrevocability. If regret arises from the fact of not having done what could have been done, remorse from the other side arises from the fact of having done, and having done too much, having done badly. Hence, regret shows an having done too little, a certain powerlessness, and the sense from the vain effort to recover an irreversible absence, a concavity that the irreversible digs behind us, 
Remorse, on the contrary, stems from uh, having done too much and uh, is a misuse of our power to act and descends from the vain effort to make an irrevocable presence absent. And it is the convexity which is the deposit of the irrevocable. The related feelings are also different. Regret expresses a languor imbued by powerlessness, melancholy, nostalgia, sharing with the irreversible, a kind of impalpable bittersweet ghostly dimension in which the charm of the past vibrates. From the other side, the remorse bites the conscience with the imperative of irrevocable through guilty feelings, shame, and finally desperation, which is a prerequisite of any genuine repentance. Quote from Yankelevich, regret is morally indifferent, ethically neutral to the extent that one can regret anything. Remorse, on the contrary, in its characteristic form is the moral suffering that the guilty person feels remembering his fault, end of the quote. Regret is linked to the nostalgia of the irreversible and then to a certain aesthetic tone. Through it, the unhappy consciousness become lyrically fecund. Remorse is linked to the resentment of the irrevocable and then leads to ethics. Through it, bad conscience develops avoiding attitudes, identifying one's fault with the whole person. Regret and remorse confirm the two fundamental laws of irreversibility and irrevocability. First, it is not possible to reverse irreversible time, that is to relieve past experiences, hence the illusion of regret. Second, it is not possible to delete the irrevocable moment, undoing the fact of having done, hence the desperation of remorse. Their interconnectedness finally reflects the one between irreversible and irrevocable. Quote from Yankelevich, the irrevocable gives rise to the remorse. To be delivered from it, one would be tempted to go along blindly with the irreversible. But the irreversible, in turn, gives rise to the regret that to find the past again would be tempted to hang on the irrevocable. End of a quote. Just a second. Uh, yes. We will be. We will need to move to the next panel. So, if you could jump to the conclusion, if that is possible. Yes, I have just. Yes, I will be very quick. So all diseases of temporality show that the irreversible cannot be reversed, the irrevocable cannot be annihilated, that both remain unconciled if faced with restoring the status quo ante. Reconciliatory processes concern a new beginning that the consciousness stuck in the diseases of temporality can barely perceive. Actually, the diseases of temporality show that the reconciliation does not take place merely benefiting from the equivalence logic of justice to reshape the status quo ante. Therefore, a new beginning, which stems from an overabundance logic, is needed beyond any need for that measures which inhabits justice in its punitive retributive paradigm as well as in its commutative reparative one. The gift-giving relationship of forgiveness, from which the, uh, the reception of Yankelevich has been recently begun, is paramount in this regard, and gains evidence in the moral confrontation between love and justice. Amid this struggle, fundamental in reconciliatory processes, the final polarity on his fault announces itself, namely the one between the linear order of law and the hyperbolical order of grace. And now I come to the conclusions. This presentation developed a phenomenology of reconciliatory processes according to their temporal connotation, based on the writings of Yankelevich. Following an apophatic approach, which focuses on the obstacles that are to be encountered along the way towards reconciliation, the issue of diseases of temporality, that is time-related moral feelings which obstruct the reconciliatory processes, has been addressed at its core. To reach its goal, the presentation has reconstructed several pluralities that shape the theoretical philosophy of Yankelevich. First, the one between irreversible Reversibility and revocability. Nonetheless, it had the practical aim to investigate how and why in philosophical terms is reconciliation possible. Now, time for three very final remarks. First, reconciliatory processes fail if they are backwards oriented toward the reconstruction of a sameness of an injured ipsity, which is not available anymore given the irrevocability of a suffered offense and the irreversibility of bygone time. Second, 
On the contrary, reconciliatory processes mean and allow a new beginning, a forward-oriented one that can be successful only insofar as it does not seek sameness but otherness. Third, and final one, as such, reconciliation addresses the worldly otherness of the other, victim and victimizer as well, with that love which directly stems from a worldly other order, namely an order of grace that integrates and overcomes with overabundance any attempt of the equivalence logic that inhabits the human all to human order of love. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, okay, thank you, Francesco, for this thorough, amazing presentation. Uh, so now we will have to move straight to the second, to the next presentation, which will be from uh, Peter Scheida. <coughs> um, Peter Scheida is a senior researcher at the Institute of Philosophy of the Solag Academy of Sciences. His research focuses on anthropological and social political issues, which he approaches with reference to the thought of Kierkegaard, Buber, and Schmidt. He collaborates with the Kierkegaard Research Center in Copenhagen, where he serves as editor of the Kierkegaard Studies Yearbook and the Kierkegaard Studies Monograph series. Uh, and Dr. Scheida will today present his work called How to Overcome Political Narratives About the Absolute Enemy. So, Dr. Scheida, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, um, thanks for the word. So um, um, basically my um, presentation will be about um, um, one item in um, Carl Schmitt's thought, uh, which um, concerns the uh, principle of the limitation of enmity. And um, I consider this element in Schmidt's thought, uh, an important antidote to the notion of absolute enmity, which he thematizes and discusses uh, quite well, I would say. Um, so in his writings uh, after, the, after World War II, Carl Schmidt repeatedly pointed out that a new narrative about uh, the political enemy emerged in the 20th century. Um, while for more than 250 years since the peace of Westphalia in the 17th century, the political enemy had been mostly viewed as an equal and treated with considerable respect. World War I brought about a crucial change. With the rise of revolutionary movements, first communism and then Nazism, a new kind of enemy emerged. A narrative about the absolute enemy was created. This kind of enemy deserved no respect and was to be eliminated under any circumstances. The enemy lost his status of an equal and even of a human being. The radical narrative about the absolute enemy spread like fire in the first half of the 20th century and led to the extermination of millions of people. In my contribution, I will focus uh, first on the principle of the limitation of enmity, which I consider an efficient antidote to the narratives about the absolute enemy. Since this principle is based on respect for the, for the enemy's humanity, I interpret it as a form of education to humaneness. After presenting Schmidt's view of this principle, I will highlight four aspects of this principle that I consider relevant for today. So first, Schmidt's defense of the limitation of enmity and his rejection of the absolute enemy. Schmidt introduces a collective concept of the enemy and focuses on relations between collectives. He defines the enemy as a political collective that endangers another collective's way of being, which leads to various kinds of conflicts. The most intensive Conflict is war in which collectives negate each other's way of being by military action. Schmidt claims that war as a real possibility is an essential part of the concept of enmity. A key element of Schmidt's reflections on enmity and war is the principle of the limitation of enmity, which is a corrective to the natural human tendency to discriminate the enemy. Schmidt presents this tendency as an anthropological constant that can only be overcome by means of a systematic effort. A lack of regulation of this tendency can lead to an unbounded devastation of the enemy. 
Schmidt points out that the relation to the enemy is marked by a natural psychological negativization, which attributes to the enemy even such negative characteristics that are not political in nature. I quote, emotionally, the enemy is easily treated as being evil and ugly because every distinction, most of all the political, as the strongest and most intense of the distinctions draws upon other distinctions for support." End of quote. Due to this cum cumulative negativization, discrimination and denigration appear as natural approaches to the enemy. In a situation of war in which the conflict escalates and violence is used, the negativization of the enemy becomes even more pronounced and leads to his criminalization. I interpret the principle of delimitation of enemy of enmity as a form of education to humaneness. I have chosen this term, which is not found in Schmidt, because a systematic correction of the tendency to discriminate one's enemy has an obvious educational character. The participants of the conflict who abide by this principle regulate their own tendency to denigrate the enemy. This form of self-education has a humanizing effect because it takes into account the enemy's human dignity and prevents a disproportional use of force. It has an existential as well as political dimension since self-restraint is practiced both at the individual and the collective level. The aim of the education to humaneness is to ensure that even in an escalated conflict, the enemy is not dehumanized. Schmidt identifies in the history of political thought a paradigm which emphasizes substantial limitation of enmity and systematic regulation of war. He traces its beginnings to the 16th and 17th centuries when the foundational figures of international law, Alberico Gentili and Richard Zusch, formulated the principle of the equality of political enemies. In the 18th and 19th centuries, this principle was applied and further developed in European land wars in which regular armies of sovereign states faced each other. The Congress of Vienna in 1815 confirmed the principle and it was still a crucial point of reference in World War I. The classical law of war, which was created on the basis of this principle, is characterized by clear distinctions between war and peace, the enemy and the criminal, the combatant and the non-combatant. The norms of this law protect the enemy by preventing the vanquished and prisoners of war from being classified as objects of punishment or vengeance or as hostages, and by incorporating a clause on amnesty into peace treaties. Distinguishing the enemy from the criminal, the rebel, the traitor, or the pirate ensures that he is treated with respect as an equal. This distinction, which resulted in a substantial regulation of warfare, had a salutary effect, particularly in Germany, which had been devastated by the fratricidal confessional wars of the 16th and the 17th centuries. Schmidt defines the concept of war, which presupposes moral and legal equality of the warring parties as non-discriminatory and highlights the fact that throughout the conflict, the parties treat each other as, as just enemies, justi hostes. Schmidt considers this to be the strongest possible humanization since it represents a refusal to criminalize the adversary and the rejection of absolute en enmity. The aim of the conflict is not to destroy and obliterate the enemy, but to determine new boundaries for their mutual relations. In this concept, the conduct of war does not constitute a crime, since both parties are equally just in this respect. What constitutes a crime is the breach of the norms regulating the conduct of war, such as the infringement on the rights of prisoners of war. The opposite of the non-discriminatory non concept of war is the discriminatory concept, which presupposes moral and legal hierarchization of the parties in conflict. 
Schmidt sees the origin of this concept in the doctrine of just war, which attributes justice only to one party of the conflict and thus abolishes moral and legal equality of the enemies. As a result, the concept of the just enemy is replaced with the concept of the perfidious enemy, perfidus hostis, and the distinction between the enemy and the criminal is eliminated. One party becomes the judge of the other. Schmidt considers World War I a watershed event in military history in which the principle of the limitation of enmity was applied decisively for the last time. The war began as a regulated conflict of regular armies, but ended as a revolutionary war, which brought to the fore a new type of enemy and war. According to Schmidt, the end of World War I marks the rise of theories which abandon the principle of the limitation of enmity and instead emphasize its absolutization. These theories are results of totalitarian ideologies which consider the existence of certain enemies unacceptable. The radicality of these theories is manifest in the fact that they introduce an exter exterminatory concept of the enemy. The tendency to discriminate one's enemy does not appear problematic from the perspective of absolute enmity, since it enhances the intensity of the fight aimed at a total destruction of the enemy. What appears as problematic is education to humaneness, since it protects the enemy and thus prevents an unreserved commitment to the fight against him. The concept of the equality of enemies, respect for the enemy, and the principle of protecting him against unnecessary harm are incompatible with the goals of absolute enmity. The def defamation and oppression of the enemy are necessary means to achieve absolute victory. Absolute enmity is a symptom of the breakdown of political restraint. Schmidt points out that while the promoters of absolute enmity call for justice and humaneness, in practice, they refuse to treat the enemy as just, and in some cases, even as human. The most striking examples are the class enemy and the racial enemy, in relation to whom the intensity of degradation is maximized. When the enemy becomes an inhuman monster or life unworthy of life, his destruction becomes a merit. For this reason, absolute enmity is the most intensive form of enmity. In the fight against the absolute enemy, the, distinction or, the distinctions originating from the renewal of the law of war after the Congress of Vienna appear as a burden that weakens the dynamic of the fight. The classical law of war thus becomes an object of criticism, but the elimination of its distinctions has a clearly dehumanizing effect despite the claims of the opposite. The absolutization of enmity and war was in the 20th century enhanced by rapid technological development of arms industry. This factor, which in itself does not have an ideological character, represents a new challenge for the principle of the limitation of enmity, since any use of weapons of mass destruction has far-reaching consequences. Schmidt argues that the concept of absolute enmity um, appears to be immanent in the nuclear age, as the power of the new weapons forces it even upon those who reject it, but need to prove themselves in a potential military conflict. Simultaneously, Schmidt expresses the hope that the magnitude of the nuclear threat will force humanity to return to a more humane concept of the enemy. Although the ways of applying uh, the principle of the limitation of enmity cannot be me mechanically transposed from the 19th and the 20th century to the 21st century, the basic moments of the principle remain unchanged and it still represents an efficient barrier against absolute enmity. So the second, the final part, um, four aspects of the principle of the limitation of enmity relevant for today. Although Schmidt's investigations were largely historical and aimed at the issues of his day, new global developments have only confirmed his philosophical intuition about the relevance of the principle. 
There are four aspects that I would like to um, highlight as relevant for conflict management today. First, it is important to highlight the key role of the cumulative negativization of the enemy, both at the individual and the collective level. On the basis of this negativization, a natural tendency to defame and discriminate the enemy develops, which in times of war turns into a tendency to criminalize him. This tendency is readily mis misused by political propaganda, which systematically defames the enemy. Different kinds of prejudice are used to strengthen enmity and deepen political tensions. If the negativization is not regulated, enmity is absolutized and the enemy's rights are disregarded. Therefore, the narratives about the absolute enemy must be countered and the tendency to discriminate him must be systematically regulated. And this can be done not only in the context of war, but in, in any political context. Second, if the natural tendency to, to discriminate the enemy is to be corrected, the enemy's humanity must be emphasized since it guarantees the equality of all the parties involved. By relating to the enemy as an equal, one avoids a hierarchization that would force the enemy into the position of inferiority and submission. The equality of the enemies is a basic barrier against absolute enmity, which aims to completely suppress the being of the other. The recognition of the anthropological equality of the enemies is a key step in education to humaneness, which involves respect for the enemy uh, and his protection from unnecessary harm. Anthropological equality precedes secondary determinations of the enemy. With regard to the negativization of the enemy, it is necessary to systematically anchor the impulse of humanization in the rules that are binding for the warring collectives and guide the actions of the individual fighters. Third, the main humanizing strategy is the limitation of enmity, which is based on the distinction between the enemy and the criminal. This distinction makes it possible to view the enemy as an equal, not only at the anthropological, but also at the legal and moral level. This distinction prevents indiscriminate criminalization of the enemy and limits criminalization to concrete acts that violate the law of war. It is a preventive measure against discriminatory war in which the enemy is condemned and punished. It is also efficient prevention against ideological absolutization of enmity, which uses the condemnable character of the enemy to degrade him and to treat him as unjust or even unhuman. Fourth and final, um, the progress of military technology significantly increases the threat of large-scale annihilation of human life. The spread of new weapons of mass destruction is a challenge for the principle of the limitation of enmity, since these weapons enable only a rough differentiation of targets. Humanity's own creations endanger its very existence in an increasing measure. The technological progress has an ambivalent character as the potential use of immense destructive force prompts man to an alibistic acceptance of the concept of absolute enmity, but the fear of large scale destruction prompts him to return to the concept of limited enmity. Moreover, along with the importance of technical capabilities, the importance of human decision-making increases. Even in the nuclear age, the human factor remains the decisive variable in the approach to the enemy. Education to humaneness can today have the form of man refusing to submit himself to his own creations um, and thus not becoming a victim of his own possibilities. Disarmament treaties and treaties of non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction are examples of efficient implementation of the principle of the limitation of enmity and thus of are examples of education to humaneness. They are examples of meaningful self-restraint which protect human life and direct our attention to positive elements in political relations. Thank you for your attention. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Shaida, for the presentation. Uh, so now we will move to our last panelist, uh, who, who is uh, James Ruter. Uh, James Ruter is a first year MA student at California State University, Long Beach. Uh, having, completed his in, having completed his bachelor's in philosophy and history at Kalama, Kalamazoo College in 2017, uh, James received honors on his senior thesis and the, department, and the Department of Philosophy Prize for his graduating year. At present, he is largely focused on broadening his philosophical background and sharpening his skills, but he believes, believes his MA thesis will fall broadly within the phenomenological tradition. Uh, James' today's work will be concerning the topic of, a phen of phenomenology of history. And James, the floor is yours. All right, uh, can everybody hear me well? All right, let's see. All right, thank you. Um, thanks everybody for having me. Um, I guess I'll just dive right in since we're uh, on a little bit of a limited time. Um, anyway, I'll uh, attach a handout here real quick to be a little helpful to follow along. Put that in there. All right. Hayden White's meta history presents itself as a history of historical consciousness in 19th century Europe. Given that the 19th century witnessed history's development into a disciplined academic pursuit, meta history also poses a general theory of the structure of that mode of thought, which is called historical. I'll attempt to summarize this tome as uh, briefly as I can. First, White states that it is possible to view historical consciousness as a specifically Western prejudice by which the presumed superiority of modern industrial society can be retroactively substantiated. Thus, the value of this historical consciousness itself becomes dubious. This first claim I will not address at present, but it pr will prove problematic for David Carr's account, with which I am largely in agreement. Second, White claims that we endow the past with meaning because in itself it has none. The historical writer must form the past into a narrative because the past is formless, or at least it does not have the rhetorical forms that alone make it meaningful in communication. This second claim is the focus of my talk. What this entails for White is that the historical work is at its core a, quote, verbal structure in the form of narrative prose discourse that purports to be a model or icon of past structures and processes, and the interest of explaining what they were by representing them. Thus, when White analyzes the historical consciousness of 19th century Europe, he does so with the understanding that his subject is ultimately a literary product rather than a scientific endeavor. The form the past takes in a historical work is not based on concerns of epistemological validity by the aesthetic and moral values held by the historian. As a result of this, White declares that the process of composition begins at least as early as the moment of a choice of subject, rather than at the conclusion of the historian's research. In White's view, positivist philosophies of history simply miss the point. Their focus on the scientific nature of history obscures the historical work status as a literary product. History does not need to become more scientific in his view, but quite the opposite, it needs to become more imaginative. His method for the expansion of the historical imagination beyond its disciplinary trappings is to analyze it as a literary work. White's investigation reserves judgment on the comparative objectivity, correctness, and accuracy of any account discussed within his work. His interest is restricted to, quote, structural components. As is repeatedly, if not incessantly, stated throughout the book, the epistemological content of a historical work is a reflection of the literary modes in which it is cast, which are themselves a reflection of the historian's aesthetic and moral values. While many conventional historians will recoil at the notion of an enthusiastically imaginative history that unconditionally embraces its literary character, such an idea is at the crux of Hayden White's scholarly work. And he states, if history is once again to have wide cultural significance, it can no longer deny the literary imagination as its own greatest source of strength and renewal. And if historians are to be self-conscious about what they do, then you have the theories of representation provided by those working in rhetoric and linguistics. Whether one history is better or than another cannot be established through an appeal to history. White rejects any sort of realist account of history through the historical work itself, which generates the objective standards by which it is judged. White contends, unlike myself, that an argument over which historical account of a given subject is more realistic than another can be effectively subcharacterized as a conflict of ideological commitments. I wish to draw particular attention to White's claim that there are no extra ideological grounds on which to arbitrate among the conflicting conceptions of the historical process and of historical knowledge appealed to by the different ideologies. This claim necessarily and unavoidably entails 
that White has adopted a neo-Hobbesian model of strategic deployment. I wish to make it clear that my own position breaks with that of metahistory. Deep structure in no way precludes normativity as a dimension of the overall task of a reflexive historian. Normativity does not inherently comp compromise epistemological value, and White's underlying assumption is a residual element of the positivism from which he wishes to rescue history. One of the most outspoken critics of Hayden White's work in historical theory has been the phenomenologist David Carr. Carr argues that the narrative structure is not imposed on a past that is truly formless. The notion that a rejection of the Rankian model of history, to tell it as it really was, <clears throat> does not, <clears throat> excuse me, does not entail that all historical works represent ideological impositions on a formless past. Furthermore, I joined David Cousins Hoy in arguing that, quote, the past must somehow anchor the present. White's anti-realism covers up the phenomenological features of the past, which my project understands as one of its chief concerns. What White either neglects or rejects as an issue is that if one can change the past simply by reinterpreting it, we are faced with its inability to serve as an anchor for interpretation of the present. Historical works make truth claims, and if those are to be taken seriously, they cannot merely be the result of a voluntaristic rewriting. Carr's time narrative in history neither intends to develop an overarching grand meta narrative, nor is its approach derived from achievements in the philosophy of science. To Carr, it seems obvious that we have a connection to the historical past as ordinary persons prior to and independently of adopting the historical cognitive interest, and this idea is at the crux of his claims within the book. Carr is neither addressing the author's creative act nor the historian's scientific procedure. The trajectory of his project lies much further back towards the narrative structure that pervades our very experience of time and social existence independent of our contemplating the past as historians. Thus, while both the narrativists and positivists come to the conclusion that the very form of historical discourse undermines its epistemic pretensions, Carr is going to argue precisely the opposite. Both positivists and narrativists have fallen into the trap of explaining subjectivity purely in relation to a scientifically construed world, and thus there is a need for a return to the life world in which subjectivity has its home prior to science. I must emphasize that this account cannot be accurately characterized as constructing some sort of stand-in for the much lampooned grand meta-narrative, but instead pre uh, <clears throat> presents an ontological characterization of human beings as self-temporalizing creatures and posits the narrative structure as simply that, a structure. We need not presuppose that any particular events will take place, nor has described a determined normative or political direction to the historical process. What we will do is defend the narrative structure as it plays into the life of the individual, and then extend this characterization of narrative structure to the experiences and actions of groups. Historiography, the actual scholarly writing of the discipline, does not bring about and secure its object in such scholarship. It addresses and is answerable to something that predates such high-level scholarly activities everyday pre-theoretical practical involvement in the world is itself temporal and this lived temporality predates originates and sustains the high level academic discipline the historian's subject is individual or collective actions experiences events and identities white argues that the imposition of a narrative form is done from without by some authoritative voice in the interest of manipulation of power while other theorists characterize narrative structure as imposing a super added order upon experience, actions, and events, Carr situates it at the core of human temporal experience. He thus rejects the characterization of narrative as an imposition of what is just merely sequence. I now consider the significance of the specifically historical past in the life of the individual. Thus, we move from Husserl to Heidegger and it's in the discussion of historicity a move that involves shifting the topic of discussion from isolated individual experiences to the interaction of multiple individuals who all have these experiences. This interaction involves staggered and overlapping narratives. My social existence not only puts me in contact with the coexisting multiplicity of contemporaries, it connects me with a peculiar form of temporal continuity. It is here that we find the pre-thematic role for the social past. When I set out to compose a work on a given subject, I must first engage in a backward reference to my predecessors. Just that I am in the midst of a retentive, retentive process when I toss a ball to a friend or something of that sort. So I engage in a process of explanation and justification of the work to be done when I create an essay of philosophical or historical sort. This is not just for my audience, of course, but for myself. It helps me to understand what I'm actually doing or what I will do, or at the very least, what I believe I am about to do. 
my life, my work, any activity of mine exists within a larger temporal context, which is itself narrative and character, and which involves other people in a predecessor successor relation. I am engaging in a sort of conversation which has a beginning, a middle where I reside, and an end to which I presume I make a contribution. Thus, we have found a place where I exist in a group context, and we've discovered the way in which I interact with staggered overlapping narratives. Yet what Carr has developed in time narrative and history by the works of Husserl and Heidegger is constrained to the individual. Even as historicity is still concerned with the individual, not the social dimensions of history. Yet even the strictest biographical history is going to situate its subject within their social context. <clears throat> uh, such a support of the crux of, of Carr's work over a lifetime and even shows up in his introduction to Husserl's crisis back in the 1970s, which I recently read. <clears throat> At the end of his fourth chapter, Carr still needs to provide an analysis of the group from the point of view of membership and participation in it, but does not give up the first person perspective. Carr believes that this can be done when I speak on behalf of a we, and, each, and in each case it is I who say we. The subject has changed without my removal. But now we must question whether or not Carr is able to analyze this subject within a phenomenological framework. <clears throat> in a brief overview of the subject in modern philosophy, Carr concurs that society stands between the individual and the supposed universality of thought or reason, but not as a hindrance or barrier which we need to cast aside. Much to the contrary, society is the intermediary which enables the universal to appear. Yet even this is not still not adequate, as any sort of transcendental subject is still singular, still an I. Carr finds that Husserl and Heidegger a possible solution, a means by which one might emerge from the phenomenological accounts of intersubjectivity with an account of the first person plural firmly in one's grasp. Although the discussions within a first person singular framework, when Heidegger and Husserl address historicity, there's a presupposition of intersubjectivity. Additionally, when either philosopher addresses my interaction with other groups or uh, individuals or a group, they find that these are often collective or collaborative endeavors that cannot be reduced to the isolated working of individuals. For example, playing music together is a common project of collective action. Intersubjectivity requires multiple subjects, not merely extensions of the functioning of my central nervous, system, central nervous system and my ability to use technology as a means of overcoming the limitations imposed upon me by time and space. The preceding analysis of a common project correlates to the experience of identifying with a group, a we, and an individual experience as part of this we can both predate and survive the individual herself. Carr differentiates the temporal existence of a group, cultural, citizenry, nation, or ethnicity from the notion of historicity previously discussed. As Carr has done previously, we will again explain the way in which the analysis of the passive also applies to the active. Membership in a group is generally participatory and involves engagement in a common action. But at the same time, such a group can exist without collective action resulting, such as in the case of, of an oppressed group. Going to mind a Marxist example, the proletariat can be divided by ideology and religious affiliations that distract them from their actual and common plight. Groups are not necessarily successful in their collective endeavors. It is at this point to become yet again to Hegel's adage, the I that is we, the we that is I. Carr describes this group more elaborately as one that is constituted by individuals who are aware of and assertive of their independence, I, but who voluntarily and freely associate, we. If we now make the shift to the group, quote, we can say that the events of common experience and actions are undertaken in common are constituted when we gather together sequences of events or subactions by projecting onto them a structure comprising beginning, middle, and end. The group itself is as we subject, is constituted as the unity of a temporally extended multiplicity of experiences and actions. In all these cases, though we always stand at some particular point in a temporally unfolding event structure, we retain whatever has gone before and project what is not yet to, what is yet to come. In a kind of collective reflection, we act or experience in virtue of a story we tell ourselves about what we are going to going through or doing. It can be seen that the role of agents, we act, narrator, we tell, and audience to ourselves turn up again and again, this time in a plural form. After having described the temporal structure of actions experience, the way in which these extended to our narrative structure of individual life, and the recent discussion of intersubjectivity, he begins the eponymous chapter of his book, Time Narrative and History. A crucial aspect of the group self-maintenance is its history. This historical horizon provides the basis on which the group can discuss what it is and what it is doing, which is told, acted out, and received and accepted in a kind of self-reflective social narration. Yet even at this juncture, we are still important, presented with some important problems and theoretical hurdles that must be overcome if Carr's entire project can be considered valid. 
at all. <clears throat> Hegel's notion of community is meant to be applied to the peoples and nation states of European history. And of course, we should not forget that Hegel utilized his own arguments to justify the colonization of Africa by characterizing its inhabitants as a people without a history at the 1884 to 1885 Conference of Berlin. We must not only ask if Hegel's notion of community applies to European peoples and nation states, but if it only applies to them. Are Hegel's conceptual insights applicable outside of the framework of a closed conception of world history, which, is not, which has been superseded by events? Carr also asks if it is possible that our notion of community is not only overly schematic and abstract, but also somewhat idealized as well. And what of the fact of that, uh, <clears throat> that a community is often characterized not by a single story of its origins, unity, and tasks, on which all agree, but by rival and conflicting stories? And what of those groups which we simply grow into or find ourselves belonging to without having made any explicit choice? If one cannot answer these questions adequately, then Hegel's I that is we, we that is I is simply not going to work for us, or of course, Carr. <clears throat> should be noted that Carr is offering a purely ontological account of the temporal features of individuals and social groups. His account does not concern the contents of a historical work or how he might go about criticizing the existing historiography. Only the narrative structure itself is defended, but what the historian actually produces when she employs the use of narrative in her work is left unaddressed. First, Carr must admit we have pluralistic identities which often conflict with each other. Secondly, he must not forget that much of the communal rhetoric which addresses a group is putative or persuasive rather than expressive of genuine unity and an already accepted sense of communal activity. Thirdly, Carr recognizes the frequent lack of general agreement about the past and the conflict that often arises in regards to specific events. <clears throat> Oftentimes, an individual group does not always acknowledge its position of, uh, um, as a, a member of the uh, an official group. However, this should not lead one to conclude that groups themselves are a fiction, but that they are not internally homogenous. Carr concedes that the identity and the existence of groups are no less and no more stable than those of individuals. <clears throat> there is something with the constitution of a community that cannot be explained by fission or fusion models. A community is not just a haphazard collection of individuals or an undifferentiated mob of more or less identical beings. We don't need a cohesive unitary bulk as our subject in order to write history, however. As there's incoherence, disillusionment, repression, and confusion in my own life, as there is in the existence of a community. Thus, Carr is going to define and characterize communities as existing wherever a narrative account exists of a we, which is a continuous experience through ex uh, experiences and activities. <clears throat> so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit and try to get to the conclusion. Up here. The historian navigates numerous and oftentimes conflicting concerns, obligations, intentions, failures, accomplishments, and desires, but a subject consists of human beings and human events, and these, as we have seen, are narrative. This is the connection between historical existence and historical narration, but it's all that has been discussed universal. Carr will make yet another, albeit conditioned, concession that the we he is a privacy established and discussed is not one that can necessarily be applied to all people in all places. However, even within cultures wherein time and change are devalued, if not denied, Carr claims that change must be experienced and appreciated in the first place, even when it is rejected. Thus, it could be maintained that linear and narrative organization is characteristic of ordinary experience, but that this organization does not get projected onto the larger scale time of long-term long social events. All people could be what we would call historical beings, but they may not have a disciplined conception of history. Carr is in a difficult but not impossible situation here because the past philosophical work he draws upon is certainly not culturally relativist. Carr could not definitely, definitively make the case that the structure he has observed in the Western world is universal, but he can characterize it as our method in the struggle against temporal chaos, the fear of sequential diversion and dissolution, the need to kill off father time or at least stave off or postpone his attempts to devour us all. This is Carr's only attempt at a comment on the universal human condition. If Carr has not been able to definitively nail down the native structure as biological, cognitive, or cultural, or some mixture of both, it is not as if anyone else has had much luck either. Attempting to develop a method by one which might be able to describe and understand one's own culture without using the tools provided by one's own temporal cultural sensation is simply not the task at hand in his text. Carr implemented the tools at his disposal <clears throat> to describe our way of experiencing, acting, and living both as individuals and communities. Of course, while Kyle's account is quite good and, and does much to refute White's claims, he does not uh, provide answers 
he only provides <clears throat> answers to ontological concerns, but he does not say anything about who creates a good representation of a group. Carr is provided with an excellent defense of the narrative structure in historical works, and he is appropriately restricted and conditioned his claims when necessary. Yet we have done little to address the principal claim of white and other similarly minded historians and philosophers. It is possible to view historical consciousness as specifically Western prejudice by which the presumed superiority of modern industrial society can be retroactively substantiated. What are the attributes of a historical method methodology that is not manipulative in the interest of power? This history inevitably serves to erase and silence voices. Does it always carry with it this telltale scent of antiquarianism and nostalgia? What are we to do with the ranking conception of history, which tells the past as it supposedly really was? The narrative structure is not imposed, but what about ideological prejudices or positions? What of objectivity? We have done much to resolve the tension between epistemological pretensions and aesthetic structures, provided maybe perhaps a framework by which we could have um, an aesthetic truth value. But we have said little about the ethical or political implications of actual written histories. Uh, Carr's account does not tell us what we can about enough about what we can do with history or why we should even bother to write it. It doesn't tell us what it gives us as a discipline that this is not given by other discipline modes of historical inquiry, <clears throat> scholarly inquiry. We have our ontological materials ready, but we are left with many methodological questions unanswered. This phenomenological account of historical works bare structure, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> since we will not find uh, the answers to these methodological questions within David Carr's work, we'll have to look elsewhere. Thank you. Okay, James, thank you for the beautiful presentation. Uh, so now, uh, actually, do we have time for discussion? Uh, we are over time, but uh, let's let's keep it very brief. Maybe one or two questions. There are exactly two questions on and the we'll slide. We'll try to make up for it as we go. Okay, so. Uh, I will use the questions from Slido suggested by people watching. So the first question uh, is that uh, it's anonymous and uh, it's, I wanted to ask some more words on the differences between Pat Patochka and Ricoeur, especially concerning their concept of hope. So that's oriented on you, Dr. Vendra. Uh, both Ricoeur and Patochka focuses on the conception concepts of hope and horizon, but uh, there are very big differences between them. For, for example, Ricoeur, he goes towards um, consideration of theology, which is, in my opinion, problematic, uh, whereas Patochka, uh, Patochka's perspective is more of, of an horizon of expectation without uh, uh, any theological reference if I can resume a very complicated discussion <laughs> with few words. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and the other question is for Dr. Shaida. Uh, and the question is, what do you think is the most effective way to prevent enmity, enmity from occurring in today's world? Um. That's a question that goes actually far beyond what uh, I was speaking about because uh, preventing enmities, uh, it's very difficult. I was sort of narrowing the, uh, the scope by focusing on limiting enmity. So uh, as I believe you are not completely able to prevent it, of course you should try, but uh, uh, I was more focusing and that, that, that would be, I think the contribution of um, the thoughts I was trying to gather uh, is how to proceed when a conflict is already there um, and it can really sort of um, devolve into um, an unlimited, absolute, completely unregulated conflict, which is, uh, which is terrible. Or there is another way of looking for ways of actually protecting the enemy and causing as little harm as possible. But of course, it's a legitimate question in the sense that uh, you should try to prevent conflict in the first place, for example, by means of um, 
of dialogue, understanding, reconciliation, learning from the past, which was what my colleagues were talking talking about quite a bit, understanding um, how to interpret history in a constructive sense that helps us prevent conflicts. So I, I think I would say this. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, and these were the only two questions. And while we are running out of time, uh, should maybe we can leave a floor for uh, if somebody on Zoom has uh, some some question, they can raise their hand. I'm I'm just wondering whether um, whether the ed education towards humanity would uh, not correspond with the the Yankelevich's logic of uh, overabundant love. Would would um, would that be going in the same direction? Yeah, I guess it's questions for both of us. Uh, yeah. um, just briefly, I would say that um, uh, Schmidt has this uh, idea that love doesn't really have much uh, place in politics because it's more uh, an ethical um, principle for interhuman um, sort of smaller scale uh, relations. But I think that this focus on humanity, it is actually an expression of this uh, love of the neighbor or love of, uh, of the other. And in this sense, uh, it, it could be re reinterpreted as actually some sort of, um, um, yes, universal love, universal um, respect for humanity and for the concrete uh, humans that you encounter in conflicts. From my side, um, thank you for your question, Dagmar. I think the problem is about the not available nature of love, according to Yankelevich. That is something that cannot be uh, used for anything, that cannot be demanded and cannot be goal-oriented because it has this character of uh, um, initiality. It cannot be uh, used to any goal, even the most... Uh, noble one, it will be already a kind of instrumentalization and it will last this kind of absolute character. It can but, be a policy. Yes, yes. It is a, a bit the same problem that we see when we speak about uh, the use of forgiveness in political uh, realm. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so, and by this, I would probably conclude this panel. Uh, so, thank thank you all four of you uh, who submitted your work. It was really interesting uh, hearing all of your ideas. Uh, and thank you for the beautiful presentations. Uh, and now, uh, as for the program, we will have a five-minute break uh, in between this panel and the next panel, which will be uh, art and literature, which will be then starting in five on 515. So thank you everybody who was watching on YouTube uh, and, and everybody who was here on Zoom and see you in five minutes.
Okay, I assume we can start. Uh, my name is Anna Vasilenka, and I'm happy to moderate art and literature panel. Uh, we will have three speakers today, and uh, this panel we will have three uh, lectures in a row, and we will move the Q and A block uh, to the end. Um, I'm happy to introduce the first speaker, who is Haluk Isan Talai, uh, who has completed his bachelor thesis in English and language and literature, and now studying his master's degree in Uditepe University. He is mainly focusing on Orientalism, intercultural studies, and imagology. In his um, speech, he will talk about he will talk about the evolution of Turks through the history and try to examine their image by comparing and contrasting the different perspectives while trying to analyze and frontier condition represented by the characters of the works. I want to remind you that you all have 15 minutes for your speech and I will remind you via personal chat of how much time left. And now I want to yell the floor to Haluk. Thank you, Anna. Uh, let me share my screen. I'm hoping that's all right. Um, today I will be talking about my paper uh, titled The Image of the Turk and Oriental Discourse in Panetti Stratis Kira Kiralina and Ivo Anders The Bridge on the Arena. The literary works, I, I've chosen these literary works to study because they are both very good at representing and reflecting the condition of this condition of Eastern Europe while providing the reader with a, a profound understanding of the image of the Turk in Eastern Europe. I would like to talk about Kira Kiralina a little bit. Uh, it's, it was written by Panetti Strati, who was a Romanian author and published in 19. 23. Uh, it deals with the travels of Stavro, protagonist of the work, in his quest for finding his sister, Kira, who is abducted by a Turkish slave trader, Nazim Efendi, whom I will be talking more about uh, later. Stavro's mother, who is of Romanian Turkish origin, uh, is abused by her husband, and then she commits suicide because of the deformities she has acquired from her husband's abuse. Uh, this is an important um, matter for us because. Uh, we are, uh, as we try to analyze the condition, complex condition of the Balkans, it will help us along the way. The second work which I'll be talking about is the bridge on the Darina. Uh, most of you, I, I believe, uh, already know it. Uh, it was written by Ivo Andrich, a Yugoslavian Bosnian author, and published in 1945 with the title of Nadri I'm hoping that I pronounced it right. Uh, it deals with the history of the village of Visegrad, which has a mixed population consisting of Christians, newly convert, Muslims, and Jews. Uh, it examines the conditions and perspective, perspective of the townsfolk under rapid national and political changes. Uh, it also narrates the story of the Balkan populations through the protagonist of the work, well, in fact, it's the bridge. The main theoretical framework which I'll be using in my uh, which I've used in my paper uh, are frontier means of orientalism, uh, in ecology, history, and method. These are the main two ones. And I will also uh, have the help of uh, Salatov's work, McMillan's, and Garfrick's. Well, if you were to talk about in ecology, history, and method, it was written by George Learson in 2007. It emphasizes the importance of national and cultural images regarding one's own sense of identity. It argues that the images are subject to change depending on the historical period and political changes. It underlines how images help create a sense of otherness. Directly quoting from Nielsen, to identify oneself, for example, by showing one, one's ID, is to prove that one is who one claims to be, to the exclusion of everyone else. To identify a single ant with an anthill means to single it out, see it separate from the amorphous group as a whole. To identify a desk as the one at which Walter Scott wrote Beverly means to set it apart as such from all other desks, to give it a unique specificity within its G. 
generic class. With that being said, uh, frontier means of Orientalism uh, is a theory that uh, which argues that the Orientalist condition is quite different on the frontier between the East and the West. Uh, it was written by Austrian anthropologist Andrew Gingrich. Uh, it argues that the general notion of Orientalism is quite di different and diverse on the frontier between the East and the West. It also differentiates between the uh, good Oriental and the bad Oriental while emphasizing that the Orientalist discourse on the frontier is mainly created by metaphors and myths of folk and public culture. It also underlines the importance of the metaphor of the Turk, which I'll be addressing as the image of the Turk in Central European Orientalist perspective. Like quoting from Gingrich, uh, in this metaphoric language, defining ourselves against vital threats from the bad Muslim rival is a necessary task for gaining strength and prosperity. Whereas under different circumstances, the good Muslim Oriental, if subjected to a colonial control, for example, such as Bosnia's the uh, Austrian Empire, may be a courageous ally and a loyal subject when other enemies endanger the frontier. Overcoming the bad Muslim is a precondition to the glorious achievement, not only of modernity, but of identity. By relying on a controlled good Muslim in the struggle against other, other threats is necessary to maintain it. This is the meta-narrative of frontier orientalism. Uh, the main objectives of my work uh, is to analyze the frontier uh, orientalist condition on the frontier in regards to both works, uh, to emphasize on the image of the Turk, which is uh, used to create uh, at least a part of this orientalist discourse in both works, to conceptualize the themes in the novels in relation to the nation building process, to underline the differences between the national images used in both works, and to understand the social, historical, and political backgrounds of the image of the Turk and Orientalism in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, with that being said, uh, I will I want to first start with the Orientalist discourse. Both in Fiera Kiralina and the Belgian Derina, characters appear to be common products of uh, Central and Eastern Europe. In Kira Kiralina, Star Wars quest for his sister is also a quest to find his identity, which, with the abduction of his sister by a Turkish slave trader, is stolen from him by the other of the Euro. Additionally, in Kira Kiralina, the concept of otherness is not definite. As Star Wars himself has a quite diverse ethnic background, the novel questions the image of the Turk as Europe's primary other with its characters with seemingly good intentions. For example, Mustafa Bey. Who, uh, with whom I will be talking more in a second. Quoting directly from Star Wars, the protagonist of the work, he says that there are three different races grafted into my mother's Romanian branch of ancestry, in accordance with the invading forces of the past who ruled over, over my homeland, Turkish, Romanian, and Russian races. While talking about Mustafa Bey, uh, he is a character who uh, shelters and protects Star Wars while he was trying to find his sister in Istanbul. Even though he's despotic, is described as a despotic person, Mustafa Bey offers shelter to Stavro when he was a young boy, takes time to train him, protects him, and helps him develop himself. However, this creates, a ne this creates negative effects in Stavro as Mustafa Bey, uh, as we said before, he was a despotic character, forces him to stay indoors all the time. Stavro explains his condition under the rule of the Oriental, the Mustafa Bey, uh, who represents the uh, image of Oriental. I was going insane outside moonlight, tranquil nature, freedom. In here, imprisonment, debauchery, oppression. As the Bey returns home, I could almost see that voluptuous carousing nights were starting. It felt like I was drowning in a swamp. My room appeared to me as a cage where evil spirits were running wild. On the other hand, uh, in the Bridge on the Rina, the audience is presented with a more definite concept of Oriental, as it can be understood from the impalement of Radisov, a Serbian rebel who tries to undermine the construction of the bridge, which of course was conducted by Turks uh, and ordered by Sokolo Mehmet Pasha, who was uh, actually a Serbian uh, origin. Uh, it can be argued that the Balkan Oriental, the bad Oriental, unlike the colonial other, forces its rule upon the people of Balkans. Radisov, before being impaled and placed in a higher position, which of course reminds us the crucifixion, 
defies the rule of the Bedouin, namely the Turk, and is therefore punished and sacrificed for his people. This Orientalist condition, of course, creates tension in the village, in addition to the ensuing political and social changes, which can be analyzed as a general condition of Balkans in the early 20th century and reflects the condition of the, each group's specific other. Uh, uh, while describing the village of Visegrad, Andrew says, in short, Muslims were afraid of Austrians, Serbians were afraid of Muslims and Austrians. Jews, however, was afraid of everything and everyone, because especially in times of war, everyone was stronger than them. Gingrich quoting on the uh, Bosnians who were living under the Austrian Empire, uh, which can be uh, exemplified by saying that the Muslim population of Visegrad is also included in this regard. They are the descendants of those Bosnian Muslims who then fought bravely for the Imperial Austro-Hungarian army against the Serbs and Italians on Austria's southeastern battle lines until the last days of the First World War. These are those good Muslims who have a permanent place in the Austrian imaginary. Uh, I will move on to the image of the Turk in the work which has been used to create the Orientalist discourse. The Turk, having emerged with the historical image of the Muslim and the East as an ethnic states, was the primary other of Europe and also served the purpose of being one of the elements which allowed Europe to create a unified Christian identity. The image of the Turk on the frontier had different qualities than its Western counterpart owing to the fact that this foreign enemy was much closer to Central Europe and Balkans and had ruled certain countries in the region. Uh, the image of the classical and the brutal Turk is also depicted in the bridge on, bridge on the Derena. Anders describes a scene in which Turkish officers are torturing a villager in order to learn more about the salutary of the construction of the bridge. Anders describing this torture scene the two men brought the chains and wrapped them around the peasant's broad hairy chest. The scorched air began to sizzle. His mouth contracted, the veins in his neck swelled, his ribs seemed to stand out, and his stomach muscles to contract and relax as when a van vomits. He groaned from the pain, strained at the ropes which bound him, and breathed and twisted in vain to lessen the contact of his body with the red hot iron. His eyes closed and the tears flowed down his cheeks. They took the chain away. That was only a beginning. Isn't it better to talk without that? The image of the Turk uh, in Istratis' work, however, is, a complex and has a, is complex and has a broader range of features. Some of the first Turks the audience is introduced to in the work are uncles of Stavro, our protagonist, who appear to be shady but courageous men. Stavro's mother asked her brothers to kill her husband because of the abuse she has received from him. Her brothers embraced the children of their sister and promised revenge, but Stavro's father managed to escape the Turks. One of the main differences between the representation of Stavro's uncles and the historical image of the Turk is that these men are a part of Stavro's family. The Turk, in this sense, is represented as a protective and vengeful force against the oppressors of the family. Their failure, however, questions the idea of the classical undefeated idea of the undefeated Turk, an image which, as Macmillan argues, starts to lose its significance with the failures of the military campaigns of the Ottoman Empire, starting from the siege of Vienna in 1683. Another representation of Turk in the work is Nazim Efendi, the slave trader who abducts the sister of abducts the sister of Stavro, Kira. Nazim Efendi is in correlation with the classical image of the Turk in Balkans and approaches Stavro and Kira as a friendly and helpful person. However, he deceives them, abducts Kira and takes her to Istanbul to be sold as a slave. The Turk in regards to the abduction of Kira is a deceitful and unjust man who by kidnapping Kira also robs Stavro of his sense of identity. In other words, alongside the kidnapping the beautiful woman, he also robs the nation from his identity. In the, bridge, in the bridge on the Derina, Abida, the person who is in charge of the whole construction of the bridge, is also described as an unjust and brutal man who makes the funds for work, work for construction without paying them. Pulevian, another character in the 
Yeah. Understandably, is afraid of his corrupt and unjust superior, Abita, thus treats the townsfolk in an unjust and despotic manner. This pattern in which a superior officer abuses his subordinates is a common theme used to describe the despotism of the term. Townsfolk is afraid of Kuevia. He is afraid of Abita. Abita is afraid of Sokolu Mehmet Pasha, and the Pasha is afraid of the Turkish Sultan. This cycle of fear is also mentioned in the work of Macmillan, who quotes that the image of the Turk is described as a passive, timid, and servile, as a passive, timid, and servile towards their superior, but ferocious and despotic towards their subordinates. As a conclusion, I would like to state that the Turk in Andrew's work tends to be much closer to the historical image of the Turk, whereas Israeli's Turk does not have a definite black and white structure. In other words, the description of the Turk in Kirakirovina appears to be the realistic one when compared to the Turk in the region of the arena. The effects of the even image of the Turk in the identification and nation building processes of the Balkan nations are apparent in both works and also serves as a corner store for their efforts for the efforts of such regions. Stavros quest for resolving his identity crisis correlates with the struggle of the village of Visegrad, while the village appears as a microcosm representing the entirety of the Ottoman Empire, Stavro represents the ordinary Ottoman Balkan person, questioning the historical image of the Turk, the concept of identity and nation, as well as making the audience wonder about the realities and the nature of cultural and national images. Uh, that will be all for my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Haluk. Uh, I'm sure there are many questions, but we will answer um, them in the very end. And now I want to welcome Professor Sean Homer on a stage, who is a uh, professor of film and literature at the American University in Bulgaria. He is also the author of Frederick Jameson, Marxism, Harmoniotics, Postmodernism, Jack Lacan, and Savoy Zizek, Zizek and Radical Politics. He is also co-editor of Frederick Jameson, a critical reader, and of objects, material, physics, aesthetic, especially grammar, journal of theory and criticism. He has recently completed a book on history, narrative, and cultural trauma in Balkan cinema. And today, Professor Sean Homer um, will uh, explain that history and trauma are governed by very different uh, logics, uh, narrative logic and repetition. He will also argue that trauma is not found in specific films, but rather the way how the films are produced and made. Welcome on the stage. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. I'll just share my screen with you. Okay. As you've just heard in the introduction, for the last few years, I've been working with the concept of cultural trauma in Balkan cinema. And in particular, I've been looking at the struggle over competing narratives of the past in some recent Balkan films and specific directors. Now, where I differ from the cultural sociologist, uh, Jeffrey Alexander and his colleagues, is that I remain psychoanalytic in my understanding of trauma. At the same time, though, I've become increasingly uncomfortable with the inflation of the concept of trauma and the tendency in trauma theory to conflate history with trauma, as we can see here in the work of Kathy Carruth, or in the case of Shoshana Feldman, to see history as Holocaust. I rather agree with Dominic Le Capra that we need to keep a distinction between what Le Capra calls structural trauma, the trauma as we understand it in psychoanalysis, and historical trauma. And so that is the basis for today's talk and for these reflections on history, narrative, and trauma. And I will try and come back. I'm not going to talk about any specific Balkan films today, but I will come 
back and try in my conclusion to say something about how the implications of what I'm uh, talking about today impacts upon how we analyze films. So in the political unconscious narrative as a socially symbolic act, Frederick Jameson proposed that history with a capital H is fundamentally non-narrative and non-representable. History for Jameson is what hurts. It is what refuses desire and sets inexorable limits to individual as well as collective practice. History is not so much a process we can apprehend as a structural limit upon consciousness and agency, a limit we constantly come up against whether we intend it or not. In Althusser's rather older structuralist formulation, history is an absent cause, something that we can only know through its effects. For Jameson though, historical periodization is inevitable. And this inevitability always projects some form of narrative, even if history with the capital H is non-narrative. Now narrative's particular value as Paul Ricoeur has shown lies in its intelligibility, in its ability to organize the bewildering mass of historical data into a form that is readily understandable. For Ricoeur, history takes narrative form. Indeed, if history were to shed its narrative links, it would cease to be historical. Ultimately then for Jameson, History is the Lacanian real, and I will come back to that in a, in a moment in relation to trauma. Now, in his work on terror and trauma in German cinema, Thomas Elsesser argues that the historical basis for a cultural understanding of trauma, as opposed to a clinical theory of trauma, is the shock and disruptive experience of modernity, an experience powerfully registered in the work of Freud and Walter Benjamin. Now, very briefly, Benjamin conceptualizes modernity as a mutation of historical experience that achieves its meaning through its di dialectical relation to tradition. The problem with tradition is precisely that it prioritizes the past over both the present and the future. Furthermore, it is transmitted through the cultural history of narrative forms and memorative communication. Whereas for Ricoeur, narrative is the fundamental structure of historical consciousness, for Benjamin, there are only historically specific forms of narrative. And within narrative, sorry, within modernity, narrative is fundamentally in crisis insofar, it can no, insofar as it can no longer communicate historical experience. It is in this sense that Benjamin will argue in terms that will, will later be echoed in Elsesser's Poetics of Parapraxis that Kafka's very success lay in his failure. Kafka's great achievement was precisely the recognition that traditional narrative forms could no longer represent the experience of modernity. We must be clear here though, modernity is not the death of narrative per se, but it is the death of traditional forms of narrative. All right, and I will come back to this in a moment in uh, narrative and trauma in one moment. Let me now turn to Freud. As I said a moment ago, I approached the issue of trauma from a psychoanalytic, a specifically Freudian and Lacanian perspective, rather than a sociological or, a, or an, an historiographic perspective. Now, as with many of Freud's concepts, the notion of trauma underwent a series of revisions throughout his career. And we can identify two broad theories of trauma in his work. Initially, 
Freud saw trauma as a breach or a wound in the mind as a consequence of an overwhelming excess of external stimuli, what is referred to as the unbearable situation theory. Later, as Freud came to distinguish between actual neuroses caused by a physical event and psychoneuroses arising from infantile sexual fantasies, Trauma was related to the notion of the primal fantasy, or what is sometimes called the unacceptable impulses model of trauma. Now I'll briefly say something about both of these theories of trauma to highlight their significance for film and cultural trauma, specifically in relation to the question of temporality. In his early studies on hysteria, Freud conceived of hysteria as having a definite cause, course of development, outcome, and cure, what is more commonly known as the seduction theory. An actual molestation or seduction by the father, sibling, or household servant was presumed to have taken place, and the memory as well as the affect attached to this traumatic event was repressed. After a period of latency, usually lasting until puberty, something would trigger the memory and affect associated with this traumatic event, which would then manifest itself as an organic symptom, such as paralysis of the limbs, loss of eyesight or inhibitions. These symptoms could be alleviated, Freud believed at the time, by bringing back to consciousness the memory of the repressed event and verbalizing that memory in as much detail as possible. Um, this idea will later be developed by Pierre Janet in the distinction between traumatic memory and narrative memory. And this is something which has had quite a lot of mileage in recent trauma theory, and I'll come back to this later. As Neil Smelser points out, even in this initial skeletal account, we can see reference to an event, memory, affect, and a cognitive process, the putting of the affect into words. Trauma, in short, is a process. It is not the event itself that is traumatic, but the event in a specific context. Or, as, long as, as Jean Leplanche will put it, trauma always involves at least two traumas, the original traumatogenic event and the subsequent event which will trigger the first. Now, Freud would develop this notion in his later work. When he returned to the notion of trauma in Beyond the Pleasure Principle and Moses and Monotheism, he retained the notion that trauma is a breach, uh, a breach in the mind's experience of time, but he radically revised his first conception, especially in relation to the temporality of trauma. Freud's theory of trauma in Beyond the Pleasure Principle suggests that we do not experience a traumatic event the first time around, but only later through its repetition. It should suggest, therefore, a certain belatedness. All right. Now, this is the concept of natraklikite, if I pronounce it correctly, or deferred action as it is translated into English. And this foregrounds the subject's revision of past life experiences. And it is this revision that invests the event with significance and psychic efficacy in their subsequent neurosis. Okay, and the important thing here is precisely that it is not, it is not the event itself, which is the trauma, but the new event which invests it with this psychic efficacy. Now, just to talk about one more paper by Freud. 
In his paper, Remembering, Repeating and Working Through, Freud recapitulates the various phases in the development of psychoanalysis, and each phase has direct implications for his theory of the traumatic event. When we reach the development of psychoanalysis proper, Freud comments, the analyst gives up the attempt to bring a particular moment or problem into focus. He contents himself with studying whatever is present for the time being on the surface of the patient's mind, and he employs the art of interpretation mainly for the purpose of recognizing the resistances which appear there and making them conscious to the patient. It is conceivable, continues Freud, that in certain circumstances, that a special case of events are remembered, which were never forgotten, because they were never understood the first time around, and therefore they were never conscious. Now, Freud has, his, uh, has in mind here his notion of primal fantasy as it was developed and outlined in the case study for the Wolfman. It's here then that Freud introduces an important distinction for trauma theory. The distinction between remembering and repeating. The analysand does not remember something that is forgotten or repressed, but acts it out through repetition. The analysand does not reproduce trauma as a memory, but as an action, an act of repetition. The analysand unconsciously repeats a trauma and only subsequently retrospectively interprets and gives meaning to that act of repetition. As Freud puts it, the compulsion to repeat replaces the impulsion to remember. And therefore we treat neurosis not as an event in the past, but as a force in the present. There is, in short, no traumatic memory. There is only narrative memory. Um, let me just say something very briefly. Sorry, about Lacan. Lacan was the first psychoanalysis, psychoanalyst, to recognize the importance of deferred action in Freud's conception of trauma, as well as contributing the notion of the real as the ultimate stumbling block block of representation to trauma theory. The temporality of trauma, as I mentioned above, is structured according to a logic of belatedness. Now, in the English st standard edition of Freud's work, Strachey translated the German term, as I said, as deferred action, which suggests a linear conception of time that does not fully do justice to, to Freud's concept, in the sense that when something is deferred, a causal relation between the event and its later re-emergence is imputed. Lacan's translation of Freud's term as après coup, on the other hand, involves the notion of retroactivity. That is to say, a significant event does not simply re-emerge in the present, but is re-signified in that afterwardsness and thus acquires a new psychic efficacy. The past, the trauma, only becomes what it always already was retrospectively, as it is re-signified in the afterwards, afterwardness of the present. The operation of afterwardsness or retroaction, as with trauma, involves two instances. Okay, I will, um, I'm going to, I'm wrapping up now. It involves two instances. Furthermore, there is always something that exceeds or escapes that resignification, the nucleus or the kernel of the trauma that cannot be represented, that is to say, the real. So what we have here then is reverse causality. What are the implications of this? Historical temporality is constructed in the present in dialogue with the past. Trauma, on the other hand, is governed by the temporality of repetition, 
the compulsion to repeat or Freud's death drive. If history in Jameson's sense is fundamentally a narrative form, we would have to say that trauma is non-narrative and ahistorical. It is governed by the logic of representation, the logic of repetition and not the logic of narrative and narrative causality. Now, one last thing in conclusion, what is the impact of this on film? There has been an awful lot of work in film studies recently on trauma and how trauma is represented. Usually this concerns uh, looking at flashbacks, non-linear narrative structures or the breakdown of narration. Now my problem with the use of something like a flat flashback is that it imputes a linear causality. There is an, a traumatic event which reemerges in the present. What I've come to realize over the past couple of years looking at Balkan cinema is that the key formal device for representing what is non-representable in film, trauma, is repetition. Repetition of shots, repetition of dialogue, Repetition of scenes which circle around an absent present event. Okay, so the event itself is never represented. I think probably I, my time is up, yeah? So, yes. Sorry. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay, um, thank you very much for your presentation. I think the topic of trauma and the means of how to conduct trauma and how to inter interpret it is a very big issue and there is a lot to talk. And right now I want to invite our third um, speaker who is Yaroslava Bedreva, correct me if I'm wrong, who is a senior researcher at the Institute of Philosophy of the Slovak Academy of Sciences and her research is focused on the phenomenological method, the manuscripts of the late uh, Husserl, the philosophical anthropology of Plessner, the problem of subjectivity, emotions, and intersubjectivity. Her latest book deals with the problems of philosophical anthropology, the research of expressivity. It is the sphere of the living body, emotion, gestures, cultural phenomena, creativity, works of art and play. And she teaches at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Ternava. And uh, today she will talk about the anti-biographical anti thinking, the islands of non-memory and their inspiration of poor philosophy welcome on stage. And a very important note, I want to encourage our viewers, both on YouTube, to use Slido for any upcoming questions and for our audience in Zoom to also write any questions in the chat, if you have any, or prepare them by the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dagmar and James, for inviting me uh, for this conference. Thank you, Anna Vasilenko, for introducing words. So I would like to present uh, you one example of Slovak thematization of the topic of memory in literature and its inspiration for philosophy. Alta Vashova is Slovak prose and script writer, as well as author of children literature. Her works are significant for the topic of today's conference because Vashova uh, dedicated the dominant part of her text to memory, forgetting and so-called non-memory. In accord with this topic, she developed interesting fragmentary autobiographical style of writing. This kind of writing can serve as a leading clue for the question of autobiographical thinking in philosophy too. And these two approaches so we can discuss, develop in dialogical intertwining. So some preliminary notes. 
from the beginning, we can observe that by the autobiographical issues in theoretical discourses exists some disproportion. How can we, in theoretical achievement of human or social sciences or of philosophy, approach to autobiography as personal subjective question and not neutralize it or objectivize it as subject matter from the third person perspective? Work of theoretician is connected with method which enables to find questions from, from distant look at reality, deal problems make from unproblematic stream of everyday life an issue, find phenomena which are not clear. The challenge here lie in approach which will not misinterpret, simplify or overlook phenomena in the specificity of their appearance. In our case, there are such phenomena in stake which derive from our familiar, personal, subjective sphere. In other words, uh, the form, style of approach should be appropriate to the possibilities of givenness and appearing of the phenomena. As phenomenology concretely, uh, for example, Merleau-Ponty pointed out, uh, in the starting point, we are already, already in a pre-objective world, in living situations, not in our theoretical schemas. Even Husserl's transcendental phenomenology does not completely lose its living connection to intersubjectivity and corporeal dimension. Um, so the movement of writing, which we read in Alta Vashova, and movement of thinking, which we can develop in phenomenological field, are quite close, converge. Uh, records of Vashova step out of facticity, open reflection, self-consideration. But this strange modification of attitude again refer, return us to living world in the aim of remembering, recording, preserving in the form of words. Uh, Vashova has a problem to remember. Her own personal memory is not reliable, does not function well. And so uh, she developed special thematization, special fragmentary style and expressivity. The situation of fragile memory causes elaboration of appropriate attentive style. As Zora Prushkova points out in Vashova, our relations between author, narrator and genre laid out according to our original rules. Oscillation of philosopher phenomenologist around the sense, iteration of the attempt to grasp and formulate it, as well as the respect before its reaching, come hand in hand with its method and its essential but flexible part, which situates phenomenologist again and again as beginner uh, to the starting point of philosophy. This means the need of reactualization, recontextualization of phenomenological method rather than its conservation. Similarly by Vashova, in her text records collage uh, and free compositions on the level of every single sentence pay laws of counter pressure counter completeness of the text in its totalitarian or ideological predeterminated impact on reader. So she's in counter pressure to this position. Uh, in possibilities of rapprochement of literary, artistic on the one hand and theoretical philosophical context on the other, uh, we can find possibilities of rapprochement of living phenomena in the uh, essentiality. Memory and non-memory. One of such phenomenon is uh, preserving of what we uh, what is experienced. Phenomenon which is weak, poor in its appearance, <clears throat> in opposition to saturated one. How do we remember? How do we forget? Uh, we can reflect these issues from the perspective of psychology, cognitive science, analysis of time consciousness, but also 
in an anthropological and poetical elaboration. And that uh, is uh, my starting point. For Vashova is writing a need to record because she cannot well remember. But she consider memory as essential and here helps her writing. Text becomes part of her personal memory as the tool of it functions writing hand. It is not an instrument uh, of fiction. Work of imagination helps to connect fragile lines to the past. Furthermore, importance of personal as well as cultural memory is reflected by uh, Aleda Asman in her book on spaces of remembering. Uh, in this connection, we can describe Vashova's approach as rather symptomatic than arbitrary or contingent. I quote Asman, images used by scientists, artists and philosophers for presentation of processes of remembering and forgetting are subordinated to the system of record and technology of preserving, which is characteristic for each epoch. Uh, to explain some example, from this spectrum of images also mean to describe interconnection between memory theory and history of media. Medium of the record uh, is here interrelated with implicit and explicit approach to our own situation of memory and non-memory on the one hand and with situation of author in culture society on the other. Tashova writes, about that, what I do with my head, about communication with time, books and people. Also with that where intuition leads me, about calm talks. Time accelerated from the outside, slow from the inside. Another example is her text devoted to Božena Nemcova, famous Czech uh, writer. She intertwines biographical and autobiographical issues, which dialogically cooperate, support each other in effective expression of the final text with Božena. In the introducing parts, she writes, I quote, I slide into your letters, to your dreams, and in the final passage returns to herself. It could not be otherwise, Božena. I wrote partly about myself too, and they suspected it. Vashova during communist often could not publish her text. Be able to remember as well as be able to forget is connected with relation of forms of remembering to identity. It is not only matter of diaries, technical records, letters, chronicles, rather these fragments serve as vibrations waves which bring back meetings, people, accidental events, persons. Records function when contain potential revival of memory, when contain lived meaning. <clears throat> this situation is more close to consonance or reson <clears throat> resonance in Ein Klang Sein, resonance of gesture, expression, resonance in experiencing uh, meeting with other people. Form, shape, gestalt of autobiographical writing is thus individual because it is expression of man recorded in time and because it is modulation of his world. For example, notes uh, in book Odleti Departures have exact dating, but uh, in the range of years. This is also individual approach to temporality, which is very significant. We do not remember day by day, but in larger scale from events to events. Uh, in book Uleti, uh, flyings away show events reversible, genealogical. Likewise in Asman, when we search for paradigm of media and forms of memory, they can be very diverse and reach different forms because are motivated by subjective, often subtle, fragile environments. Each media open every time specific approach to cultural memory. Fragmentarity, episodic style or economy of writing 
uh, as is pointed out by Peter Zayac, is connected to the conditions of writing or sense of writing because it is developed in our poetic situation. This sense derive from self-historization and were specific, for example, in Central and Eastern Europe, connected to unstable, subversive, performative, unofficial attempts. For example, institutions of memory as archives were moved to personal sphere, houses of artists. Appearing of phenomena paradoxically is connected to hiding, weakening, and occur in unaccepted forms. Uh, dissidents during communism used smaller formats because they were pursued by secret police and lived in permanent uncertainty if their house will not be searched and their manuscripts confiscated. They were also under a time pressure, not sure how much time they will have for finishing uh, the text. Records of opaque situations. Expression autobiographical is meant traditionally as genre, but it has a broader existential meaning of literature oriented to mo uh, moments of human life. In philosophy, the topic of autobiography is present explicitly or implicitly by philosophers oriented to philosophy of life, phenomenology, hermeneutics, uh, philosophical anthropology. In philosophy, which is oriented to historical and individual and social dimension of human um, uh, experience and life. Biography and autobiography is kind of record of the self as well as self-expression, realization of self uh, through narration. It, is, uh, it has special modus, which is connected with expression of human life, dense of meaning and various variable in, uh, in time. Not only various, but also connected with special forms of accessibility. Human is homo absconditus, opaque, and must stay as open question. Subjective timing, subjective uh, past and subjective present need individual approach, um, restoring forms of self-narration. Helmut Plessner, whose conception uh, represents this kind of consideration, describes human in, hi, in, its, uh, in his inaccessibility. The center of uh, his existence is characterized as non-place, non-where, utopian standpoint, which is uh, created through his activities, practices, expressions, and cult in cultural dim dimension. Analogically, by Vashova, there is the non-place of human existence connected to the non-memory, uncertainty, and fragility of time existence. Final remarks. Vashova's self-record creates poetics of memory as medium, which does not represent, which does not illustrate what has happened, but is based on active relations, which can be brought back uh, to life only through uh, present experience of reader and author. Memory does not function automatic, has to be again and again settled, based, mediated and adopted, uh, as wrote Asman. This approach uh, as example of creative practice enriches thinking in philosophy, which is also connected to autobiographical self-interpretational dimension, perspective of our existence. The emergence of phenomena in philosophical framework should be free from theoretical assumptions, as well as uh, we cannot prepare for a hand to our uh, occurrence in situation in the world uh, with schemas, rather world is the framework, playground, which structures ways of our perceiving, experiencing, remembering, even forgetting. In Alta Vashova, we can find these ways connected to the islands on, of non-memory as worlds uh, in which emerges existence of human in our own time fragility. Uh, thank you for your atten uh, attendance. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, now we can move to the question block. And 
we have a question uh, from Abdel Ghani El Husseini, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, who is saying, thank you for this fruitful information. A question for Professor Sean. Does the word repetition mean that it becomes an attitude of habitual behavior? That is why it is not considered as remembrance. And thank you again for showing these, those differences. Um, does repetition become a habit? No, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would say it, it becomes uh, a habit in that sense. Um, it is something, um, what I want to, uh, what, I, what I've been trying to th think through is the way that trauma is a very particular kind of event. Okay, so it is not an event, as we, as we saw with Freud, it, it's, it's not an event that necessarily has taken place, but is something that is retrospectively constituted. So when we think of something that is habitual, we repeat an action or something which we have already done over and over again. Um, Whereas when we're talking about trauma, we're talking about an act of repetition, which is constituting that event retroactively. So in that sense, I would say repetition is not habitual in, in the sense that we would convention, conventionally understand it. Does, does that answer the question? I think it answers. If a person wants to show up on the screen, you're very welcome. Okay, um, then I would like to ask the whole panel uh, the question. Uh, what helps to deal with trauma on national level? Is it the task of authorities or community or every person individually to deal with trauma? Because as you said, it's not just one particular event, but trauma is a process. Can Does someone else know? like to answer that? I mean, I've, I've ans answered one question. Uh, if any other person from the panel wants to answer? If not, Professor Sean, you're very welcome. Um, my interest in this and my interest in cultural trauma, as I said at the beginning of the um, presentation, came from looking at recent uh, Balkan films and looking at different competing narratives. Um, so I think one of the things I became uncomfortable with is the idea that we, we in, in kind of therapy speak, where we talk about healing and how do we heal and um, the possibilities of some kind of resolution of trauma or something like this. Trauma is something that we learn to live with, but it is not possible to heal it as a such. It is something that we can integrate into our experience, maybe through different narratives. So on, an, on, a, on a national level, uh, there has to be a space for those different competing narr narratives to exist. They will not be reconciled and they will remain conflictual and they will remain contradictory in some way, but they have to be acknowledged. So I was looking at films, for example, on the Greek Civil War and how the Greek Civil War constitutes a cultural trauma for the political left in Greece. Um, and the crucial thing around that was that for a long time, up until the mid-1980s, there was effectively a, a silence on the left-wing view, what happened to the left during the, the Greek Civil War. Uh, so it is not possible that those narratives of left and right can be reconciled in any way, um, but they can both be heard, they can both be given 
voice in some way. The trauma remains. It doesn't heal in that sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for an answer. So as I understand, there is no ending point of trauma in the society. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question from Martin Leiner. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I also have uh, a question on trauma. Um, I have, first of all, it's, it's the idea that uh, this repetition and this uh, thing that um, that there is uh, something which is going on with a person who uh, is suffering from a trauma um, could be a, an attempt of self-healing of creating a kind of reconciliation with oneself again but this attempt is often failing and uh, um, I would like to, to, to uh, know a bit, because you know very well the literature, Lacan, uh, Freud and, and uh, others on this topic, uh, whether you would see it also in this way that, that it's all a, a constant failing, failure of uh, reconciliation with oneself, only that people might overcome it somehow. But now I hear in your answer that you think it's not over. So. Can it maybe transform in something which is yeah, like a really, like a scar in mean, the face, yeah, which is not aching anymore, but making the face maybe more interesting of a person? <laughs> because a person without a, a trauma maybe is not a, also somebody who fully lived, or a nation who always was victorious and and uh, has no uh, traumas, maybe also a, a kind of uh, unhuman nature nation always uh, on the lucky side or, or such a thing. So I would like a bit to, to ask you on, on this uh, question. Um, I, I, I think I, I would agree on the notion of failure and I think this is where a writer like Kafka becomes interesting and Benjamin's reading of Kafka as his success being his ultimate failure and the staging uh, again and again within his writings of this failure to be able to communicate that experience. Um, I don't think we do get, I think we always, we attempt continuously to reconcile ourselves to that traumatic experience through repetition, but it is inevitably going to fail. Um, and in one sense, that is what we learn to live with, which is that constant failure of that process. But you keep, you keep attempting it over and over again. But in that sense, trauma is quite a unique experience. And this is why I went back to Freud's paper, Remembering, Repeating and Working Through, where he talks about these sort of certain kinds of events. And those certain kinds are, are, are of events are actually what he calls traumatic events. Um, so they're not necessarily very common. So part of my reflections today and in the, the, the book that I was writing was trying to think about this inflation of the concept of trauma. So any historical event can be trauma, any, any difficult event can be described as traumatic. Actually, I think trauma is something uh, quite specific and probably rather more unique than we've, we, we're now using it. We use it in a very loose term of historical trauma, cultural trauma, even small things can become personal traumas, whereas a, a trauma is, is something difficult to live with um, and not something that we can easily overcome. So part of my uh, reflect, reason for reflections was to get back to that notion that, you know, we, we are, we're perhaps overusing this term trauma and maybe we want to be careful when we talk about cultural traumas, historical traumas, national traumas, I mean, personal traumas, all of these things, because some very um, severe and horrendous personal experiences that people go through are not necessarily traumatic, okay? Unless there is something later that triggers the affect and triggers 
uh, that experience, it won't necessarily, you know, people can go through really very horrendous experiences and not be traumatized by them. So it's a very particular kind of event that becomes a traumatogenic event. Um, and I think that's what, I, what I've been trying to, to think a bit more about. And maybe um, we should just be more careful in how we use this term and not see everything as trauma. Does that answer your question? I can assume it answers the question and we have very, very little minutes left. And I want to ask the very last one about um, can trauma be radical uh, in a way that, for example, society experienced trauma, but the government or several authorities saying, no, you did not experience this. Uh, this is not what happened and you should think differently and they're basically manipulating your experience and your trauma and they're not letting you experience it. How it's, how it's, changed, how it's changed the society when they cannot openly experience the trauma? Uh, I haven't thought about trauma being radical. Um, my immediate response to that is I don't think so and I think that would be um, uh, slightly problematic because I'm fairly traditional and I think that r radicalism would involve some kind of political project and some kind of collective agency. Um, it, it, it is something that can certainly, when we're talking about cultural traumas and when we're talking about the struggle over narrative and the struggle over the meaning of the past, this is something that has a radical potential to it because um, uh, the necessity of, of asserting those national narratives and, um, and reclaiming meaning of certain events. So for example, the, you know, the experience of the, the, the Greek civil war for the left in Greece or um, the Romanian revolution for subsequent generations of filmmakers in, in Romania. Um, all of these things can have a radical potential, but I wouldn't want to start thinking about trauma as being radical it sounds a bit like a kind of romanticization of the whole process i'm not sure i would see it that way but i haven't really thought about it in those terms mm -hmm. thank you very much for an answer i would like to ask more but um the time for questions is over and i have questions sorry if, if it would like to... yes yes sure okay. i think we can have a Okay, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the presentation. It was really, really interesting and uh, touched to the issue, probably to my research. And I want to ask you about uh, the trauma and time, because um, I'm used the perception, first perception is of, uh, about philosophical of Schopenhauer, of Arthur Schopenhauer, that describes about experience of life as hidden experience. So we don't really can understand what we experience right now. We can understand it or uh, according when you see it on the in the in the prism of future and past so uh, yeah, i'm really agree with you what when you're talking about trauma we we uh, sometimes call names the trauma for everything we're experiencing because it's some kind of trend modern trend it sells good it's kind of capitalistic also approach so it's it's uh, connected to discourse and the second thing uh, it's very interesting about uh, to hear your point maybe you know about a Jungian approach. Carl Gustav Jung suggests that uh, maybe if you um, uh, know, uh, he suggests that we are experienced also Freud, that we are experiencing the things already we, we have experienced. So we, we, can, we can meet people with, that we already uh, prepare, we're already ready to meet. So it's kind of trauma, it's our experience from the past. So we go in on the passes. Of, of our past experience. Uh, so how is related to maybe to your research or, um, or connects to, to your studies? I'm bringing, for instance, example of uh, uh, um, Jewish identity, 
It's an entity that's related to, to kind of trauma that begins thousands of years ago. And it comes back in not only in, in identity uh, collective, but a personal identity. So it's very interesting. Maybe this kind of um, issue can be also a little bit explained or, or thank you. Um, yeah, this is a question for me, um, again on trauma, yeah? Uh, uh, firstly, I would say I, I'm not that familiar with Jung um, and Jung's work on trauma. Um, it's been many, many years since I've read uh, Carl Jung, so I, I can't speak to that. Um, what interests me about trauma and temporality is this idea of retroactivity. Okay, and this is why I sort of said the idea of deferred action could be problematic because it presupposes that there is an actual event. Um, the radicalism, as I see it, of Freud's notion of primal fantasy is that the fantasy did not necessarily take place, but it has to be posited in order to make sense of something later. So when we talk about trauma and um, retroactivity, we posit an event in the past, which is the traumatogenic event, which is the cause of the present, but that event itself did not necessarily take place. It doesn't mean that if we talk about historical trauma, it doesn't mean that there was no historical event. So for instance, I mentioned earlier the, the Greek Civil War. Um, what started, one of the things that started my interest here is I started looking at the Greek Civil War through films, particularly by the Greek left, by Theo Angelopoulos, by Volgaris, and, and how they represented the, the, the Greek Civil War, and this changed in the filmic representations. Um, but I was also looking at films from North Macedonia and started seeing films from North Macedonia about the Greek Civil War. Um, and what is interesting there was, okay, in terms of Greek national identity, in terms of Greek culture, this is a cultural trauma for the left. You know, this, the left lost, hundreds of thousands of people were forced into exile, families didn't come back, etc. From a North Macedonian perspective, this was really a trauma of national identity, uh, of national identity because the Slavic population the North Macedonian population of Northern Greece, what was left of it was expelled during the Greek Civil War. So we have, a, we have an event, but we have two different traumas. Okay, so what the, the trauma is retrospectively, retroactively constructed. So it's not to say in terms of his, you know, when we're talking about history, there is an historical event that has taken place, when we're talking about psychological trauma, it's not necessarily the case that there's actually something happened, all right? And this is where, so this is where th this will be the mistake of kind of recovered memory. If, if anyone remembers the memory wars of the 1980s and things like this, this whole thing around recovered memory syndrome, where it was assumed, you know, that there must have been an event and you just have to keep going back further and further into an individual's history. So there is an event when we're talking about history, but the trauma can be entirely different depending upon the context. Mm, I mean, sorry, I mean, about, I meant about um, the recognizing of, of trauma, it's dependent of time and bring, for instance, the collapse of Soviet Union in 91. And uh, I'm talking about uh, economical consequences. And for instance, my parents today, they recognize the trauma only today, nowadays, because they didn't recognize the trauma because it's not, it wasn't an issue about the empire collapse, but the economical subsequences were they such hard uh, taken by the population. So till now we have very, very uh, strong trauma in the, in the conscious of, uh, of post-Soviet uh, uh, post -Soviet Republic, Ukraine, Russia, I think Belarus as well. So in the, in the real time, we didn't recognize it. We didn't understand. So we didn't know where we live. So it's also happens in trauma. So we connected to Arthur Schopenhauer perception that we are not really recognized 
what is it trauma is. Maybe we now we're, we're still living in some kind of thing. So that's, yes. So we, we only I'm sorry to interrupt, Professor Sean. Can you please answer very, very you. briefly sorry and we will move on. Okay, sorry. Do you want to answer in a few words maybe? I just very, very, very briefly, I, I completely agree. There has to be a time lag here. For Freud, this was what he called the latency period. Um, we can see it with things like the Holocaust. Um, you know, the, the extermination of the European Jews only became the Holocaust later. It became the event we named as the Holocaust, uh, you know, in the ninth kind of 1960s. So here we have this time lag and there has to be this time lag there. And the time lag is important in terms of the retroactivity of constructing an event as a trauma. I completely thank agree with that. Thank you very much for the thank answer. Thank you very much, thank you. And thank you all the speakers for the panel and for your participation. And I think we need to go on a break right now and prepare ourselves for the next panel.
Um, all right, so I think we can begin. Uh, so I wanna welcome you all to the third panel, um, the Memory in Public Space panel. Uh, I will keep this short so that we can move to the speakers. Uh, I'm just uh, going to emphasize that um, each speaker will have 15 minutes to present their work, uh, and then we'll proceed to the discussion portion of the panel. So uh, I would first like to say that uh, one of our speakers, uh, Maria del Rosario Acosta Lopez, unfortunately won't be able to attend, uh, but we have, we have three other speakers who will be presenting, so we will proceed to the first speaker. So I introduce to you Mr. Tyler Johnson. Uh, Tyler Johnson is an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, his research agenda focuses on American political behavior, examining how information, be it media coverage, campaign commu communications, or a politician's biography, affects attitudes toward political actors and policy issues. He will be speaking about his work titled A Lost Cause, History, Heroism, and the Future of Memor Memorials to Confederate General Robert E. Lee. So, Without further ado, Mr. Johnson, the floor is yours. Good morning to me, I suppose. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm noticing that in the main YouTube thing, my picture looks flipped. Uh, does the presentation look flipped when I share the screen? No, great, okay. Uh, good afternoon to everyone uh, halfway across the world from me. Uh, Thank you for that introduction and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak at this conference. Uh, as was stated, the paper I'm presenting here today is titled The Lost Cause, History, Heroism, and the Future of Memorials to Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Uh, this is part of a broader project that I've been working on over time now about uh, attitudes toward Confederate memorials. Uh, you know, the American landscape is, is dotted with these memorials. And I use that word to capture the idea that there are a whole host of ways that uh, people over time have looked to honor uh, the losing side of the American Civil War. Uh, there was a Southern Poverty Law Center report uh, two years ago, almost two years ago now, uh, that had the number of these memorials at about 1,700. And uh, that number has dropped right around 200 in the past two years, as the spotlight has shown much brighter on the purpose and place of these memorials in American society. Now I use this word memorial and what comes to mind when I use that word, for, it, for the most part, what probably comes to mind is something like this. This is a, a, a monument to, to Confederate General Robert E. Lee that sits in a, a park in Richmond, Virginia. So when I say memorial, the first thing that comes to mind might be statue, but the Confederate memorial in American society is much more multifaceted than that. Uh, you might be driving down US 50 in the state of Virginia and exit on Lee Jackson Memorial Highway, which is a highway named after Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, two Confederate generals. Your children might go to elementary schools or middle schools or high schools or even uh, universities named after uh, member, prominent members of the Confederacy. There are US Army bases named after former Confederate generals, a handful of them. In fact, Fort Bragg is another one that, that comes to mind here. You could be watching reruns of television shows and stumble upon the late 1970s, early 1980s program, The Dukes of Hazard, which is about uh, a, a pair of, of Southerners who sort of go on wild capers and they drive a car with a Confederate flag on the top and the car is named the General Lee. So there are all these sorts of places in which Americans are regularly reminded of the Confederacy. And it's you know not surprising that these sorts of memorials could cause many uh, great pain. They're reminders of the legacy of, of slavery in this country and and the separation even post-Civil War of, of African-Americans and, and whites in this country. But there have been counter arguments made in favor of the presence of, of these memorials as well. You know, two things in this argument or this discussion over the future of these memorials that's important to keep in mind is it's not as if the Civil War ended in April, 1865 and immediately people in the South started putting up these memorials in 
uh, May of 1865. A lot of these memorials are the vestiges of, of the era of Jim Crow in the United States right around the turn of the 20th century. So there was this movement uh, once the law started moving in favor of uh, racial equality in this country to sort of push back against that and, and remind people of, of white supremacy. Uh, another thing to keep in mind when it comes to the, the place of these memorials in American society is that it's not as if they're just in what we would consider to be the South or what was the Confederacy between 1861 and 1865. So this here is a map of, that sort of captures where the bulk of these memorials to the Confederacy are in the United States. And you can see it sort of spans uh, what we think of as the US South. But even looking at this map here, you can look in the sort of upper left-hand corner and see a, a, a memorial in the state of Montana, uh, which wasn't even a state during the Civil War. Uh, you can look toward uh, the, the upper right portion of the corner and you can see a memorial in Boston, uh, which is firmly ensconced in, in what we would call the Union. And then you can look at the places where these debates over removing memorials had taken place over the past few years. And there were memorials to the Confederacy in what we would consider to be some of the most liberal places in the United States. You know, Los Angeles, California, Brooklyn, New York. These are not places where you would think that the Confederacy would be memorialized. And yet these memorials sort of crept broadly into American society for, for a period of time between like the 1890s and, and the 1920s. And even up until 2011, there were efforts to add memorials rather than subtract memorials. So it's not surprising that there's been a discussion about the, the place of these memorials in American society. And that discussion is one that has accelerated. Uh, there's been broader debate for the past few decades about the place of the, Confederate, the, of the Confederate flag in American society. And a lot of Southern states have had to grapple with, you know, the Confederate flag was part of their state flag, or they would fly a state flag and a Confederate flag simultaneously. And there've been a lot of efforts to get states to change their flags or pull down the Confederate flag. This is a debate that's been going on for decades now. But there's been a lot more focus on memorials specifically after uh, a church shooting in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015. Uh, the city of New Orleans in very high profile fashion, uh, the mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrew and, and city council members decide to pull down uh, some prominent statues in, in town squares in early 2017. The sort of infamous a Unite the Right rally that took place in, Charles, in, in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017 that led to uh, a death of, of a protester was a, was a rally that was inspired by the state of Virginia attempting to bring down uh, some of these memorials. And, and unsurprisingly, uh, the, the murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police uh, this past spring and the Black Lives Matter uh, marches that took place in the United States and across the world for that matter over, over the past few months also have inspired many to reconsider these memorials and think about pulling them down. And in fact, uh, something like 50 to 60 memorials have, have been removed in the wake of, of these rallies. You know, the, the statue I, I began with here, uh, the, the Lee statue in Richmond, uh, this is a picture of it before those rallies this summer. And uh, it looks like this is a statue that will come down at some point, but it was a, a focal point for uh, Black Lives Matter protesters to sort of send the signal that this sort of memorialization in American society isn't uh, necessary, is hurtful, and, and needs to disappear. That said, survey research on this question is pretty divided. Uh, in the paper for this conference, I cite the fact that uh, two big national survey research corporations in the United States asked Americans about the future of these memorials within the same week this past summer. And both of those surveys delivered very different findings. One survey was something like 55-45 in favor of getting rid of these sorts of memorials. And the other one was the exact reverse. So you know, the broader project I'm working on looks at what types of arguments might move opinion on this topic. And I come at this from a sort of quantitative uh, political science background, as, as was stated in my introduction, uh, you know, I, I work on American political behavior, I do a lot of public opinion research. So I'm looking at like how information moves opinion. And then I'm sort of curious as to how this changes over time. 
and you'll get a little bit more insight into that uh, when I get to the back half of this presentation. You know, a lot of the research on this topic already is sort of a qualitative set of, of works that examines the arguments being made for or against the Confederate flag's place in American society and for or against the place of these statutes. And these arguments have, they can be boiled down and some authors have boiled them down into a very pithy description of hatred versus heritage. So you've got the hatred side of, of the argument here that um, these memorials remind Americans of the legacy of slavery and the horrors associated with it, uh, that they were put in place to honor white supremacy and to sort of attempt to keep distance between uh, racial groups in this country. And also the sort of oddity of the concept of celebrating people who should be considered traitors to the country. Uh, you know, I saw one art, uh, author remark, you know, it's not as if in the United States you see statues of Benedict Arnold, let's say. Um, it, it'd be pretty rare that you'd see separatists honored in, in this sort of fashion. You know, the other side of the coin, the, the heritage side of the argument, uh, makes broad appeals to history, this idea that, well, getting rid of these memorials is erasing history, and these are things that should be remembered, and we can learn from these memorials. But there are also people who make these arguments of, of heroism, and it fits with sort of a broader public opinion trend in, in the United States of um, focusing on like people who serve in the military as being brave and they their bravery should be honored or their leadership should be honored uh, for one reason or another. Uh, you know, there've been a few other pieces in, in recent times that have sort of come at this question from, from an empirical sense. One of which is a, a 2019 article in, in PS, Political Science and Politics. Uh, but not many people are doing uh, quantitative research of this sort. So, you know, my paper for this conference focuses on the history and heroism side of the argument. Uh, I have the hatred uh, portion in, in some research that's under review as well. And I look at this through the lens of, of Confederate General Robert E. Lee, who is probably the most honored uh, member of the Confederacy across the United States. There's an entire Wikipedia page devoted to all the memorials to, to Robert E. Lee in, in this country. So what I did in this research is I conducted two nationally representative surveys, uh, one of which took place in October 2019 and the other of which took place in August of 2020. So this gets me sort of a before Black Lives Matter pool, and at least in terms of what took place this summer, and a pool of respondents that participated a few months after uh, the, the movement and the marches really sort of took off. And, you know, participants in these surveys were uh, sort of randomly divided into one of three groups, one of which was a control one of which was a group that got the history argument and the other of which was a group that got the heroism argument. And I'll explain what those mean in a second. But everyone in these surveys were asked a series of five questions about various types of memorials. Uh, there's a statue of Robert E. Lee in the US Capitol. Should it stay where it is or should it be removed? Fort Lee, which I talked about a few moments ago. Should it be renamed or should it keep the name Fort Lee? A school in the South. This is an actual school here, Robert E. Lee Elementary School. Should they rename it? or should it keep its name? There was a school in San Diego, California. We saw it on the map a few moments ago here. They decided to change their name. Were they right or wrong to do that? And then you can go on amazon.com and buy, uh, you know, this is an example of a model kit of that television car that I told about a, moment, a few moments ago, but like, should Amazon be selling products that memorialize members of the Confederacy or should they keep selling those things? Now I mentioned a few moments ago here, you've got these three groups. One subset of respondents in the survey, they went right to answering these questions. A second subset in this group read this paragraph here, which obviously I'm not gonna to read to you. It's in the paper if you wanna see it, but it's sort of a, a Wikipedia summary of Robert E. Lee's military career. And then the third group also got that summary, but then they got a little bit of insight into arguments that have been made to the effect of Robert E. Lee is a hero. Um, and you can see in this paragraph here, if you just sort of scan it, like prominent, famous, well-loved American presidents on both sides of the political spectrum in retrospect praised Lee's leadership. So there, you know, elites have made this art heroism argument in favor of, of Confederate generals decades after the Civil War was over. 
So, you know, I only have a little bit of time left. Um, if, if folks are interested in, in sort of seeing the data or looking at these tables in a little bit more detail, I'd love to send them to you. But, you know, what I want to stress here about the, the findings of, of these survey experiments is that, like, the, in general, uh, the, the public seems a little bit more hesitant to removing memorials when you give them very specific names of people who are being memorialized. Um, but that hesitance varies based on the type of, of memorial here. Uh, you know, many more Americans thought the California school made the right decision to get rid of the name than say if Amazon should stop selling uh, products that memorialize the Confederacy here, here. The other thing that's important to note about this table is that like the more information a respondent receives, the more they seem to be in support of, of keeping these memorials. And that's especially the case when you look at that heroism argument. That seemed to be the most successful argument uh, on behalf of keeping these memorials. Another thing, so you know, I have this October 2019 and this uh, August 2020 set of, of surveys here. If you compare these tables, post Black Lives Matter marches from this summer, the percentage of Americans who think we should get rid of these memorials goes up. So there are some introductory evidence here that these memorials had an effect on Americans' interest in, in getting rid of these memorials. If you sort of compare those control groups from one to the next, you see anywhere from like a three-point bump to almost a 13-point bump in getting rid of these, these memorials. The other thing we sort of take away from the August 2020 surveys is that like the heroism argument still seemed to be the most likely to shape people's views uh, on, on whether or not these memorials should, uh, should stay or should leave. But in the August 2020 survey, the, the pattern from left to right is not as clear. So for some reason, the people who received the history argument in some of these cases feel, felt a little bit more strongly about getting rid of these memorials than even the control. And I, sort of, I theorized to some extent in the paper about why that might be. Uh, in closing here, you know, future attempts to look at this, I think would benefit from larger sample sizes. So these are sort of small end surveys. Uh, I think it's also interesting to test other Confederate figures. So if Lee is the most prominent member of the Confederacy, maybe people have different feelings about him than say, you know, the example I gave before of Braxton Bragg as a Confederate general who has a lot of things named after him, but not many people know who he is. Uh, so, you know, figuring out if people are sort of against memorials in general, but if you get more and more specific, they get a little bit more hesitant in removing those memorials. Uh, that's something to, that, that could definitely be tested by future surveys here. You know, these memorials are, are disappearing, but I think we're gonna reach a point at which some places in the, you know, there are a handful of states in the South that have passed laws that say these memorials cannot disappear. They have to stay where they are. And so we should expect to see a lot of challenges to those laws. Uh, in those challenges, yeah, I think that some people sometimes underestimate the potential power of, of the history or heroism argument. The trend has been to get rid of these memorials and it's a trend that I agree with. Uh, but you know, the other side of, of the debate has an argument there that according to the data that I have here, uh, perhaps has some traction. And so you know, the question we might ask ourselves then is like, what can the removal side, what sort of arguments can they make uh, to make their point of view hit home harder? And I'll sort of give you the spoiler alert on the other half of the research that's not included in what I submitted this conference. But like when the removal side of the debate makes an argument that Robert E. Lee himself was a bad guy, there are, there's plenty of evidence out there that he was personally bad on the issue of slavery. Uh, those sorts of arguments seem to be much more effective than sort of general arguments about uh, the horrors of slavery. So if you wanna bring down a statue of Robert E. Lee, the argument to make seems to be tell everyone why Lee specifically was bad. And, and that seems to move opinion much more so than, than general arguments about memorials writ large. Uh, thank you for your time, and I look forward to, to questions here at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Um, it's truly very interesting, and it does seem like 
uh, it hits home and it hits hard of, um, when you talk about individuals and if you tell them specifically about these uh, about these Confederate generals rather than just talking generally about the issues of the Civil War. Um, we will proceed with questions at the very end. Um, we already do have some coming in. I do encourage all of you to also submit your questions into the Slido um, presentation or what should I call it um, with the hashtag Herald and we will then move to the questions at the end. Um, I would now like to present the second speaker, um, Mr. Rafael Perez Baquero. Uh, Mr. Baquero holds a PhD in contemporary philosophy at the University of Murcia with a dissertation entitled Narr Narr Narrating History, Remembering Trauma, which focuses on history and memory of the Spanish Civil War. He is also university expert in social memory and human rights by UNED and was a visiting researcher at Cornell University. Uh, he will be speaking about his work titled Forsaken Bodies, Hidden Narratives and the Reframing of the Past. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Mr. Rafael Perez Becairo. Hi, thank you so much Nicola and thanks everyone for allowing me to be here sharing my, my ideas. Uh, I'm gonna start by sharing them the screen and yeah. and can you can you watch it yes we can see it no, sorry okay um uh, great uh, so um well uh, thanks again and i would like to go further into some of my ideas regarding um the role of forsaken bodies uh, within collectively remembering and politically dealing with a uh, conflictive past uh, with a special attention to the historical case of the Spanish Civil War. Undoubtedly, after times of conflict, their bodies are the most controversial objects and has come to the collective remembrance. As far as bodies are both material for historical inquiries and social significant traces, Controversies regarding causes in, co in post-traumatic context deeply affect both the writing of history and the social remembering of conflicted past. Within the last decades, the political and cultural role of great sight and dead bodies in contemporary society has given rise to a new term, the spectral within memory studies and cultural studies. Echoing Derrida's work on the specter of Mars and other groundbreaking approaches to the burden of traumatic past, memory studies have addressed the extent to which the notion of a specter could set light into socio political controversies regarding legacies of state sponsored violence. Within these discussions, the metaphor of the ghost or specter could capture the disturbance in the symbolic moral or political order as a consequence of traces and bodies belonging to a forsaken past, reappearing and unsettling the historical agents of the present. Few, few will dispute that in post-conflict context, dead bodies held a symbolic power from which to manifest the ways in which necropolitics have dealt with the traces of sad dreadful development. In this regard, the Spanish Civil War is no exception. Both the war and the Franco dictatorship in Spain have, le have left deep aftermaths within Spanish society uh, that, uh, in the decades to follow, the most, the most tangible of which were the bodies of victims of Francoism that had yet to be recovered. During the transition to democracy after the dictatorship, no public effort to exhume and mourn these victims was carried out. On the contrary, under the disguise of a depiction of the world as a distant past whose aftermath should be left behind, thousands of human bodies were left buried in ditches. Nonetheless, from the onset of the 21st century, an official exhumation started to win for bones and school of the unidentified victims. The display of such dreadful images and narratives to Spanish society was so uncertain that he gave right to waves of emotion and political contestation, which challenged the so-called Spanish fact of the region. 
Undoubtedly, these uncanny bodies, despite belonging to an absent past, are fully present in contemporary Spain. As different, as different scholars have suggested, the Spanish portentational complex is one of the most representative cases regarding changes that have taken place within social processes of casting off the memory of victims as a consequence of forensic practice of recovering their forsaken bodies. In this presentation, I would like to address the extent to which the so-called packet of oblivion, packet of oblivion of forgetting in Spain regarding the aftermaths of the Spanish Civil War in which the Spanish society engaged during the transition to democracy has been undermined owing to the unofficial exhumation of the, of the victims of Francoism. Both the photos taken from the beaches and the narrative displayed from the ceremonies which go along with the exhumation have provided new materials for collectively remembering and writing the history of these victims, even as to reframe the way in which this past is retold and reenacted in contemporary society. But first of all, I would like to start by going further into the metaphor that have been usually uh, resorted by in order to uh, deal with the political, uh, political uh, role of their bodies, which is the myth of um, Antigone. And as a scholar such as David Butler, James Martel, or Hans Ruins have defended, the myth of Antigone and Creonte fully grasp the essential tensions underlying how states deal with human traces, some of which may belong to victims of state sponsored violence, as in the case of Antigone's brother, Polynicus. Uh, as defended by, by Hans Ruin in Living with, in, in living with Death, Living with, with Ghost, sorry, uh, I quote, Antigone is the sister of a dead brother who is refused a burial as punishment for having conspired against the state. She challenges the state and the threat of a death penalty in order to give him a funeral, if only by symbolically stirring earth on his decaying body as it lies on the ground exposed to virtues and dogs. And I quote. The struggle between the law of kinship and the human law displays the extent to which the state's sovereignty and authority depends on establishing a sharp line between the dead and the living, and between those deaths which deserve to be mourned and precarious lives. Not only does polity consist in organizing the matter of citizen, but also in dealing with the material crisis after their passing. When legitimizing and administrating their own power, politics depend heavily on necropolitics. This is the reason why gravesites, tombs, and mourning rituals are filled with an era which is not only sacred but also political, as far as the fate of the community became concentrated in a dispute uh, about how to care for its dead. Within such a struggle, the state's own authority is always at the stake. No matter how hard the mechanism of state, a state can render the excluded victims as unworthy of mourning and social concern, there is always a possibility of these forsaken bodies being recovered and contesting the state's necropolitics in a way which Jessica Auster defines a politics of hunting. As James Martin argues, I quote, there is a way that the state cannot completely control and determine what their death means. End quote. Pro providing that politics of the past promote a depiction of conflicting events and their aftermath, which give rise to a symbolic universe that determines how the past should be remembered, for shaking the bodies could threaten such sovereignty and offer a fair depiction of the past. From forsaking the bodies, that is deemed a new form of counter-agency, which may reframe how the traumatic past is socially remembered. So the relevance of bodies, of forsaking bodies with collective, when collectively remembering the past, account for the, emerge, for the emergence of a forensic turn within memory studies. Uh, uh, in this regard, the Spanish case has been the, paradig the paradigmatic historical case with regard to this forensic term within history and memory. Accordingly, different scholars of Spanish culture, such as Jola Banzi, Patricia Keller, Amarie Strova, asserted that contemporary Spain is full of ghostly presences. Undoubtedly, the reason why Spanish society is currently haunted by such figures lie in historical and in political and historical roles. As 
I'm, I'm not going to assume that you're familiar with uh, Spanish the history. I'm going to outline briefly some of the most important events. In, the, in 1931, in Spain, the work was created a new political regime with the strive to uh, modernize culture and economy and was mainly supported by liberal classes and left political parties. In 1936, uh, a group of generals who represented the most uh, traditional and conservative parts of the society organized a coup d'etat against uh, this, this republic, which led to the Spanish Civil War. And after winning the war, the revolution leaders established uh, a, a, a dictatorship with land 40 years after Francisco Franco, the dictator, died in, uh, in 1975, giving rise to the transition to democracy. So, this fell to the attack against the Spanish Second Republic brought about the most dreadful event in upper Spanish 20th century history. Beyond the high number of casualties on the four lines, the repression carried out by the rebels and pro, and pro Republican forces increased the death toll. 50,000 uh, were killed by the Republicans and around 150 to 170,000 by the Francoist forces, which, after winning the war, strongly repressed the vanquish and killed around 50,000 victims more. Most of the victims of Francoism were not properly mourned by their relatives after the conflict. On the contrary, they were thrown into mass grave after being shot. During the dictatorship, mourning them was forbidden, which accounts for thousands of families not being allowed, allowed to grieve their losses. As Paloma Aguilar says, I quote, they were prevented from grieving in a normal way, and the memory of the dead was erased from the public space. And of course, after the death of Franco and during the pursuit of democracy, the social and political commitment and not to endanger the stability of the new political regime, led these forsaken victims to remain identified in common graves. Due to the so-called packet of oblivion or packet of forgetting, any initiative to unearth them, bring their bodies back and mourn them properly has been denounced as trying to open all wounds. Nonetheless, the politic of forgetfulness started to crumble at the beginning of the 21st century. From, from 2000 onwards, relative of victim of Francoism, with the support of forensic, of forensic specialists, has tried to exhume some of them. The images taken from the mass group started to be displays of society, engendering a sense of uncanniness owing to the haunting presence of a past that was previously considered gone. The uncanniness, the uncanniness of the schools and bones of victims of Francoism is the engine of the social movement for the recovery of historical memory in Spain. The unsettling effects that images of bodies had on, on contemporary Spain clearly serve as an example of the affirmation dynamics that coupled figures engender within memory of conflicted past. After all, the victims of Francoism are clearly a ghostly present. They are neither fully alive nor totally gone, which is why they unsettle, they unsettle the bonds between the living and the dead, which Estetra aims at imposing. In her studies of forensic practice in contemporary Spain, Laila Renzo highlights the disposition in which bones belonging to victims of Francoism were found. Their bones and school were fractured and dislocated, evidencing a huge level of violence. These material traces testify to a dreadful story which, have, which has been spelled from the public sphere for a long time, but now come back through the unearthing of these bodies and the transmission of their images to the media. This is the reason why the effective emotion for the dead among the living is still from the exhumation, which by means of the effects of such images in the media extend to the rest of this society. The mass wave become a space of feeling which kept hunting for coming generations. Uh, and by, uh, after all, the forsaken bodies of victims of Francoism inhabit the ghostly space between the living and the dead. And by, so, and by doing so, they became the source of effect and political contestation regarding the legacies of Francoism and the lack of transitional justice in Spain. In this regard, the Spanish disappear could be labeled as political ghosts, inasmuch as they are contributing in undermining narratives according to which the Spanish transition to democracy was a complete, a complete success. As Jolabandi asserts, 
the social movement for the recovery of historical moment in Spain relies on these figures of spectrality. The forsaken bodies testify to the still open wounds which were framed as definitely close to a transition to democracy in Spain. The displaying of the remedies in the media were the grounds on which the social and political claim for justice and, rest and restitution esteem. Echoing the Rida Spectre of Mars, it is possible to appreciate that there is a strong connection between these ghostly figures and claim for justice. The effects of forsaken bodies in this one period comes to mind. And here I'm going to quote a paragraph from the Rida in which he established this link between. Uh, specters and cultural figures and claiming for justice, and with, with which I'm, I'm going to end my presentation. No justice, I quote, seems possible or thinkable without the principle, through the principle of some responsibility, beyond all living present, before the goals of those who are already dead, be they victims of wars, political or other kind of discrimination, victims of the oppression of capital imperialism or any of the forms of totalitarianism. And of course, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Baquero. Um, I really think it truly is a question of history and remembrance. Um, uh, I would like to move on now to the third speaker, uh, and then we will have uh, space for questions. I already have many coming in. It's Good, exciting. Um, so our last speaker uh, will be Mr. Uh, Frankowski, Alfred Frankowski. Uh, he is an associate professor uh, in the Department of Philosophy at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. His research is in 19th and 20th century continental philosophy, critical race theory, aesthetics, and post-colonialism. He is author of The Post-Racial Limits of Memorialization Toward a Political Philosophy of Mourning and co-editor of Critical Perspectives on African Genocide, Memory, Silence, and Anti-Black Political Violence. Um, his current book projects focus on anti-Black political violence, genocide, memory aesthetics, and environmental violence. Um, the topic of his work today is Monuments of Racial Terror, Intersections Between Memorial Aesthetics and Land Sovereignty. So, Mr. Frankowski, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for the introduction, and thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, conference. This is my first time doing this uh, virtual format of things, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit strange. Um, on the one hand, I, I, um, I like being able to be back at conferences and to hear all the all the of the talks and to uh, not also not have to leave my house. So, <laughs> um, I also want to thank the folks on the panel, um, Professor Johnson and Raphael, for your papers. I I hadn't really expected this, but I think that um, I find myself here as as, as as in sort of true Hegelian fashion as being sort of somewhere in between both of these, <laughs> of, of the two former papers. Um, and so, 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 so taking up the question of Confederate memorial um, and the question of uh, political violence and mass violence or mass death, I think sort of are the, are the um, centerpieces of, of this work. And um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have any visuals. I'm visually unimpressive, but I will try to um, um, hopefully uh, uh, make up for that. Uh, so I want, us to, I want us to start maybe back at what Professor Johnson had talked about uh, earlier, which was um, the rally around the Robert E. Lee Memorial, um, but specifically uh, the, the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. Um, so I'll start there. Uh, the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia stands out as one of the most high profile reactionary protests concerning Confederate, memor uh, Confederate memorials to date. It remains significant for several reasons though, uh, several other reasons though. If we recall the rally, uh, the rally in Virginia, it has, um, it has more or less defined the undercurrents of American fascism or Trumpism or American racial terrorism um, was at least discursively a project, uh, 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 was at least discursively projected as a rally to protect this nation's 
history, memory, and beautiful monuments. The, the Unite the Right rally protesters gathered to protect the removal of a Confederate monument of Robert E. Lee, a removal which was voted on and approved earlier that year. And it is in this context that the Unite the Right protests reveal the weirdness of the intersections between American politics of memory and its history of racial violence. We might think it is strange that a memorial manufactured well after the Civil War as propaganda was being championed as culturally important in danger of being lost or even as true American history despite the legacy of American racism, particularly against Blacks. Um, we might also sort of think of think back to the map that Professor Johnson had showed had had shown about where these monuments ended up at. The movement the movement to have these gaudy monuments uh, that appear all over the U.S. and not just in the South removed is part of an acknowledgement that they do not represent social memory. The protests, however, underscore that truth and history is nowhere their concern. Rather, there is an aesthetic relationship to space, to land, and to political narratives that inform the future that these protesters are defending or claiming as part of these monuments. They are memories for the future, regardless of their relation to the past. Memorials and monuments, um, memorials and monuments after all, put into effect a, a public representation as something enduring, something that weds the past to the present, and that is part of the contemporary memory of the past and present of a memory of for future generations. However, these are meaningless, weird old trinkets of the, uh, of the past without their context and without that which contextualizes them. I would argue that if the Confederate memorials of Robert E. Lee stand out as a prelude to a memory of the future, then the memory of Mary Turner is inseparable, inseparably another which contextualizes the dialectical and hermeneutical politics of, uh, of, uh, of memory, of the memory aesthetics at play. Who was Mary Turner? On May 17th, 1918 in Lowndes County, Georgia, a farmer named Hampton Smith, who had the habit of not paying his black farm hands, was found dead. The white community started to round up, beat, kill, and lynch any black person they thought might have been associated with, uh, with Smith prior to his death. Hayes killed by, uh, what has been called a lynching rampage um, that lasted a week. During this time, Sidney Johnson, who, act who, who actually had killed Smith, was shot and dragged 20 miles behind a pickup. However, his however, Hayes's wife, Mary Turner, in grief and eight months pregnant, threatened to pursue justice for the mistaken killing, the father, killing of the father of her unborn child. A lynch mob was assembled. Hundreds gathered to witness um, from Lowndes and other counties. And Mary was brought in front of the crowd, her ankles bound together, and she was hung from a tree. Here's what, the, what, the, what was reported by an account in, an, in a newspaper. Quote, gasoline and motor, motor oil were thrown upon her dangling clothes. A match wrapped her in sudden flames mocking ribald laughter from the, her tormentors answered the helpless woman's screams of pain and terror. Quote, Mr. You ought to have heard the nigger wrench pal, end quote, a member of the mob boasted a few days later as we stood at the place of Mary Turner's death. The clothes burned from her crisply toasted body which, in which Unfortunately, life still lingered. A man stepped for, towards the woman and with his knife ripped and with his knife ripped open her abdomen in a cruel in a crude cesarean operation. Out tumbled the prematurely born child. Two feeble cries it gave, 
and received for answer the heel of a stalwart man as life was ground out of the tiny form. Um, after all of this, Mary Turner was cut down, buried in a shallow grave along with the remains of her fetus. Her, her grave was marked with a whiskey bottle and a half-smoked cigar stuck in the top. Hayes Turner's body remained hanging on a pole on the highway. In 2010, a marker to memorialize Hayes and Mary Turner was established. The memorial stands off Highway 20, 121, excuse me, stands off Highway 122. Um, once it was surrounded by flowers, it now sits in a tangle of weeds. Much like the memorial plaque that memorializes the lynching of Emmett Lewis Hill. My point about the Unite the Right rally was that the aesthetics, the aesthetic space of memory memorializes not only the past, but the present. The memorial is always routinely in a state of repair and damage always a current site of racial terror, and it is always a, a memorializing of a memory for the future. It remains the site of, an, of the enactment, and much like Mary Turner, an edifice through which racial terror becomes public, shared, and generational. There is nothing forgotten or concealed in the bullet holes. There is, nothing, there, there is no erasure of memory or of the past, because what they reveal is as much a present as it is enshrined for a future. And it makes public a politics of racial terror, both past and present, committed within the impunity of our time and space. The violence, the violence and not the marker are thought as um, as, a, as a monument of racial terror. And the same seems true of the rallies to protect these Confederate monuments. It is more about the violence, the right to terrorize, the potential to preserve the sovereignty of racial terror as a memory for the future than anything else. While all forms of terrorism are political violence, hermeneutically the Memorial aesthetics of racial terror is more than political violence in the context of the US. And this is especially true when it works as a form of memory for the future. In, this re in his recent short article, Preliminary Reflections on Democracy and Memory, Corey McCall has argued that monuments inform us about a culture's heroes, but they also make the past illegible in ways that conceal the history of displacement and dispossession. McCall further argues that what is at stake in cultural memory is the meaning of democracy for future generations. But when we think, this, think of this from the standpoint of racial terror, questions of whose culture and what memory is secondary to the ways in which cultural memory is used to alter the meaning of space and place politically and aesthetically to shape or contort the meaning of politics and the meaning of sovereignty in democracy. These questions are further elaborated when we think the problem from the standpoint of how monuments present the traces of racial terror through the remains of violence. To think, this, to think the lynched body as a monument of racial terror is not merely a hermeneutical point about the functioning or memory or, or meaning of racial slash racist politics. In thinking the dialectical relation of Confederate memorial uh, memory to monuments of racial terror, we embark on a different framework of questioning of racial violence within the spatial relations and within its spatial relations and very possibly a thinking of difference within the context of anti-Black violence. 
by considering the relation of monuments to racial terror in the past, um, we frame the ways in which racial terror is not only past but present generationally. I wanna emphasize the generational part there. Um, and not only spatial, but environmental, existentially. Hayes and Mary Turner are not simply standout representations of a racist past or the violence of a racist society, but the traces that traces, excuse me, the traces that trace the spatiality of racial terror. And if we think them as monuments, their traces along with the bullet holes in their, in their memorial are with us and trace our present moment and its spaces of terror for the future. I think a, a, similar, a similar parallel can be drawn environmentally. Um, the memorial aesthetics of racial injustice is environmental injustice in the same way. Environmental, the environmental justice scholar, Robert Ballard, focuses on a different kind of spatial, spatiality of racial terror in considering the location and environmental impact of landfills on communities. And I wonder if it would, be, if it would not be good to consider this as a type of monument as well. Let us take, for example, his findings in his work on Southern Texas, where he found that consistently from the 1930s to, the, to 1978, Five out of five city-owned landfills were located in predominantly black communities. Six out of, six out of eight uh, of the city-owned incinerators were located in predominantly black neighborhoods. And three out of five privately owned landfills were located near, in or near black neighborhoods. The largest landfill in the US, which takes refuse from all over the country and from other countries is located near the heart of Sumter County, which is 75% black and ML County, which is 90% black. Um, this is in Arkansas. Um, despite, despite composing only 25% of the population, 82% of the waste was deposited in black communities. And I, I would, I would, I would, I would, suspect that um, given the landscape, many of these black communities are also indigenous communities as well. Um, he writes, quote, in the seventies, an all white Sumter County Commission decided to locate the facilities there, end quote. In addition, Ballard found similar patterns in West Virginia and Dallas and concluded that, and concluded that environmental racism continue to embody the legacy of Jim Crow. While there are immediate questions of justice at play, we should focus, we should also ask how the making of environments toxic now as a condition for the future does not constitute a form of memorial violence. The making of land uh, toxic is not only political, but is embedded in the generational aesthetics of our ecology and a form of dispossession itself. And it is, uh, it is for us to think um, the violence of dispossession is both memory and monument of terror. Is, and, this, and this violence is a form of land sovereignty in which in that violence that continues ecologically is neither part of the political discourse or action. Indeed, Robert Ballard uh, states, quote, in the real world, communities are not equal, are not created equal. Some are more equal than others. If a community happens to be poor, black, or located on the wrong side of the tracks, it receives less protection than communities of largely affluent whites in the suburbs, end quote. Um, what I hope is clear is that the that racial injustice and uh, memorial aesthetics are not about forgetting. Considering the memorial aesthetics involved in the history of racial terror as a form of social amnesia is woefully inadequate. It is a matter of engaging the dialectical contradictions built into our forms of spatial terror as a form of land sovereignty. Land dispossession can occur in many ways, but what is important in this context is how dispossession 
and land toxicity rem retains racial violence and specifically anti-Indigenous and anti-Black forms of terror as its monument. The creation and reproduction of environmental conditions that negatively affects Blacks and Indigenous groups do not only establishes a condition by which Black communities are disproportionately affected by environmental degradation, but they are monuments of the continuance of racial terror as a form of sovereign violence embedded in environmentalism developed out of colonial relations to indigenous populations. Um, Jürgen Zimmerer has argued that, quote, colonialism and in particular settler colonialism can be seen as a control of space or land on the basis of race. It is, if nothing else, land grabbing by the colonizer on a truly global scale, end quote. The, uh, the same seems true of prolonged patterns of despoilation and dispossession, but it is the aesthetic of the land and this relationship to violence as a form of slow violence that, underdo that undoes the hermeneutical boundaries imposed in memory discourse and establishes a political form of sovereignty. Uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, um, it, you have maybe one minute. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so I'll skip the stuff on slow violence, but what I, what I would just say is that slow violence out of, in Rob Nixon's work is, a, um, is a, a way of thinking about how violence unfolds generationally over long periods of time, such that we actually don't identify it as actual violence or as something that's ongoing or as something that if we see the consequences of, we don't really trace the ba back to these larger, larger patterns. And so I just, just, I just wanted to make the, make the, the, the connection there between um, what we see sort of generationally uh, through the history of lynching and through the history of despoilation of, of, of lands as part of this, this uh, uh, as part of, of what, what is, um, could be thought of in terms of memory aesthetics. The last thing that I would just, I would like to just turn to for a, a moment is, to um, is to think of this through in terms of why why we should think this through in terms of genocide. Um, the 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 Civil Rights Congress in 1951 pointed out that um, the that they were the first group to charge the United States to charge their own country with genocide, and they charged the, the country with genocide using the UN the UN de uh, definition. So the UN definition of genocide states that if, if any country meets at least one of the criteria of genocide, it is, uh, it, it, it is uh, liable to be charged with the crime of a genocide. The 1951 document, We Charge Genocide, uh, established that the United States met all of the criteria for genocide um, with copious amounts of evidence. And so, so they said, the genocide of which we claim, of, of which we complain of, is a genocide in plain sight, and particularly uh, of importance was the way in which lynching fulfills almost all of the criteria of genocide all by itself. Not to mention the types of what was going on in terms of, of education, um, uh, uh, housing, policing, etc. Right, mm -hmm. um, but things still have the, the the petition was of course ignored um, and discredited but we can still see the same patterns at play today. Um, and um, and I, I think that part of what we need to do is just think about how these things um, change the way that we think about, not just justice, but how we think about uh, uh, what's going on with memory. So my last paragraph is uh, by, by dialectically repos repositioning and um, beyond, excuse me, beyond uh, dialectically repositioning and hermeneutically posturing, we are not really confronted with questions of memory and memorialization, but rather we are confronted with the question of new ways of questioning sovereignty, starting concretely with the monuments of racial terror. Everything else, it seems to me, is thinking and acting that is stillborn, if not already always part of the trinkets of history, useless to anyone, at least anyone who suffers. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to all the speakers. Um, it is truly something very, very interesting to think about. Uh, we do have many questions from, from 
people uh, is towards Mr. Johnson mainly uh, regarding the uh, memorials. So I'll just move right into it and we can start a discussion and feel free um, all of the panel speakers to answer. Um, and so I'll ask the first question. Um, what do you think about immediate monuments uh, slash memorials, those which are the, re the reaction of people for the event, but not legitimized by the government? You know, I, I don't know if I've really considered those in, in, the, in the context of, of, of my paper. I, I sort of think about those in like the, the vein of free speech arguments in the United States um, that sort of immediate monuments and memorials and it's sort of fascinating to consider what all that might subsume are, you know, an, an opportunity for um, people to sort of let out their feelings or let out their frustration and government seems to abide by those. You know, the, the problems that we seem to be running into with the memorials I talk about in my paper are like governments that are in many ways boxed in when it comes to what they can and can't do. So a sort of immediate monument or memorial, uh, it's an expression of free speech. Government seems to be okay with those in a lot of situations, but the things that have existed for a long time, a lot of governments don't have mechanisms for figuring out what to do with them. Or as I alluded to in my talk, there might be state laws that block them from doing anything. There, there's been a sort of sort of shockingly entrenched white supremacy over the past decade or two in trying to keep some of these memorials in, in place. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, th I, th I think this is worth further study. It's just something I hadn't even thought about in the context of my work. Um. Yeah, I think also in, um, for example, here in Slovakia, we do have, um, when such an event of uh, a tragic death happened, we there were always candles set out uh, in the street mem in memory of, of the victim uh, and the government never seemed to really jump in uh, because it was such a strong reaction. And um, I think it's um, just as you said, the the, reaction of the people it's their free it's their free will to met to keep those people in memory you can you can look at that so the the picture i showed of the lee memorial post the black lives matter uh marches of this summer where uh you know it's been spray painted and and people have sort of used it to to uh counter message the memorial you know some cities have like their reaction has been that is, that's, that's great, let's leave it how it is. And in fact, I've heard people propose that like they take the statue part down off the top, but keep that pedestal where it is as sort of a monument to these protests. Mm -hmm. But then in other cases, you've had cities who sort of tried to come in right away and you know, power wash the, the, the spray paint off and try to make it look like it was before. So you, you know, some places have seen those sorts of immediate monuments or memorials to use what the question says uh, as a, a way to heal or to, to use a word that is used in the, in the next question in the Zoom group chat, like to, to bring about reconciliation. Mm -hmm. um, whereas other places have been like, no, we have to get rid of this as, as quickly as possible and make it look like it once did. Yeah, that does, uh, it comes sort of, it's in connection uh, with the next question that we got from Slido and uh, does also connect to the question asked in Zoom about um, counter memorials placed next to the Confederate statues and whether those are met with resistance or acceptance in that's, a way. That's actually my question. Actually, all of them, all of the questions on Slido are my questions. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I was wondering about that. Um, it's closely connected to Martin's uh, question on um, the, the possibility of memorials being uh, a constructive uh, space for dialogue, for healing, um, for working through 
uh, like entrenched versions of, of the narratives of the past. One example of such counter memorial is in, in uh, Hungary, in Budapest. Um, there is a memorial to the Second World War, which was uh, erected by Orban's government, uh, which essentially depicts um, very polarizing vision of, of uh, the memory of the Second World War. There is an archan archangel Gabriel, which is being attacked by the German eagle, essentially uh, representing Hungary as this innocent victim, even though many Jews have perished from, from Hungary itself and from Budapest especially. And Germany being the, the, sing the single villain that is, is attacking Hungary. And there is a beautiful counter mem memorial just in front of this uh, monument, which has, which has become permanent, just like many of the counter memorials next to Confederate statues, where people bring suitcases, they bring photographs or, or shoes of, of the victims. So it's this space in a constant dialogue. Uh, government demolishes it every now and then, but people keep bringing it again and again. Um, and again, although I haven't been there recently, um, I, I think that probably the government is even more repressive at this point. Um, but yeah, I, I would be very curious to, to see what, what do, how is it perceived by, by others? I mean, there are some permanent counter memorials like in UNC Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Um, are they accepted? Is, is that a good way? Um, or there's also like open air museums sometimes where statues are, are collected, you know. So we're we're seeing more and more of these types of arguments. I think as efforts to try to find middle ground. Um, you know, in some ways, got like I mentioned a few moments ago, uh, governments are scrambling to find solutions that they think will satisfy both sides. Um, but yeah, as, my, as my paper says, you know, there, there have not, there's not really, I think, data that sort of backs up how people feel about that middle ground. Um, and I, I, I would be curious to see if that approach would kind of be seen as sort of like a, 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 a King Solomon like, attempt to, you know, we'll, we'll just give both sides a little bit of what they want. We'll keep some of these uh, memorials where they are, but we'll set up um, some sort of broader learning experience related to it. Uh, if the people who really support the heritage side of things would see that as giving ground and the people who believe that these uh, memorials are hatred, if they would, if, if, if they are willing to, to, to bend as well. But you have seen a sort of uh, growing discussion. I think it sort of started as an academic discussion, but it seeped into the political conversation about like, can we just move these things into museums? Um, or there are, there have been, I um, saw a story about a guy who essentially said, I will buy all of these statues that have been taken down and I will create uh, a, a, an open air uh, museum to these statues but it wasn't a sort of like, let's learn about both sides sort of museum. It was a, like, we're essentially gonna replay the, we have to honor the Confederacy. We're just gonna do it in a different location, a, a more uh, cohesive single location rather than having these statues spread all over the place. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised to see elected officials talk more about the ideas that you and, and Martin mentioned in your question, simply because they're looking for ways to not stir up public opinion against them as, as much as possible. I tend to think that they're gonna end up alienating both sides. I think they're overestimating the extent to which they're likely to make everyone happy with an idea like that. Uh, but the ideas that the two of you pose in your question are, are ones that are more part of the conversation now than they were in, like when New Orleans took down those statues in 2017, there was a lot of, okay, so where do they go from here? And some of the cities that have taken things, these things down are like, no, we don't quite know at this point. We're just gonna put them in storage and figure that out later. Um, so I, I think that there is the likelihood that the ideas that you talk about are going to become more of the conversation. 
And it's probably impetus for me to sort of start adding that into the survey research that I do on this topic in the future. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, all the questions are uh, being asked. Um, so I would like to uh, invite Rafael because we have a question for you personally. Um, the question is from Dagmar as well, uh, I suppose. Yes, um, right. Um, and um, so how was the exhumation and reburial of Franco perceived by those who mourned their loved ones and wanted to get access to their remains? Okay, thank you. Um, that's a, a, a really interesting question. I think that it was, it was positively perceived kind of a relief because what some of the well some of the families of the relatives that are still missing and some of the representative of the movement for the recovery historical memoir in Spain uh, so as something really unfair is the well the fact that Franco's bodies was buried in this uh, place for commemoration in the bottom of the fallen in which some people could go to uh, commemorate him or something like that. And conversely, all those victims who pass away fighting for the Spanish democracy were forsaken and were abandoned and, 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 and are still in the common way. So the fact that Franco was finally exhumed and, 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 and he went out of the body of the fallen and just to uh, his private, uh, his private term, I think was was perceived as part of the movement for the recovery of historical memory as yes, one thing that we as Spanish society should should uh, overcome, but it's yes, a part of a, of a process which is still uh, moving and which is not going to stop until all the thousands of victims that are still in common graves uh, were seen and identified and properly known as them. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, there is one more question um, towards Ms. Dr. Johnson. Um, do you think that canceling culture is a radical expression of what some may term the dictatorship of political correct correctness about the subject of race in the US in particular and the UK to an extent and the controversy around critical race theory in the era of Trump and alternative truth? Uh, I, it is, it, this is kind of, tough for me to, to answer broadly because uh, I don't necessarily do research on, on cancel culture. But when I saw this question in the chat, it made me think about how some of the things that I talk about in, in my paper and uh, some of the things that are me were mentioned in, in the third paper on this panel uh, have been subsumed into this broader debate about cancel culture in, in the United States, uh, that like getting rid of these memorial, you know, some have argued um, arguments that I don't personally buy, but you know, some of some have argued that th this is just uh, getting rid of these memorials is another attempt to erase history or to make us forget about our past. Um, that you're or that you're sort of trying to cancel the history of a very specific uh, subset of Americans who have Southern lineage or something like that. You know, the counter argument is obviously, well, the, the point of these memorials was to sort of, uh, to continue to, to cancel the, the, the burgeoning rights of, of African-Americans in the South during Jim Crow. But uh, I, I think that as we progress here, this debate is, you know, the, the, the tentacles of the idea of cancel culture are continuing to spread into a lot of debates in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be surprised if that sort of language becomes more a part of the conversation about this as 
you know, these statues continue to topple and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's a, a satisfying answer to the specific question, but um, th this is an area in which we're still sort of trying to grapple with the extent to which Americans buy into uh, this idea of, of cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the the question of having these these memorials and um, and them being a part of history is the fact that history isn't something that should be forgotten, because essentially learning from history is what uh, how society should evolve in in the end. Um, so it is re it is important to keep keep the memories, but it depends on the tone of which uh, of how they are presented presented, I would say. And I think that is also something that Mr. Frankowski was um, was mentioning in his in his work. Um, but anyway, uh, I would um, like to encourage uh, any other questions that there are for our panel speakers. Um, if anybody else, uh huh, yes, I see Mr. Griffith has his hand up. Uh, please proceed. Thanks. Um, yeah, this is this is a question for uh, uh, move my question, uh, but for Al and Tyler, um, it. It's kind of a question that I always have with the, when I hear the, <laughs> being a, a white American, I've heard plenty, plenty of versions of the heritage uh, argument. Um, and I always wanted to say, well, what's the heritage that you want to celebrate? Um, what exactly is the, the thing that you say should be preserved? Because I've read my fair share of Faulkner, and that is okay. There's elements of there. It, that's not a man who's afraid to talk about how deeply racist the, the, the culture he grew up in is. So to what extent, I mean, from your perspective, what, what exactly would be the heritage as opposed to the heroism that, that you were laying out? Um, what would be the heritage that you preserved? So I, 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 I tend to agree with you that it is, you know, it, in, in many cases, it's, it's sort of racism couched in a sort of, uh, you know, I think about gone with the wind comes to mind here that people have this, like at its face, they're trying to, uh, to pretend that heritage is the preservation of a memory of a genteel, gentlemanly South uh, that was uh, quaint and 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 so forth. Um, but I I think that that is a facade to cover more nefarious views about uh, race and society. So I, I think that a lot of the the heritage arguments are fronts for arguments that we should be pretty concerned about. Yeah, and I mean, I'm sorry not to interrupt or prolong or whatever. Um, oh, sorry. Um, because even it's, it, it also always seems to me that, that um, when I'm, even if I wanna take them seriously, that they, that, you know, the gone with the wind, Romanticism is is genuine. So what? It was based on the back of slavery. Yeah. Like so what you lost as well. You know, we, we can be romantic about the the Middle Ages, but it was still built on serf labor. Yeah. So it, it doesn't seem to me like an argument as much as bad nostalgia to go back to one of the earlier panels. You yeah. can think about like the as with many arguments, you know, at least from my perspective in American society, but I'm, I'm sure those who, who are in other countries sort of feel this way as well, like 
there are many arguments out there that are hermetically sealed that it feels very difficult to pierce with the sort of uh, logic that you've just brought to the table there. So uh, I had, you know, there's a lot of a, a sort of circular nature to, to some of these things as well that, um, you know, no, no matter how much you, you point out the, the sort of slave basis or the, the question of whether or not there should be honoring of, of the side that were, were traitors to, to the nation, um, you oftentimes in return get a very thin argument that, well, you know, these people fought and died for a cause. Um, well, like obviously, as we've discussed here, it's a cause that is worth questioning again and again and again. But like, again, the, the sort of romanticism about people fighting in war, I think underlies some of these things. Or, you know, these were people's uh, great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents and so forth. And our, our desire to sort of honor the dead writ large, uh, regardless, I think also may play a role in that. Yeah, I, I think that there's also a, um, you know, so th this is a, distinctly a, 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 a confusing question and a sort of irksome question, uh, one that I can sort of more or less confront, had to confront Carabindale, which is Southern Illinois, Illinois being the southernmost point of the North and the northernmost point of the South. Um, and you know, and so you hear these arguments about people wanting to protect their heritage, or that the, that there's something about Southern heritage. And the question is, what 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 do you think that is? So one one thing would be the the, the sort of aristocratic culture. The problem with that ends up being that um, the aristocrats were the ones who set the war in motion, and that it's the it's the aristocracy class that that became that 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 uh, that. Uh, was liquidated through the war, right? Because they were the ones who lost the they were the ones who lost land. They were the ones who lost who lost the who lost the wealth, right? And it was actually the poor whites who they were very scared were going to be the ones that were going to suddenly take over things. And so it's weird to think that 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 uh, um, families that have their history and poor whites in the South are the ones who are worried about uh, the aristocratic culture that, that <laughs> they're the ones who are being nostalgic about this aristocratic culture that hated them to begin with and uh, when would, would never have funded education for them um, and simply did, and, and didn't think they had voting rights of any sort. So that's strange. Um, there's also this sort of argument about that the war was really about state rights. And you know, then you have to think about, okay, well, A, the state rights that they were very, very concerned about was the ability to, uh, uh, to continue slavery. But it wasn't just that, right? It was a, it was a plan to expand the, the slaveholding states to the West and to take over Mexico and make that a slaveholding territory as well. And so, so it wasn't just about, oh, we just want to protect state rights, but no, we want, we want, a, 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 uh, we want to force other places to also be state uh, slaveholding as well. And so, so yeah, there's, there's, there's something weird there. And so I think it, within all of this is, is a question of, do we owe, do we owe a uh, 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 service to, um, to propagandistic memory? And I think that that's really, really, really where the conversation needs to start at when we talk about people wanting to conserve uh, Confederate memorials, because why should we put up with the idea that the people who want to preserve history are wedded to the idea of a history that doesn't make any sense, right? They're, they're, do we owe, if there's gonna be a genuine, con genuine conversation about uh, history and preservation and memory, then uh, do we owe anything to propagandistic memory, right? As, you, as, as uh, Professor Johnson pointed out, right? These, these uh, started, these memorials started well after the Civil War, and and as a response to the idea that possibly the civil possibly the Civil War memory would fade, and that cause that they were part of would also fade, and so um, the the fact that these things are placed in California and other places and places, it really is a memorial to the idea that slaveholding that 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 uh, slaveholding uh, was going to expand into those territories and. Now the, the, the remain is of racial terror, right? And I don't see how you can, how, how folks can really think about them, how a genuine conversation can crop up around them without thinking about them as, 
as sort of uh, uh, um, contemporary signs of, of terror. But I think that's also where the conversation should start at, right? Because it's, it's, it's uh, uh, as, as Professor Johnson was pointing out, it would be, you, I don't know how you, could, how you could have a halfway point between one group who says, these are, these are terrorizing images. Um, and another group who says, no, these are fine old grand images. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Griffith. Were you going to say something? I was just saying thanks. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, maybe connecting this to um, one last question that I think we'll have time for um, and trying to remember uh, trying to keep these events in memory um, and talking about terrorizing images or, or uh, how should I call them? Um, there is a question saying many historical events, personalities are now shaped in a form of statue in the city center or secured in the museum. Do you think it is time to change our shape of memory and make it more interactive for the public? Especially if we're talking about the younger generation who uh, most likely or would probably learn far more through an interactive form, do you think this would be a right way to go? So I think that that's part and parcel of that sort of proposal that I talked about earlier and that was mentioned in some of the questions of like moving these, especially the sort of statue type of memorials to museums is that you put them in a place and you give uh, broader context um, and maybe that like dra that drains some of the idea that you're honoring these people out of that you know if you go to a museum do you think that the people in the museum are being honored um, not if you do probably not as much as like if it is in a prominent location within a city where everyone sees it on a regular basis so I think that that you know that that's that's something that had you know when when people say oh we should put up a plaque next to the statue that explains the other side of the argument well that person is still sort of being honored in the place that they were somebody decided 100 years ago to honor them. I tend to think the sort of moving these things into a museum and and delivering a broader historical context gets you uh, some of what that question was looking at, and it, uh, it it definitely gets the sort of interactive portion of it. Um, you know, I, I, I would sort of suspect that we're not gonna see many more statues uh, put up in the future as well, that if, if people, you know, there's, there's still people out there who are raising money to try to create these sorts of memorials, but even I would guess that even they are, are unlikely to try to replicate the statue idea moving forward. Um. Thank you. Um, we might, uh, we still do have some time and I think Mr. Abdelghani al was uh, maybe wanted to have a question. I did see him write something in the chat. Uh, and yes, I see it here. Um, a question for Rafael. Have, um, have you experienced effective techniques concerning reframing the past such as NLP or others? If yes, which do you recommend that has uh, tangible positive results? Um, I'm not. I'm not really sure. Because I think I have. I cannot help but thinking that all the points turn within Spanish we call the historical memory, and all the narratives that revolving around the exhumation are adding a dimension of materiality within within the, 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 the collective memory of those events. So it's not just about histories, it's not just about depiction, it's just about the, the, the own materiality of the bodies of the school that are, that are lying there. So 
I'm not sure about how this raw material that is steaming from the beaches, that is steaming from the from the gravesite, is going to be, I don't know, metabolized or is going to be depicted in the forthcoming for, for the forthcoming generation. I'm not so sure about it. And I'm not sure about which way to be more effective in order to create to make the uncanny feeling of the of the bodies remain across different generation. I'm not I'm not really sure about actually I'm not really sure about that. I don't I don't think we we still uh, don't have enough distance toward the recovery historical memory and toward uh, the raw material materiality of this of these bones of this school in order to provide uh, a concrete a concrete answer. Right? I think that uh, you know, there are currently some some ideas and people taking photos of a person that are in charge of exhumation lying beneath the bodies in order to create some kind of comparative flows between the bones and the flesh or something like that that are kind of yeah really are really interesting but I don't know I don't know exactly what's going to, to happen in the future regarding how these bodies will be how, how this materiality will be reenacted and will be embedded within for common ways of dealing with this past. So I don't know if whether I as a to answer the question, but that's all that came to, to my mind. Thank you. Perhaps also a question for uh, for further research. Um, uh, nevertheless, I want to thank you all uh, for participating. We're coming to an end for this uh, for this panel. I want to thank all the panel speakers um, for their for their presentations for their of their work. Um, we will now have about a 15 minute break um, because at 6.30 we should have the keynote, uh, keynote uh, presented by Mr. Griffith. Um, so try and try and take a break, uh, maybe um, walk around a little bit and then uh, we will see you in a bit. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, bye.
Okay, uh, so thank you. Welcome back. Uh, I hope everybody is well rested. I am here to introduce our first keynote speaker. Uh, our first, spe uh, first keynote speaker being Charles Sabatos, a professor in literature at Yeditepe University in Istanbul. Uh, Charles specializes in comparative contexts of Central and Eastern European literary history. Um, he is the associate editor of World Literature Studies, and his most recent book is Frontier Orientalism and the Turkish, American, Turkish, Imag Turkish Imagination in Central European Literature, uh, published by Roman and Littlefield. He's also, uh, this is partly how I first met Charles, uh, the translator of numerous, uh, of at least a couple of books by excellent um, Slovak uh, writers, uh, Dominic Tup. Tutarka and Pavel Vilikovsky. And Charles first came to Slovakia, although uh, he's of uh, Slovak ethnic origin, I guess is the right way of putting it. Uh, first came to Slovakia in 1994, and then on a, a Michigan dissertation fellowship in 2004, as well as a Fulbright in 2005 to 2006. And then, um, when I first had the good fortune to meet him in 2016, he was in the country, in Slovakia, uh, in, on a Slovak national scholarship. Uh, so, and let me switch, sorry. So today his talk is titled, Bratislava as, as a Cultural Borderland in the Danubian Narratives of Lee Fermor and Magras. And with that, I will hand it off to you, Charles. Okay, uh, thank you, James, for inviting me. Thanks to uh, those of you who've made it through to this point. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna speak at, at great length, although it's a keynote, I'm gonna be fairly concise. Uh, you know, also tomorrow's a fair, fairly full day. So um, I just wanted to bring back the conference in a symbolic way to the kind of the original home although most of us are not there this year. Uh, so the topic of my paper is, is Bratislava, and it is a focus on memory, which uh, this is more of a nostalgic memory than a traumatic memory. But of course, even nostalgia has some trauma and pain buried under the surface. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at two different texts that are in, the, they can be described as travelogues, but, that doesn't really do them justice because both of them are very richly detailed uh, and lit literary works uh, based on the travel of these two Western authors uh, down through the Danube and traveling from Germany through uh, Central Europe and all the way down to the Black Sea. So uh, the, uh, the starting point of this nostalgia is actually the whole debate over Central European identity, which uh, kind of got started uh, with Milan Kundera. He wasn't the first one, but he sort of made uh, the biggest impact uh, with, this, with this idea. Uh, in 1984, uh, he wrote an essay called The Tragedy of Central Europe, which uh, was also known as uh, by the title A Kidnapped West. The original French title was A Kidnapped West which actually represents his argument maybe a little bit more, uh, which was this idea that in the time of the Cold War, when uh, Europe was divided between East and West through this almost uh, seemingly permanent Iron Curtain, that uh, this region of Central Europe was actually uh, uh, a Western civilization that had been kidnapped by Soviet imperialism. And this led to an, an, a, a debate between various writers, some still living in, uh, in, in the socialist bloc of the time, some uh, already uh, living abroad like Kundera. So again, it's this idea of moving westward uh, that these cultures that for, for, for 40 years had pretty much been seen as, as purely Eastern, almost integ integrated into Russian culture. And Kundera was arguing against that. But uh, I just wanted to start off with an interesting quote from uh, his first novel, actually, uh, Gert, 
or The Joke, which was published in 1967 in Czechoslovakia and then translated in 1969. It was his first uh, really successful work abroad. And in this novel, Kundera suggests that his native Moravia, uh, it, the region of the Czech Republic, is naturally linked to the east. Its rivers, uh, unlike those of neighboring Bohemia, like the Elbe, which flies in, flows into Germany, uh, flow into the Danube. And Kundera foreshadows his later preoccupation with the unrepeatability of history by linking the passing of time to the flow of a river carrying away a garland of flowers in a Moravian folk tradition. And this is sort of a long passage he writes about a Moravian folklore in the book. I could just see the flowers floating and the brook passing them onto the stream, the stream to the tributary, the tributary to the Danube and the Danube to the sea. I saw the garland go never to return, no return. That was what brought it home to me. The basic situations in life brook no return. Any man worth his salt must come to grips with the fact of no return. So the flowers floating down the moor of a river to the Danube, uh, which is actually just uh, uh, north of Bratislava, the, the confluence there, uh, through the Balkans to the Black Sea provide a different framework for Czech literature, uh, which is neither dominated by Russia nor part of Western Europe, but linked to the multinational history of the Danubian region. And at the very same time that uh, Kundara was promoting this concept in the mid 1980s, the Danube was reimagined as an autonomous literary space by a scholar of Germanic literatures from the former Austrian seaport of Trieste. And in Danubio or Danube, which was published in 1986 and translated actually in 1989, uh, the revolutionary year in Eastern Europe. The writer Claudio Magris describes the river as the quintessential symbol of Europe's multi multilingual identity in opposition to the Rhine, which represents German cultural purity. And I'm just gonna quote this one sentence in Italian. I'm not going to read any more Italian here, but there's an important distinction here between the original and the translation. So he describes this, El e il fiume di Vienna, di Bratislava, di Budapest, di Belgrado, della Dacio, il nastro ci attraversa e cinge, l'Austria asburgica della quale, quale il, il mito e l'egeologia hanno fatto il simbolo di una coine plurima e sovranazionale. Okay, and uh, in the English translation of this sentence by, by Patrick Cree, uh, he replaces this Greek term coine which is a language created from a mixing of dialects with the more general culture. And of course, in a metaphorical sense, uh, Magris did mean a Dumuvian culture, but the uh, English, English translation loses that uh, connotation. And as he says here, it is the river of Vienna, Bratislava, Budapest, Belgrade, and Abdacha, the river which embraces the Austria of the Habsburgs, the myth and ideology of which have been symbolized by a multiple supranational culture. According to Nikola Petkovic, Danube clearly reflects the rebirth of the term Central Europe. And I quote from him, both the methods and results of Magris's literary journey speak to postmodern and anti-essentialist perspectives, questioning the West's traditional metaphors, just as Kundera questioned the role of intellectuals' emotions in the presence of tanks that came to Central Europe from the East. Magris's Danube was translated into Croatian in 1988 and into other languages of the region soon after the fall of communism, including a 1992 Czech edition, which the Prague Weekly Respect reviewed with some, some ambivalence. And this is a quote from the review of the Czech translation. In Magris's pages about Slovakia, we can most easily re realize the possibilities and limits of his style in which the deep erudition of a Germanist is connected with the sovereign superficiality of a postmodernist scholar, who, however, does not stop being rude, sometimes clairvoyant observer. Another significant Danubian narrative was published in the same year that Magriza's book first appeared. The second volume in Patrick Lee Fermer's trilogy recounting his experience of crossing Europe on foot to Istanbul in 1933 and 1934. Although his route was not restricted to the Danube, the river forms an important framing device in all three. And these three volumes were published over a, quite an extent of time. The first volume, A Time of Gifts, 
appeared in 1977, the sequel Between the Woods and the Water in 1986, and the final version, a uh, final volume, The Broken Road, did not appear until 2003, actually after his death. And the first volume ends on a bridge between Slovakia and Hungary, while the second ends as he is crossing from Romania into Bulgaria. What makes Lee Fermer's memoir unique is his interpretation of the history he discovered along his journey, as well as his astonishing memory. Both Patrick Lee Fermer and Claudio Magris combine elements of autobiography and travelogue to create portraits of the great Central European river that have captivated readers. But despite their common setting, these works have rarely been discussed together in detail. Lee Fermer's memoir is widely considered a masterpiece of British travel writing, but is rarely included in the discussions of Central European identity. Magris, as a specialist of the former Habsburg realms, was almost immediately included as an authority in the debate over Central Europe, but his narrative does not fit smoothly within the boundaries of the travel genre. As the Bulgarian critic Dimitar Kanarov states in his review of a more recent travelogue, so many writers have traveled the Danube that their tributary ink, if channeled into a single stream, would turn the water black. Kanarov considers Lee Farmer quote, the best of the lot, saying that what, his, what makes his writing so fascinating is not documentary accuracy, but his idiosyncratic, highly stylized approach. Kenarov admires Magriz's Danube as a current of ideas is incessantly shaping the intellectual landscape of the continent. Geography is intimately connected to history, and the movement through space is also a movement through time. But he concludes that Magriz's journey, quote, remains more cerebral than visceral. While their image of Bratislava is both exoticized and idealized, both Lee Fermer and Magris use its location bordering different cultures as an example not only of European history, but of modern existence. Their works show a distinct nostalgia for the tradition of Habsburg multiculturalism, just like Kundera's essays. Svetlana Boim has proposed two types of nostalgia. While restorative nostalgia, quote, attempts a trans-historical of the lost home, reflective nostalgia, quote, dwells on the ambivalences of human longing and belonging and does not shy away from the contradictions of modernity. Restorative nostalgia tied to nostos, the home, seeks to reestablish the past, which is considered an absolute truth, while reflective nostalgia connected to algia, longing, aims to mediate the past and calls it into doubt. In general, restorative nostalgia contains more nationalistic tendencies, whereas reflective nostalgia has a more personal nature. Joseph Allen has suggested a third type, refractive nostalgia, whose intent is neither to re restore nor to reflect, but to use these memories as reified and recovered objects to cast light focused in its refraction on contemporary conditions of displacement. The Danube region is a powerful site of reflective and uh, Re refractive nostalgia for both Patrick Lee Fermer and Claudio Magri affect their own intellectual and scholarly experience upon the history of the region. As George Prochnik has suggested, Lee Fermer conjured the restoration of Byzantium itself through language, literally seeking the future in the past. Their texts are, are closely tied to the refractive nostalgia for this multicultural Central Europe that emerged in the debate over identity, uh, between Kundera and other writers like uh, George Conrad, Danilo Kish, and Magris Magri himself. Although Lee Fermer's work has not been widely translated in Central Europe, his first volume was not appeared, was not published in Czech until 2018. His trilogy can be appreciated as a part of Danubian nostalgia in relation to Magris's work. It's interesting to note that among their vast array of literary and historical allusions, neither Lee Fermer nor Magris include the brief references to the river by Longinus, who first the concept of the sublime, although Lee Fermer carried with him a volume of Horace with a reference to the far off Danube, and to Edmund Burke, who redefined the sublime on the basis of enlightenment philosophy. In his essay on the sublime, uh, Longinus describes how, quote, our imaginations often pass beyond the bounds of space, 
offering the example that by a sort of natural impulse, we admire not the small streams, useful and pellucid though they be, but the Nile, the Danube, or the Rhine, and still more, the ocean. Like Magris, Long Longinus brings together the Danube and the Rhine, but rather than contrasting them, he sees them both as natural wonders surpassing our physical senses. Centuries later, Burke's philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful from 1757 examines the effective words by proposing a hypothetical passage. And this entire passage is Burke just uh, some example. The river Danube rises in a moist and mountainous soil in the heart of Germany, where winding to and fro, it waters several principalities until turning into Austria and laving the walls of Vienna, it passes into Hungary. There with a vast flood, augmented by the Sav and the Drav, it quits Christendom and rolling through the barbarous countries which border on Tartary, it enters by many mouths into the Black Sea. Burke's argument here is not really related to the Danube, but to the impossibility of simultaneously perceiving words and the concepts they represent. But like Lee Firmer and Magris, he marks the border uh, with Austria and Hungary as a breaking point between East and West, in his case, between Christian Europe and the barbarous Orient. Marietta Bozovich and Matthew Miller's collection, Watersheds, Poetics and Politics of the Viennese, takes Magrise's work as the basis for its interdisciplinary approach. They acknowledge Magrise's assiduous attention to the multiplicity and indeterminacy of Danubian identities, but criticize him for being, quote, unable to relinquish the Germanocentric imprint of his orientation. In the same volume, the Serbian critic Tomislav Longinovich calls for an eccentric imaginary which rejects poetics centered on nationalist mythologies of hearth, pure landscape, and covert anti-humanism, and rather surprisingly claims Magris to be on the side of these nationalist poetics. Criticizing Magris of longing for the power of imaginary geography that has been the mainstay of postmodernism, he claims that Danube is, quote, somewhat limited by a nostalgic effect tied to the legacy of empires and a historical form of cosmopolitanism they were nurturing from the position of dominance and power. Marcel Cornus Pope and John Neubauer have proposed the concept of marginocentric cities, which is also described by Cesar Dominguez. These are cities that have rewritten the national cultural paradigm from the margin ascribing to it a dialogic dimension, both internally in dialogue with other ethnic traditions and externally in dialogue with larger geocultural paradigms. As an example, Dominguez takes Magriza's uh, opening reflections about Bratislava's pharmacy museum, describing a book written in four languages. Uh, Magriza makes visible to the reader how a pharmacology manual can pinpoint a hidden story, hidden at least for na national literary history, the story of a multicultural and plurilingual city, a hub which encloses a network within itself. This allusion to Bratislava as marginocentric is possibly a nod to the concept of interliterary communities, uh, which was developed by the Slovak theorist Dionys Jurišin, and which uh, Dominguez has also described as an impetus for theories of world literature. In December 1933, Patrick or Patty Lee Firmer set off from London with the goal of crossing Europe on foot from Holland to Istanbul, a youthful adventure that he recalled decades later in his trilogy beginning with A Time of Gifts. After serving heroically in World War II, Lee Firmer settled in a remote area of Greece, the setting for one of his earlier books, Mani, from 1958. In Mark Cocker's view, this narrative abolish abolishes the divisions of time and space which inevitably separate reader from author, and then the author himself from the travel experiences he describes. These described flights of fancy are the equivalent of Joyce's interior monologue. The catalyst for his literary saga, the, th the three volume journey, uh, was when Lee, Lee Firmer revisited the region in 1965, three decades later, uh, read an article for the then popular travel magazine, Holiday. 
In a time of gifts, which takes Lee Firm across Holland, Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia, actually just through Slovakia, and then with a little uh, detour up to Prague, he compares the regions to rivers, as Magris does. The Danube, particularly in this deep gorge, he was traveling at this time through Austria, seemed far wide, wilder than the Rhine, and much lonelier. How scarce was the river traffic by comparison? After spending three weeks in Vienna, he finally continues east to the Austrian border. And in the chapter, The Edge of the Slav World, he crosses a bridge that brings him into what he calls the old city of Pressburg, rebaptized with the Slav name of Bratislava when it became part of the new Czechoslovak Republic. And that at the time had just been uh, 15 years earlier on his first uh, journey. The fact that Lee Firmer first refers to the Slovak capital with its former German rather than its newly bestowed Slavic one is not entirely coincidental. His guide during his stay is a Viennese friend named Hans, who uh, runs the branch of his family business in Bratislava. And Hans still calls it Pressburg, just as uh, Lee Firmer notes, ex-Hungarians stubbornly clung to Pojon. Lee Firmer perceives interwar Bratislava's multilingualism as vaguely oriental. Uh, and he, he, uh, he says, perhaps it had something to do with the three names of the city and the trilingual public notices and street names. The juxtaposition of tongues made me feel I had crossed more than a political frontier. The Slovak and the occasional Czech in the streets were the first Slav sounds I had ever heard. Bratislava becomes for him, to use Magris' term, a koine that makes him imagine the arrival of the Slavic tribes in Europe. And this is a typical passage for him. He takes his, his own travel and he spins it into this imaginary uh, historical fantasy. As I listen to the muffled vowels of the Slovaks and the traffic jams of consonants in the explosive spurts of dentals and sibilants, my mind's eye automatically suspended an imaginary backcloth of the Slav heartlands behind the speakers. Then at the astonishing sound of Magyar, a dactylic canter where the ictus of every initial syllable set off a troop of identical vowels with their accents all swerving one way like wheat ears in the wind, the scene changed. In the outskirts of the town, I caught a first glimpse of gypsies who padded and pulled and wheedled in Hungarian and re reviled each other in Romani. In the many Jewish coffee houses, the minor hubbub of Magyar and Slovak was outnumbered by the voices speaking German pronounced the Austrian way or with the invariable Hungarian stress on the initial syllable. But quite often the talk was in Yiddish and the German strain in the language always made me think that I was going to catch the ghost of a meaning. As Mark Cocker suggests, one senses behind the fabric of Lee Firmer's prose, the idea that language has material properties that can almost be sculptured. His exuberant love of words extends even into languages with which he is unfamiliar. And on his journey, he does end up learning some Hungarian because he spends much more time in Hungary, uh, actually in today what is Transylvania, but among Hungarian uh, minor aristocrats, uh, but he doesn't really learn much more than a few words of Slovak. Lee Firmer's experience in the marginocentric Slovak capital echoes as far as his second volume between the, the woods and the water when he meets a Jewish family in Romania and eagerly shares his enthusiasm for Hebrew. I showed them some of the words I had copied down in Bratislava from shops and Jewish newspapers and cafes and the meanings which I had forgotten made them laugh. These biblical symbols recommended a stall for repairing umbrellas or Daniel Kish, kosher verst um salami. Later in that volume, he reaches what he calls the end of Middle Europe, that's the title of the chapter, an island on the Danube known as Adakale that remained a small exclave of Turkish speakers until it was destroyed by Romania in 1970 due to the construction of a power station. Lee Firmer finds its inhabitants culturally and physically exotic, not unlike his first encounter with Slavic culture in Bratislava. Something about the line of brow, the swoop of nose, and the jut of the ears made them inf indefinably different from any of the people I had seen on my journey so far. Their antiquated dialect is his first exposure to the Turkish language, which he describes as astonishing strings of agglutinated syllables with a follow through of identical vowels, like a long marooned English community still talking the language of Chaucer. By the time he wrote his account, Adakale had disappeared underwater and its residents were dispersed some actually to Turkey. 
Myths, lost voices, history, and hearsay have all been put to rout, leaving nothing but this valley of the shadow. Passing Claudio Magris notes that Atacale has vanished, submerged by the river, and dwells in the slow, enchanted times of underwater things like the mythical Veneta in the Baltic. Like Bratislava, the sunken Turkish island becomes a fitting symbol for their literary odysseys in search of lost time, an expression of nostalgia for the post-imperial cultural twilight that disappeared with the rise of the Nazi and the communist regimes. Although Magris does not describe his visit to Slovakia in as much detail as does Lee Fermer, it played a major role in the origin of his narrative. In an interview, uh, which he actually uh, had with a Romanian journalist, Magris mentions that the inspiration for Danube came from a 1982 trip to Slovakia. And this is a quote from this interview. I remember we were between Vienna and Bratislava near the border which at that time was another Europe. We were on the bank of the Danube. We saw the water flowing, sparkling in the rays of the sun that enveloped everything in unparalleled splendor. You couldn't distinguish where the river started and where it ended, if it was the Danube there or not. We experienced a magic moment of harmony and communion, one of those rare instances of perfect harmony with the flow of existence. This is how the Danubian project took shape and thus began the four years of peregrinations along the Danube. Magris gave this same explanation on his first trip to post-communist Slovakia in October 1990, when he presented Danube as a guest of the Slovak Pen Club. In the original title of his chapter about Slovakia, Castelli e Drevenice, Magris mixes Italian and Slovak, although this nuance is lost in the English version, which translates it as castles and huts. Uh, the phrase is inspired by the Slovak writer Vladimir Minach's essay, Gde su nashe Here are our castles from 1968, as he explains, Magris explains in his uh, chapter. Slovakia is strewn with castles, but what Minach seems to say is that these castles are somewhere else in another history that was not created by the Slovaks. Most of the gentlemen who resided in these mansions were Hungarian. The dwellings of the Slovak peasants were the Drevenice, uh, wooden huts held together with straw and dried dung. These huts for both Minach and Magris symbolize the Slovaks as a downtrodden people, the obscure substratum of their country with no history of their own if this is made up solely of kings, emperors, dukes, princes, victories, conquests, violence, and pillage. The Art Nouveau building of Comenius University's philosophy faculty, which is actually right next to the Danube, uh, brings back the memory of a former German teacher, Magris calls Trani, to whom he feels that he owes, quote, not only my discovery of Central European culture, but also one of the most important and unusual lessons in morality, the sense of what is right and contempt for what is wrong. He recalls when a classmate was bu bullied by a fellow student he calls Sandrin, who broke his fountain pens. When the teacher asked him why he had done that, Sandrine answered, I felt nervous. I'm just made like that. It's my nature. The pupils are amazed when Trani replies, I understand. It's just life. That's all. And continues his lesson. Fifteen minutes later, Trani pretends to lose control of himself, breaking and tearing Sandrine's pens and papers, then explained, I had a fit of nerves. I'm made like that. It's my nature. There's nothing I can do about it. It's just life. Magris returns to the present by recalling what he had learned that day about the arbitrary and changeable nature of strength and weakness. Bratislava, the bustling capital of a small people long trodden underfoot, brings to mind memories and thoughts such as this, including that lesson in justice from the distant past. Since Magris is largely unfamiliar with Slovak literature, his reflections are based on information from his, from his contacts in Bratislava, leading him to the observation that people in Bratislava were, were more easily reconciled to the restoration carried out by the Soviets in 1968 than were those in Prague. The political changes since that time, uh, according to Magris, have increased the importance of Slovakia within the state and have given the Slovaks some measure of satisfaction and compensation in comparison with the desert created among the Czechs and in Czech literature. While Czech writers had been driven, driven into exile or into hiding, like Kafka's Animal, this is a, a Margrethe's quote, which digs itself underground tunnels, 
Slovak literature today has its own effective organic unity, a political and social function of collaboration rather than opposition. However, in his review of the French translation of Danube, which was before the release of the Czech version, uh, 1991, the Slovak uh, translator living in France, Petr Brabenetz, describes Margrethe's impression as, quote, downright out outrageous. To claim that the given situation is the result of the will of the Slovak nation means to passively accept the communist demagoguery about the people's government. The author of Daniel was probably influenced by the views of the older generation. They cannot be expected to publicly acknowledge that they have lived in error for, over, for more than 40 years. However, a foreigner must be aware of this, especially if he's a writer who was able to appreciate a substantially different evaluation of life on the previous pages. As in Longinovich's article on the eccentric imaginary, Brabinets accuses Magris of complicity with nationalist forces, of sympathizing with the Sandrins of the world rather than with its trannies. Patrick Lee Farmer ends A Time of Gifts on the Maria Valeria Bridge between Parkan, now Storovo, and Estergom. A border was destroyed in 1945 and not rebuilt until 2001. An old Hungarian shepherd also stopping in the middle of the river points up, quote, to a thick white line of crowding storks that stretched from one side of the heavens to the other, which had entered Europe over the Bosphorus. Then persevering along the Black Seashore to the Delta of the Danube, they had steered their flight along that shining highway. We gazed at them in wonder. This sublime image, reminding him of his ultimate goal of Istanbul, leaves him reluctant to cross into Hungary, quote, not out of fear, but because this future seemed and still seems so full of promised marvels. The river below, meanwhile, was carrying the immediate pass downstream, and I was hung, poised in midair between the two. This pause on the Czechoslovak-Hungarian border lasted nine years until the publication of his second volume, while the wait for the third and final book took three times as long. Claudio Magris ends his journey in Romania near the Danube Delta, where it then flowed along Soviet territory by representing the river not as, quote, the perfect har harmony with the flow of existence that he had seen near Bratislava, but as a threat. Uh, citation here again. The frontier reeks of insecurity, fear of being touched, and obscure terror of the other. It may be that Danubian culture, which seems so open and cosmopolitan, also creates these feelings of anxiety and shutting things out. In the insecure and anxious world that it re has reemerged more than 30 years after the fall of the Iron Curtain, the marginocentric history of cities such as Bratislava and the multiple supranational koine of the interliterary Danube remain as powerful symbols of resistance against the, voice, against the forces of nationalism and intolerance. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, I was rich and uh, fascinating. So I will open the floor to questions and we have uh, plenty of time for, the, for those so you can formulate. Uh, I have a handful of questions, but I can, I can wait. <laughs> Um, I think Adriana might have a question. Is that a hand? I'm sorry. Okay, hold on. Let me see. No, switch. it, it wasn't. That, was that, that, it was, that was just a wave. Okay. No, um. I was just thinking it was a wave, but I was I was formulating the question in my mind. But now that you, um, I was very interested in um, Svetlana Boim. You know, uh, this sort of taxonomies, nostalgia taxonomies. You introduced. Um, I mean, I'm sure that the two books are fascinating. And um, as a Romanian, of course, Danube holds a very important position in our cultural uh, imaginary. And you mentioned my country a few times, so I, I, I guess I, I should read the books. Um, I liked, I quite like the idea of um, um, refractive nostalgia. Is that something that you, that you used? I was just mm -hmm. interested in, because I've, I've never heard, I mean, Boeing with restorative nostalgia, the, the more personal one and the more uh, 
But the one, the, the third one, the, the reflective, the, uh, yeah, the refractive nostalgia. Okay, it, it reminded me of, um, of course, cinema studies, refraction. There are, there are also ways of, I, I remember reading something by some um, critics, I forgot that, their name right now, it's, it's Friday and it's, it's, and it's late. Um, an alternative name even for interdisciplinarity, not inter intertextuality. Again, there is, the, there is a book, I'm going to Google it and I'm going to find the author talking about um, refraction. So uh, could you please um, tell us a bit more about refractive nostalgia? What is that? What is this? Yeah, I, uh, I also just ran across this as a, uh, a term I thought was interesting in, in the case of these two writers. Uh, I originally had applied it only to Patrick Lee Fermer. And this is sort of an expanded version. I mean, you've seen uh, bits of this in the past as well. But uh, this is a different uh, version where I, um, I added Claudio Magris as sort of the, the big name of the Danube as a cultural mm -hmm. space. But uh, originally I was looking at his Patrick Lee Farmer and he is someone who, um, I think it's interesting because there's this nostalgia by an outsider. And I don't know if this, this is sort of maybe my interpretation more than the full meaning of, of this term, but I see it as uh, it's not like restorative nostalgia, like in the case of some of the Central European writers like Kundera that were trying to restore, even though Kundera of course didn't remember the Austro-Hungarian empire, he came from that culture. But Lee Fermer actually is an outsider uh, from England, uh, came to Central Europe, and he fell in love with uh, what was then sort of the last remnants of Austro-Hungarian culture. It was the 1930s. And of course, in Transylvania, there were still these uh, wealthy Hungarian, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I guess they still had their titles, although they didn't have much money. And uh, then, of course, he ended up settling in Greece, where he was very fascinated with the the... the uh, the memory of Byzantium. And that was actually the whole reason why he went to Istanbul was to sort of rediscover uh, Byzantine culture. And when, uh, when he finally got there, uh, this is the interesting part that, as I mentioned, the first two books were published close together. Uh, and then the last book, which took him from Romania across Bulgaria and was supposed to end in Istanbul, he was never able to finish it. And it stayed unfinished for, you know, I don't know, was it 25 years? And only when he died, his uh, uh, literary, ed, literary what, um, executors took the manuscript and published it. And he had made it all the way almost to the Turkish border, but not quite. And there was something about uh, Istanbul not living up to his, um, his dream of Byzantium, right? So, so, so he ended up settling in Greece and in his writing, he was kind of uh, refracting this imaginary Byzantium that he couldn't find in Istanbul, even in the 1930s when it was still, you know, uh, they, not what it is today. But uh, so, yeah, that's that's my use of refractive. I, I just thought it was an interesting term that I ran across, and I'm sure there's more that could be that could be. Thank you. Um, are, there, are there other questions? I'm trying to keep track of different elements of technology here, which never goes well for me. Oh, Jakob, yeah, go ahead. No, uh, thank you for your contribution. It was very interesting for me uh, because of thematization of this uh, marginal central uh, dynamism. Uh, and I, I would like to ask you if you, you uh, can. Uh, um, probably ex explain or more explain this concept of marginal central phenomenon uh, because uh, uh, for example in work of art artists in Central Europe in Bratislava uh, like for example Koller, uh, the artists in fine art uh, they use this kind of uh, margin marginalization or being on margin and uh, in fact, uh, they were created a central uh, artistic uh, expression at that time. Uh, and uh, also by Patochka, we can find uh, philosophy on margin, uh, which, he, which he identified uh, in a, um, a Czech nation uh, in the beginning of 20th century. 
like a movement from margin to central or a connection of making philosophy from margin and connect or touch the central ideas, the central philosophy of uh, which is general uh, for, for all, um, not connected to nation. So, so I would like to ask uh, on, on this concept of dynamism of marginal central city, if, if we can use it uh, on different kind of phenomenon, uh, which are so here created in this uh, dynamism of, of space, region, um, dance of meaning around the Danube. But uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, this term also uh, has kind of, kind of an interesting background, marginocentric as a term. Uh, as far as I know, it was uh, first used in this uh, large collected work uh, called The History of the Literary Cultures of East Central Europe, which is a four volume set published by John Benjamins over like 10 years. And it has many different contributors. It's almost like an encyclopedia. Uh, and covering all of the cultures of the region. And uh, it was edited by, uh, the, this was the, the, my reference to Marcel Cornus Pope, who's a Romanian scholar and John Neu Neubauer, who I think might be American, but lived in Hungary. And uh, they use this term and there was a whole section of one of the volumes uh, with different essays about different uh, cities. And it included like Prague and uh, Lviv, I think, and uh, probably Budapest. It did not include Bratislava actually in their, in their original use of it. And what was interesting is uh, this other scholar of world literature, Cesar Dominguez, who's actually Argentinian and he lives in uh, Galicia in Spain. Uh, but he, is, he works on world literature and he has this interest in uh, world literature as it developed in Slovakia. There was a, a specific school at the Institute of World, um, Ustav Svetovej Literatury, the um, Academy of Sciences actually, in, Slo in Bratislava around this scholar, Degenius Djurishin, which was already in the 1980s, talking about world literature before this term got uh, the big you know, re renaissance in the West that it has now. So of course, Slovak scholars get a little bit resentful because they feel like they rediscovered the term and nobody paid attention to them. And then like David Amarosh, who's a famous literary historian, uh, started talking about it. Suddenly world literature became this big, uh, you know, global term. But uh, they uh, use this term marginocentric. And because Cesar Dominguez uh, has this interest in uh, Jodishin, he has some contacts with the Institute um, in Bratislava at the Academy of Sciences. And I think it was partly because of this that he wanted to include, and in, in, he has a book about world literature, which is not even about Central Europe. It's a more general guide to ideas of world literature. And to explain marginocentric, he decides to use Bratislava, but to explain Bratislava, he actually uses the beginning of Magris's chapter from Danube. So it's actually an outsider looking at Bratislava through this uh, museum, which represents, you know, this sort of Habsburg, it's, it's, you know, the, the um, Chervin Iraq, I guess, this um, pharmacy museum uh, in Old Town, Bratislava, that has these old, and also the, the symbolism of the, the, the different names that Bratislava has all of these uh, historic names that are, are so different from each other, all right, not like Prague and Praha and, you know, some of these other cities, but really that these names are so completely different, they actually represent almost different histories which is also in a sense what uh, Minach is writing about in his, in his essay about castles and the, the Drevenice, the, 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 the huts of the common people. So uh, this is all within the realm of literary studies. Uh, so I think maybe your question was referring even to more interdisciplinary use like arts. Uh, and I think, I mean, definitely that th uh, Central European culture uh, in different forms uh, can be seen as marginocentric. I think Bratislava through its, its, its geographic location on these borders is a really potent symbol. Uh, but also, I mean, I, I see Bratislava as actually this very interesting place that it's in a way it's so marginal, but at, at the same time, you're in the center of everything. You know, Vienna's one hour away and Budapest is not that far. So you, you have these different influences that you're able to, to access 
uh, you can go to an exhibit in, you know, in in Budap in Brno or go to a, you know a play in Vienna, and so I think uh, the, the the multiculturalism is also complemented with you know different genres of art. So uh, I think this also relates in a little in, in some way to the whole Central European uh, debate or whatever you want to call it of the 1980s because it sort of started as a uh, more or less literary concept. I mean, Milan Kundera was writing these literary essays that then got sort of taken as political essays. Although he wasn't really, I mean, he, he obviously was writing about politics. He was writing, he, but he was trying to create space work to be read in a different way than it was being read. He didn't want to be read as like a, a communist refugee or something. He wanted to be seen as part of this, you know, Austro-Hungarian tradition with Kafka and uh, not sort of behind political borders. So I think in that sense, this Central European concept crosses over different disciplines, let's say, uh, and in the same way, marginocentric can also be used. Thank you. Uh, Micha, you had, you had your hand up, right? Yeah. So, sorry, yeah. Hello, everybody. Hello, Charles. Thank you for a very interesting insight into our world. And I, I liked uh, your concept of marginality and centrality at the same time. This is exactly what defines us in Bratislava. I, I have to laugh about it. But, but seriously, now, um, as an expert on issue of Central Europe, you are perfectly aware of nostalgia for golden times among Central European intellectuals, I'm absolutely sure. And what, fast, you know, what is fascinating for me for a long time is certain type of illusion that without an import of nationalism from, the, from, from Germany, from France, of course, Central Europe uh, these days would be a fantastic place to live in, that the very model of ethno-linguistic nation state might have been limited to some oddball cases in Central Europe, uh, in Western Europe, while Central Europe might have consisted of multilingual federal states or federations, and to be under very natural domination of Germany and German culture, of course. So, uh, so, so very simple question. Uh, you know, I would like to hear your opinion about this dreaming, about eventual other history of Central Europe. Yeah, it's interesting because I think, um, you know, the period, both among Greece and he sort of has in a way this similar vision with Kundera about the nostalgia for this, this multicultural Central Europe. And it's only, I think, in the 1980s that there's enough distance from the Habsburg period that they can indulge in this fantasy. Because, of course, I mean, the 19th century, the Habsburg was, Empire was the, the prison of nations and Slovakia particularly you know, was fighting for any kind of independence from Hungary. So then to, to sort of claim this period as this golden age, as you point out, this is very contradictory uh, because this was never a paradise. But, uh, and then this whole idea that this federation, which people were still thinking, you know, maybe up until 1918, that the Habsburg Empire could turn into this multinational, but still somewhat unified space. Uh, obviously that didn't, uh, that didn't really, uh, offer much you know potential in this in in this period but i think it's 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 a reaction to the communist period obviously uh and and what they saw as this i mean it's just this pure you know at this moment east is bad west offers everything good but it, it really does cover over uh the fact that the Habsburg empire was not uh you know this ideal state uh during its during its 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 rule so uh, I don't know if I quite got to the very center of your question, but I, I just, I, I think that, the, the, you know, everything, when you get a certain distance from it, it has this sort of glow of nostalgia. And that's what happened in the 1980s with the Habsburgs, was, is, what, is what I would say. Thank you. Uh, Agmar, you had, do you wanna jump in? Uh, yeah, although I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't have a question, but when I was uh, a comment, when I was listening to 
uh, to your observation on um, on the language taking a shape being almost uh, sculpt uh, sculpturable. I'm not sure if that is a word. Well, it mm -hmm. is now. Um, I met an, an urgent need to share, <laughs> which should always and not at all costs be resisted, but I, I didn't. I mean, hopefully towards the end of the day, we can afford this luxury because I immediately thought about my most favorite monument on this planet. And that's the, Afri uh, that's the monument to the Afrikaans uh, language in, in South Africa, in, in Paro, in Stellenbosch. Um, maybe I, I can show it just for a second. And again, I, I apologize tremendously for a kind of derailing the discussion, but it's just, uh, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's visible. It's a, it's a monument to the language itself. And as you were speaking, that's immediately the, the image that I had. Uh, and there's just so many similarities between the, the Slovak or Central European um, um, kind of a, approach or relation uh, to the language. Um, it's essentially conceptualized as the uh, bridge between the, the West languages that it's based upon and the, the Indaba or Bantu languages that it borrows from in Africa. And there's kind of a bridge in between, um, uh, which uh, these stairs in between, which, um, which are a commemoration of, of the words that were taken from the slaves, from, from the slave languages. Um, anyway, uh, that's that's just immediately what I thought of. And I, I think even though it's a very nationalist monument, it was, it was uh, built uh, or erected upon the centenary of Afrikaans language becoming independent from Dutch. Uh, so actually it has the, the same parallel like the Slovak national renaissance, um, we, which was also in 18, uh, um, the second half of, of 1800s. Um, and this is kind of a, um, a voice from the margin because Afrikaners, they feel very marginalized by, by the British, uh, British South Africans. But they have built this monument, which is extremely nationalistic, but beautiful. Like it's astonishingly beautiful at the same time. So again, I apologize tremendously, but I could not resist this urge. It's just too perfect. No, it's it's great to see these these parallels, you know, even out, out especially when we can go outside of Central Europe and you know, offer this weird marginal uh, role that, you know, it, it, of course under apartheid, sort of part of the oppressive system, but yet it's self marginalized, and you know, there's always these sort of ambiguous and positions. We can to that, you know, it's, I'm sorry. And we can relate to that as, as right. I think tomorrow you even have somebody from South Africa um, contributing or? Uh, tomorrow, yes, yes, we have uh, uh, Emery Kalam, uh, he's from Congo, but he's based in South Africa. But mm -hmm. I'm sorry, back, back to Slovakia. Yeah, no, we don't have to stay there. I just wanted to sort of <laughs> bring us back to Bratislava symbolically, but we're not, we're not stuck there. So um, yeah, I, uh, I, I find this interesting, this, you know, the whole idea of monu monuments to language are such an interesting concept, right? I can't even think of equivalent like in the US or, you know, some more familiar thing like you know, English monument. Uh, so I suppose we can come up with cynical equivalents to, uh, to that, but not as a true monument, you know, that's an interesting idea, but you know, of course, in Slovakia, there's, there, you know, cultural monuments as well, you know, Martin and you go to Matica Slovenska and, the, you know, the Museum of Slovak Literature and these sort of uh, pre preserving this moment, historical moment when, you know, this, the language was uh, somehow rescued from obscurity. So. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I just started trying to think of what a monument, what, what would a monument to any language look like, except for that. Yeah. Um, except for, you know, the collected works of Shakespeare or something. Um, 
So I, I've just been keeping an eye and I might take the moderator's privilege of, of asking a question if that's okay, Charles. Well, um, I think we're a fairly intimate group at this point, so <laughs> you can take that privilege. Okay. <clears throat> um, so I, I was kind of thinking as you were talking, but also when Adriana asked you her initial question, um, I also was fascinated by this idea of refractive nostalgia, which is not a term I've heard before. I've heard reflective and, and recovery, uh, but not refractive, which I think is just a fascinating way of thinking. Um, but I was, I'm sorry, I'm like tracing out a series of semi-connected thoughts that were coming to me as you were talking. Um, and there were kind of two big uh, lacuna, lacuna, uh, for me in philosophy, when, as you were talking, uh, because you brought up Longinus, Longinus and, and Burke on the sublime. And as soon as I hear Burke in the sublime, I think Kant. Um, and as soon as I start thinking about nostalgia and the Danube, I think uh, Hoderlin's Der Ister, <laughs> which then means I have to think about um, Heidegger, but also Badiou, Alain Badiou in um, Being an Event has a really, really remarkably, I think, beautiful, what seems to me like kind of a refractive, refractively nostalgic reading of, of Hoderlin's poem uh, as kind of a counter to Heidegger's quasi, well, whatever's going on with Heidegger, I'll leave that to the side. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the way that you're talking about uh, the Danube in, um, in Lee Fermer and Magris, if I understand what you're saying, the, the, the river as a concept then becomes an object to, let's say, prismate <laughs> the, uh, the singular light of any given national or linguistic narrative or something along those lines. Um, so sorry if I'm rambling a little bit, I'm trying to give this a narrative structure. Um, and you also were talking about how uh, there seems to be something interesting or important about Lee Fermer being uh, an outsider to all of these cultures that he's moving through, um, which made me wonder to what extent you think it would you think that uh, what he might be doing there is a degree of romanticism or romanticizing these cultures that he's otherwise foreign to and kind of, uh, which would be a kind of a more, more of a form of a recovery nostalgia or a straightforward reading of Der Ister or of Heidegger on Der Ister, if that, if that makes sense. Sorry if that was a little bit more. Yeah, you know how these things always are, like these are always part of a bigger thing, which, you, you always left out the relevant part that somebody wants to bring up. And uh, this is a actually- One of my um, friends called this the, why didn't you write what I would have written? What question. I would have written. Well, luckily I did write what you would have written. It's just not uh, in this version because I wanted to keep it to half an hour. Uh, this is a piece that it's gone through a couple different versions. And actually the, originally the focus was actually on Istanbul and on Lee Fermer's final goal. And then I re sort of did it with a focus on the Danube more broadly. And then finally I decided that was too broad and just trying to cover too many things. And I actually got a, a report from a, you know, whatever peer review thing that uh, trying to, you know, what are you doing different cities in the Danube? So I focused it on Bratislava and it makes sense with both of these works because for both of them, uh, Bratislava is this real uh, uh, frontier. It's like, a, it's really the, the border where they're going into the unknown because uh, both Lee Fermer and Magris spoke German. I mean, Magris was a professor of German literature. He was from Trieste. And although he, of course, uh, not under you know, Austrian rule at the time, but, but he, he still had that tradition to draw on. So Magris himself is kind of an outsider, West European Italian on the one, one hand, but growing up in this very uh, marginocentric place, Trieste is another really classic example of that Central European culture uh multicultural uh you know history he 
um, he felt, you know, like literally crossing the border from Austria into Slovakia, it's like suddenly, you know, you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, you're you're like you you he met, I think, a couple of like professors from the Academy of Sciences who spoke probably German, maybe Italian. And that's where he got all his information, right? So, you know, they, he didn't read this uh, Vladimir Minach essay, right? Somebody was telling him about it. Uh, so this is where I think Bratislava really has this interesting uh, role as this. And, and of course, you still feel this even, you know, going to from, you know, Vienna to Bratislava today. But uh, what's interesting for me is that it, was, it wasn't just the 1980s. Patrick Lee Fermer felt the same thing in the 1930s. Right. He was writing in the in the 80s, but he was recalling, you know, interwar Czechoslovakia, which, you know, was economically, I think, you know, even more developed than Austria after the war. You know, at least it wasn't as devastated. So it wasn't this thing of like, oh, I'm going into, you know, Eastern Europe. But still there was this foreignness because of the language, because of but with Lee Fermer, this colonizing almost thing he has he's a sort of old school British you know it's like he's he's, he's like oh you know their, their faces look different you know it's like their cheekbones I can tell they're you know I'm not in Austria anymore or whatever so it's it's very um uh, you know it's both of these have a parallel I mean and what what I think is interesting Magris doesn't do any of that but he's criticized politically uh you know for for sort of being too naive for being this foreign, I mean, he's somebody who should know better because he's a professor of literature and he's a postmodernist and whatever else, but he, he pretty much takes everything uh, at face value that people are telling him. And so finally coming back to what your actual question was with the um, Hilderlin, that um, this um, Thomas Longinovich essay from this collected volume about the Danube, which is a very interdisciplinary, it's not just about literature, it's actually about, you know, all sorts of interpretations of the Danube, and uh, specifically uses Hölderlin's Easter and the way Heidegger's, you know, lectures on that during the war sort of taint and tainted, you know, the, the, the romance of the Danube, in a sense, for him. And that, um, Magritte refers to this, but I don't think he really analyzes it enough for to satisfy Longinovich. So he's 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 definitely and that 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 Hölderlin. There's actually two or three of the essays in that in that collection specifically use that poem Ister as a sort of this romanticized and yet if you scratch the surface, there's a dark you know history to it. So that's that's a whole other thing. I do mention that in the the longer version of this paper. I actually just finished the final corrections uh, that it is coming out as an article with some of this extra stuff, including Holderlin. So I can send you that when it comes out in about a month or so. But. Excellent. Cool. Thanks. Um, so are there other questions from other folks? train myself to be with teaching online I'm training myself to be comfortable with the pause the long pauses <laughs> long pauses and uh, you know the blank <laughs> screen yeah. I don't know who's here uh, this is much better than my classes for that yeah <laughs> well even with this small group it's my pleasure that I have a, both a colleague and a student of mine from Yeditepe University are here on this Friday evening <laughs> so we have a little Yeditepe representation in our in my my uh, keynote. And we're in and we're in lockdown now, right? So yes, <laughs> where Hi. else are you going to be? <laughs> yeah. How old was the the British writer when he wrote this? He was very young. Uh, well, the thing is, he didn't write it until much, much later. So we, when he actually left, I think he was like 18, right? He okay. was, I mean, he was very, very young. And this is part of the reason why he, uh, he, he, didn't, he, he didn't really care where he stayed or, you know, he, it was really like this backpack type experience for him. Mm -hmm. But just by chance, he actually met a uh, wealthy uh, sort of minor noble in Slovakia and stayed with him. Uh, I don't even remember how he met him. He was like maybe a relative of this guy he met in Vienna or something like that. Through him, 
he sort of got these, it's almost this like, you know, uh, I don't know, 18th century type of these, he got like a letter of invitation to like the next, you know, family, some family at their manor house in, in Hungary. So he actually like, and, and you can imagine, you know, sleeping in barns and he shows up at their door. And, but of course, the, you know, this very polite Hungarian noble family takes him in and then they send him on to their next, you know, to their friends down the road. So he had worked his all way all through, all the way through Hungary and Transylvania pretty much the former Hungary, uh, staying in these beautiful old manor houses, which of course he totally romanticizes and is nostalgic about, even though he was only there as a guest. So he's now writing at the time of the books, 1977, you know, he would have been in his 50s when he started. He actually lived until, I think he was 97 or 98. He only died like five years ago. Uh, or I guess it's a little bit more now. So the book was published. So maybe it might be almost 10 years, doesn't seem that long. But uh, I was one of the fans of the original two books, waiting for the third one to come out for like 10 years. And finally, uh, they decided to release the unfinished version. Able to write the last little bit. And it's it's almost enough. You, you get just to the border of Turkey and then it just sort of stops in the middle of a sentence. But that's the old uh, modernist cliche, right? Never, never quite finished. Then I'm gonna give it a little bit of time. Everybody needs to uh, rest up for tomorrow, I guess. So. Yes, yes, yes. Nice. I might, might want to let people go. It has been a it has been a long day, so um, I'm just trying to keep track of this uh, Slido thing. But um, okay, well, uh, thank you again, Charles. It was great and a lot of fun, um, and I will. Uh, remind folks that we begin tomorrow at 1 p.m. Central East, Central European time. Um, and uh, the first panel is Narratives of the Past. And other than that, I'm not sure how- Dagmar maybe wanted to add something? I don't know. Oh, so. yeah. No, oh, it was just a wave. <laughs> I'm was, sorry. I'm in, misinterpreting a wave as, wave as a, uh, <laughs> don't forget to say something. Okay, uh, so yeah, so I'm not sure how to stop this. Uh, oh, thanks, Giovanni. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna stand here and stare into the sit here and stare into the camera until I'm sure. So people that sign I, up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No.